Chapter One of Monsieur Lecoq, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Evans. Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaboriau, Part Two, Chapter One. On the first Sunday in the month of August, 1815, at ten o'clock precisely, as on every Sunday morning, the sacristan of the parish church at Sermuse sounded the three strokes of the bell which warned the faithful that the priest is ascending the steps of the altar to celebrate high mass. The church was already more than half full, and from every side little groups of peasants were hurrying into the churchyard. The women were all in their bravest attire, with cunning little fichus crossed upon their breasts, broad-striped, brightly-colored skirts, and large white coifs. Being as economical as they were coquettish, they came barefooted, bringing their shoes in their hands, but put them on reverentially before entering the house of God. But few of the men entered the church. They remained outside to talk seating themselves in the porch or standing about the yard in the shade of the century-old elms for such was the custom in the hamlet of sermuse the two hours which the women consecrated to prayer the men employed in discussing the news the success or the failure of the crops and before the service ended they could generally be found glass in hand in the bar-room of the village inn for the farmers for a league around the Sunday Mass was only an excuse for a reunion, a sort of weekly beurs. All the curés who had been successively stationed at Sermuse had endeavored to put an end to this scandalous habit, as they termed it, but all their efforts had made no impression upon country obstinacy. They had succeeded in gaining only one concession. At the moment of the elevation of the host, voices were hushed, heads uncovered, and a few even bowed the knee and made the sign of the cross. But this was the affair of an instant only, and conversation was immediately resumed with increased vivacity. But today the usual animation was wanting. No sounds came from the little knots of men gathered here and there, not an oath, not a laugh. Between buyers and sellers, one did not overhear a single one of those interminable discussions, punctuated with the popular oaths such as, By my faith in God, or May the devil burn me. They were not talking, they were whispering together. A gloomy sadness was visible upon each face. Lips were placed cautiously at the listener's ear. Anxiety could be read in every eye one scented misfortune in the very air only a month had elapsed since louis the eighteenth had been for the second time installed in the tutory by a triumphant coalition the earth had not yet had time to swallow the sea of blood that flowed at waterloo twelve hundred thousand foreign soldiers desecrated the soil of france the prussian general muffling was governor of paris and the peasantry of Sermuse trembled with indignation and fear. The king, brought back by the Allies, was no less to be dreaded than the Allies themselves. To them this great name of Bourbon signified only a terrible burden of taxation and oppression. Above all, it signified ruin, for there was scarcely one among them who had not purchased some morsel of government land and they were assured now that all estates were to be returned to the former proprietors who had emigrated after the overthrow of the bourbon hence it was with a feverish curiosity that most of them clustered around a young man who only two days before had returned from the army with tears of rage in his eyes, he was recounting the shame and the misery of the invasion. He told of the pillage at Versailles, the exactions at Orléans, and the pitiless requisitions that had stripped the people of everything. 
and these accursed foreigners to whom the traitors have delivered us will not go so long as a shilling or a bottle of wine is left in france he exclaimed as he said this he shook his clenched fist menacingly at a white flag that floated from the tower his generous anger won the close attention of his auditors and they were still listening to him with undiminished interest when the sound of a horse's hoofs resounded upon the stones of the only street in sairmeuse a shudder traversed the crowd the same fear stopped the beating of every heart who could say that this writer was not some english or prussian officer he had come perhaps to announce the arrival of his regiment and imperiously demand money clothing and food for his soldiers but the suspense was not of long duration the writer proved to be a fellow countryman clad in a torn and dirty blue linen blouse he was urging forward with repeated blows a little bony nervous mare fevered with foam ah it is father chupin murmured one of the peasants with a sigh of relief the same observed another he seems to be in a terrible hurry the old rascal has probably stolen the horse he's riding this last remark disclosed the reputation father chupin enjoyed among his neighbors he was indeed one of those thieves who are the scourge and the terror of the rural districts he pretended to be a day laborer but the truth was that he held work in holy horror and spent all his time in sleeping and idling about his hovel hence stealing was the only means of support for himself his wife two sons terrible youths who somehow had escaped the conscription they consumed nothing that was not stolen wheat wine fuel fruits all were the rightful property of others hunting and fishing at all seasons and with forbidden appliances furnished them with ready money every one in the neighborhood knew this and yet when father chupin was pursued and captured as he was occasionally no witness could be found to testify against him he is a hard case men said and if he had a grudge against anyone he would be quite capable of lying in ambush and shooting him as he would a squirrel meanwhile the rider had drawn rein at the inn of the boeuf Caron. he alighted from his horse and crossing the square approached the church he was a large man about fifty years of age as gnarled and sinewy as the stem of an old grapevine at the first glance one would not have taken him for a scoundrel his manner was humble and even gentle but the restlessness of his eye and the expression of his thin lips betrayed diabolical cunning and the coolest calculation at any other time this despised and dreaded individual would have been avoided but curiosity and anxiety led the crowd toward him ah well father chupin they cried as soon as he was within the sound of their voices whence do you come in such haste from the city to the inhabitants of sermeuse and its environs the city meant the country town of the remondissement montaignac a charming sub-prefecture of eight thousand souls about four leagues distance and was it at montaignac that you bought the horse you were riding just now i did not buy it it was loaned to me this was such a strange assertion that his listeners could not repress a smile he did not seem to notice it however it was loaned me he continued in order that i might bring some great news here the quicker fear resumed possession of the peasantry is the enemy in the city anxiously inquired some of the more timid yes but not the enemy you refer to this is the former lord of the manor the duc de sermeuse ah they said he was dead they were mistaken have you seen him no i have not seen him but someone else has seen him for me and has spoken to him and this someone is monsieur logeron the proprietor of the hotel de france at montenac i was passing the house this morning when he called me here old man he said do you wish to do me a favor naturally i replied yes 
whereupon he placed a coin in my hand and said well go and tell them to saddle a horse for you then gallop to sairmeuse and tell my friend la chanur that the duc de sairmeuse arrived here last night in a post-chaise with his son monsieur martial and two servants here in the midst of these peasants who were listening to him with pale cheeks and set teeth father chupin preserved the subdued mien appropriate to a messenger of misfortune but if one had observed him carefully one would have detected an ironical smile upon his lips and a gleam of malicious joy in his eyes he was in fact inwardly jubilant at that moment he had his revenge for all the slights and all the scorn he had been forced to endure and what a revenge and if his words seemed to fall slowly and reluctantly from his lips it was only because he was trying to prolong the sufferings of his auditors as much as possible but a robust young fellow with an intelligent face who perhaps read father chupin's secret heart brusquely interrupted him what does the presence of the duc de sermeuse at montaignac matter to us he exclaimed let him remain at the hotel de france as long as he chooses we shall not go in search of him no we shall not go in search of him echoed the other peasants approvingly the old rogue shook his head with affected commiseration monsieur le duc will not put you to that trouble he replied he will be here in less than two hours how do you know i know it through monsieur logeron who when i mounted his horse said to me above all old man explain to my friend lacheneur that the duke has ordered horses to be in readiness to convey him to sermeuse at eleven o'clock with a common movement all the peasants who had watches consulted them and what does he want here demanded the same young farmer pardon he did not tell me replied father chupin but one need not be very cunning to guess he comes to revisit his former estates and to take them from those who have purchased them if possible from you rousselet he will claim the meadows upon the Uzel, which always yield two crops from you father gaucher the ground upon which the croix brulee stands and from you chanlunot the vineyards on the bordier chanlunot was the impetuous young man who had interrupted father chupin twice already claim the bordere he exclaimed with even greater violence let him try and we will see it was waste land when my father bought it covered with briars even a goat could not have found my pasture there we have cleared it of stones we have scratched up the soil with our very nails we have watered it with our sweat and now they would try to take it from us ah they shall have my last drop of blood first i do not say but but what is it any fault of ours that the nobles fled to foreign lands we have not stolen their lands have we the government offered them for sale we bought them and paid for them they are lawfully ours that is true but monsieur de sermeuse is the great friend of the king the young soldier whose voice had aroused the most noble sentiments only a moment before was forgotten invaded france the threatening enemy were alike forgotten the all-powerful instinct of avarice was suddenly aroused in my opinion resumed chanlunot we should do well to consult the baron d'escorval yes yes exclaimed the peasants let us go at once they were starting when a villager who sometimes read the papers checked them by saying take care what you do do you not know that since the return of the bourbon monsieur d'escorval is of no account whatever fouché has him upon the proscription list and he is under the surveillance of the police this objection dampened the enthusiasm that is true murmured some of the older men a visit to monsieur d'escorval would perhaps do us more harm than good and besides what advice could he give us chambonneau had forgotten all prudence what of that he exclaimed if monsieur d'escorval has no counsel to give us about this matter he can 
perhaps teach us how to resist and to defend ourselves. For some moments, Father Chupin had been studying, with an impassive countenance, the storm of anger he had aroused. In his secret heart, he experienced the satisfaction of the incendiary at the sight of the flames he has kindled. Perhaps he already had a presentiment of the infamous part he would play a few months later. Satisfied with his experiment, he assumed for the time the role of moderator. "'Wait a little. Do not cry before you are hurt,' he exclaimed in an ironical tone. "'Who told you that the Duc de Sermaz would trouble you? How much of his former domain do you all own between you? Almost nothing. A few fields and meadows, and a hill on the Bordier. All these together did not in former times yield him an income of five thousand francs a year.' yes that is true replied chanlineau and if the revenue you mentioned is quadrupled it is only because the land is now in the hands of forty proprietors who cultivate it themselves another reason why the duke will not say a word he will not wish to set the whole district in commotion in my opinion he will dispossess only one of the owners of his former estates and that is our worthy ex-mayor monsieur lacheneur in short ah he knew only too well the egotism of his compatriots he knew with what complacency and eagerness they would accept an expiatory victim whose sacrifice should be their salvation that is a fact remarked an old man monsieur lacheneur owns nearly all the sermeuse property say all while you are about it rejoined father chupin where does monsieur lacheneur live in that beautiful chateau de sermeuse whose gable we can see there through the trees he hunts in the forests which once belonged to the duc de sermeuse he fishes in their lakes he drives the horses which once belonged to them in the carriages upon which one can now see their coat of arms if it had not been painted out twenty years ago lacheneur was a poor devil like myself now he is a grand gentleman with fifty thousand livres a year he wears the finest broadcloth and top boots like the baron d'escorval he no longer works he makes others work and when he passes every one must bow to the earth if you kill so much as a sparrow upon his lands as he says he will cast you into prison ah he has been fortunate the emperor made him mayor the bourbon deprived him of his office but what does that matter to him he is still the real master here as the sermeuse were in other days his son is pursuing his studies in paris intending to become a notary as for his daughter mademoiselle maria not a word against her exclaimed chanlonneau if she were mistress there would not be a poor man in the country and yet how some of her pensioners abuse her bounty ask your wife if this is not so father chupin undoubtedly the impetuous young man spoke at the peril of his life but the wicked old chupin swallowed this affront which he would never forget and humbly continued i do not say that mademoiselle marie anne is not generous but after all her charitable work she has plenty of money left for her fine dresses and her fallals i think that monsieur lacheneur ought to be very well content, even after he has restored to its former owner one half or even three quarters of the property he has acquired. No one can tell how. He would have enough left then to grind the poor underfoot. After his appeal to selfishness, Father Chupin appealed to envy. There could be no doubt of his success. But he had not time to pursue his advantage. The services were over, and the worshippers were leaving the church. Soon there appeared upon the porch the man in question, with a young girl of dazzling beauty leaning upon his arm. Father Chopin walked straight toward him, and brusquely delivered his message. Monsieur Le Chenoir staggered beneath the blow. He turned first so red, then so frightfully pale, that those around him thought he was about to fall. But he quickly recovered his self-possession, and without a word to the messenger, he walked rapidly away, leading his daughter. Some minutes later, an old post-chaise, drawn by four horses, 
dashed through the village at a gallop and paused before the house of the village cure then one might have witnessed a singular spectacle father chopin had gathered his wife and his children together and the four surrounded the carriage shouting with all the power of their lungs long live the duc de sermuse end of chapter one recording by don evans w w w dot don m evans dot com chapter two of monsieur lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Evans. Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gabriel. Part two. Chapter two. A gently ascending road more than two miles in length, shaded by a quadruple row of venerable elms, led from the village to the Chateau de Sermousse. Nothing could be more beautiful than this avenue, a fit approach to a palace and the stranger who beheld it could understand the naively vain proverb of the country he does not know the real beauty of france who has never seen sermus nor the Oiselle. the Oiselle is the little river which one crosses by means of a wooden bridge on leaving the village and whose clear and rapid waters give a delicious freshness to the valley at every step as one ascends the view changes it is as if an enchanting panorama were being slowly unrolled before one on the right you can see the sawmills of ferriol on the left like an ocean of verdure the forest of dolomieu trembles in the breeze those imposing ruins on the other side of the river are all that remain of the feudal manor of the house of Brue. that red brick mansion with granite trimmings half concealed by a bend in the river belongs to the baron d'escorval and if the day is clear one can easily distinguish the spires of montagnac in the distance this was the path traversed by m lacheneur after chupin had delivered his message but what did he care for the beauties of the landscape upon the church porch he had received his death wound and now with a tottering and dragging step he dragged himself along like one of those poor soldiers mortally wounded upon the field of battle who go back seeking a ditch or quiet spot where they can lie down and die he seemed to have lost all thought of his surroundings all consciousness of previous events he pursued his way lost in his reflections guided only by force of habit two or three times his daughter marie anne who was walking by his side addressed him but an ah let me alone uttered in a harsh tone was the only response she could draw from him evidently he had received a terrible blow and undoubtedly as often happens under such circumstances the unfortunate man was reviewing all the different phases of his life at twenty lacheneur was only a poor ploughboy in the service of the sermuse family his ambition was modest then when stretched beneath a tree at the hour of noonday rest his dreams were as simple as those of an infant if i could but amass a hundred pistoles he thought i would ask father barois for the hand of his daughter martha and he would not refuse me a hundred pistoles a thousand francs an enormous son for him who in two years of toil and privation had only laid by eleven louis which he had placed carefully in a tiny box and hidden in the depths of his straw mattress still he did not despair he had read in martha's eyes that she would wait and mademoiselle armand de sermuse a rich old maid was his godmother and he thought if he had tacked her adroitly that he might perhaps uh, interest her in his love affair then the terrible storm of the revolution burst over france with the fall of the first thunderbolts the duke of sermuse left france with the count d'artois they took refuge in foreign lands as a passer-by seeks shelter in a doorway from a summer shower 
saying to himself, This will not last long. The storm did last, however, and the following year, Mademoiselle Armand, who had remained at Ceremuse, died. The chateau was then closed, the president of the district took possession of the keys in the name of the government, and the servants were scattered. Lacheneur took up his residence in Montaignac. Young, daring, and personally attractive, blessed with an energetic face and an intelligence far above his station, it was not long before he became well known in the political clubs. For three months Lacheneur was the tyrant of Montaignac. But this metier of public speaker is by no means lucrative so the surprise throughout the district was immense when it was ascertained that the former ploughboy had purchased the chateau and almost all the land belonging to his old master it is true that the nation had sold this princely domain for scarcely a twentieth part of its real value the appraisement was sixty-nine thousand francs it was giving the property away and yet it was necessary to have this amount, and Lacheneur possessed it, since he had poured it in a flood of beautiful Louis d'Or into the hands of the receiver of the district. From that moment his popularity waned. The patriots, who had applauded the ploughboy, cursed the capitalist. He discreetly left them to recover from their rage as best they could, and returned to Sermuse. There everyone bowed low before the citoyen Lacheneur. Unlike most people, he did not forget his past hopes at the moment when they might be realized. He married Martha Barrois, and, leaving the country to work out its own salvation without his assistance, he gave his time and attention to agriculture. Any close observer in those days would have felt certain that the man was bewildered by the sudden change in his situation. His manner was so troubled and anxious that one to see him would have supposed him a servant in constant fear of being detected in some indiscretion. He did not open the chateau, but installed himself and his young wife in the cottage formerly occupied by the head gamekeeper, near the entrance of the park. But little by little, with the habit of possession, came assurance. The consulate had succeeded the directory. The empire succeeded the consulate. Citoyen Lacheneur became Monsieur Lacheneur. Appointed mayor two years later, he left the cottage and took possession of the chateau. The former ploughboy slumbered in the bed of the Duc de Sarmuse. He ate from the massive plate, graven with their coat of arms. He received his visitors in the magnificent salon in which the Duc de Sarmuse had received their friends in years gone by. To those who had known him in former days, Monsieur Lacheneur had become unrecognizable. He had adapted himself to his lofty station. Blushing at his own ignorance, he had found the courage, wonderful in one of his age, to acquire the education which he lacked. Then all his undertakings were successful to such a degree that his good fortune had become proverbial. That he took any part in an enterprise sufficed to make it turn out well. His wife had given him two lovely children, a son and a daughter. His property, managed with a shrewdness and sagacity which the former owners had not possessed, yielded him an income of at least sixty thousand francs. How many, under similar circumstances, would have lost their heads? But he, Monsieur Lacheneur, had been wise enough to retain his sang froid In spite of the princely luxury that surrounded him, his own habits were simple and frugal. He had never had an attendant for his own person. His large income he consecrated almost entirely to the improvement of his estate, or to the purchase of more land. And yet he was not avaricious. In all that concerned his wife or children, he did not count the cost. His son, Jean, had been educated in Paris. He wished him to be fitted for any position. Unwilling to consent to a separation from his daughter, he had procured a governess to take charge of her education. 
sometimes his friends accused him of an inordinate ambition for his children but he always shook his head sadly as he replied if i can only ensure them a modest and comfortable future but what folly it is to count upon the future thirty years ago who could have foreseen that the sermuse family would be deprived of their estates with such opinions he should have been a good master he was but no one thought the better of him on that account his former comrades could not forgive him for his sudden elevation they seldom spoke of him without wishing his ruin in ambiguous words alas the evil days came toward the close of the year eighteen twelve he lost his wife the disasters of the year eighteen thirteen swept away a large portion of his personal fortune which had been invested in manufacturing enterprise compromised by the first restoration he was obliged to conceal himself for a time and to cap the climax the conduct of his son who was still in paris caused him serious disquietude only the evening before he had thought himself the most unfortunate of men but here was another misfortune menacing him a misfortune so terrible that all the others were forgotten from the day on which he had purchased Sermuse to this fatal Sunday in August of 1815 was an interval of twenty years. Twenty years! And it seemed to him only yesterday that, blushing and trembling, he had laid those piles of louis d'or upon the desk of the receiver of the district. Had he dreamed it? He had not dreamed it. His entire life, with its struggles and its miseries, its hopes and its fears, its unexpected joys and its blighted hopes, all passed before him. Lost in these memories, he had quite forgotten the present situation, when a commonplace incident more powerful than the voice of his daughter brought him back to the terrible reality. The gate leading to the Chateau de Sermousse, to his chateau, was found to be locked he shook it with a sort of rage and being unable to break the fastening he found some relief in breaking the bell on hearing the noise the gardener came running to the scene of action why is this gate closed demanded m lacheneur with unwonted violence of manner by what right do you barricade my house when i the master am without the gardener tried to make some excuse hold your tongue interrupted monsieur lacheneur i dismiss you you are no longer in my service he passed on leaving the gardener petrified with astonishment crossed the courtyard a courtyard worthy of the mansion bordered with velvet turf and with flowers and with dense shrubbery in the vestibule inlaid with marble three of his tenants sat awaiting him for it was on sunday that he always received the workmen who desired to confer with him they rose at his approach and removed their hats deferentially but he did not give them time to utter a word who permitted you to enter here he said savagely and what do you desire they sent you to play the spy on me did they leave i tell you the three farmers were even more bewildered and dismayed than the gardener had been and their remarks must have been interesting but M. Lacheneur could not hear them. He had opened the door of the grand salon and dashed in, followed by his frightened daughter. Never had Marianne seen her father in such a mood, and she trembled, her heart torn by the most frightful presentiments. She had heard it said that oftentimes, under the influence of some dire calamity, unfortunate men have suddenly lost their reason entirely, and she was wondering if her father had become insane it would seem indeed that such was the case his eyes flashed convulsive shudders shook his whole body a white foam gathered on his lips he made the circuit of the room as a wild beast makes the circuit of his cage uttering harsh imprecations and making frenzied gestures his actions were strange incomprehensible sometimes he seemed to be trying the thickness of the carpet with the toe of his boot sometimes he threw himself upon a sofa or a chair as if to test its softness occasionally he paused abruptly before some one of the valuable pictures that covered the walls or before a bronze 
one might have supposed that he was taking an inventory and appraising all the magnificent and costly articles which decorated this apartment the most sumptuous in the chateau and i must renounce all this he exclaimed at last these words explained everything no never he resumed in a transport of rage never never i cannot i will not now marie anne understood it all but what was passing in her father's mind she wished to know and leaving the low chair in which she had been seated she went to her father's side are you ill father she asked in her sweet voice what is the matter what do you fear why do you not confide in me am i not your daughter do you no longer love me at the sound of this dear voice m lacheneur trembled like a sleeper suddenly aroused from the terrors of a nightmare and he cast an indescribable glance upon his daughter did you not hear what chopin said to me he replied slowly the duc de sermeuse is at montaignac he will soon be here and we are dwelling in the chateau of his fathers and his domain has become ours the vexed question regarding the national lands which agitated france for thirty years marie understood for she had heard it discussed a thousand times ah oh, well dear father said she what does that matter even if we do hold the property you have bought it and paid for it have you not so it is rightfully and lawfully ours Monsieur lacheneur hesitated a moment before replying but his secret suffocated him he was in one of those crises in which a man however strong he may be totters and seeks some support however fragile you would be right my daughter he murmured with drooping head if the money that i gave in exchange for sermuse had really belonged to me at this strange avowal the young girl turned pale and recoiled a step what she faltered this gold was not yours my father to whom did it belong from whence did it come the unhappy man had gone too far to retract i will tell you all my daughter he replied and you shall judge you shall decide when the sermuse family fled from france i had only my hands to depend upon and it was almost impossible to obtain work i wondered if starvation were not near at hand such was my condition when someone came after me one evening to tell me that mademoiselle armand de sermuse my godmother was dying and wished to speak with me i ran to the chateau the messenger had told the truth mademoiselle armand was sick unto death i felt this on seeing her upon her bed whiter than wax ah if i were to live a hundred years never should i forget her face as it looked at that moment it was expressive of a strength of will and an energy that would hold death at bay until the task upon which she had determined was performed when i entered the room i saw a look of relief appear upon her countenance oh how long you were in coming she murmured faintly i was about to make some excuse when she motioned me to pause and ordered the women who surrounded her to leave the room as soon as we were alone you are an honest boy said she and i am about to give you a proof of my confidence people believe me to be poor but they are mistaken while my relatives were gaily ruining themselves i was saving the five hundred louis which the duke my brother gave me each year she motioned me to come nearer and to kneel beside her bed i obeyed and mademoiselle armand leaned toward me almost glued her lips to my ear and added i possess eighty thousand francs i felt a sudden giddiness but my godmother did not notice it this amount she continued is not a quarter part of the former income from our family estates but now who knows but it will one day be the only resource of the sermuse i am going to place it in your charge lacheneur i confide it to your honor and to your devotion the estates belonging to the emigrants are to be sold i hear if such an act of injustice is committed you will probably be able to purchase our property for seventy thousand francs 
if the property is sold by the government purchase it if the lands belonging to the emigrants are not sold take that amount to the duke my brother who is with the count d'artois the surplus that is to say the ten thousand francs remaining i give to you they are yours she seemed to recover her strength she raised herself in bed and holding the crucifix attached to her rosary to my lips she said swear by the image of our saviour that you will faithfully execute the last will of your dying godmother i took the required oath and an expression of satisfaction overspread her features that is well she said i shall die content you will have a protector on high but this is not all in times like these in which we live this gold will not be safe in your hands unless those about you are ignorant that you possess it i have been endeavoring to discover some way by which you could remove it from my room and from the chateau without the knowledge of any one and i have found a way the gold is here in this cupboard at the head of my bed in a stout oaken chest you must find strength to move the chest you must you can fasten a sheet around it and let it down gently from the window into the garden you will then leave the house as you entered it and as soon as you are outside you must take the chest and carry it to your home the night is very dark and no one will see you if you are careful but make haste my strength is nearly gone the chest was heavy but i was very strong in less than ten minutes the task of removing the chest from the chateau was accomplished without a single sound that would betray us as i closed the window i said it is done godmother god be praised she whispered sermuse is saved i heard a deep sigh i turned she was dead this scene that Monsieur Lacheneur was relating rose vividly before him. To feign to disguise the truth or to conceal any portion of it was an impossibility. He forgot himself and his daughter. He thought only of the dead woman, of Mademoiselle Armand de Sermuse, and he shuddered on pronouncing the word, she was dead. It seemed to him that she was about to speak and to insist upon the fulfillment of his pledge. After a moment's silence, he resumed in a hollow voice, I called for aid. It came. Mademoiselle Armand was adored by everyone. There was great lamentation, and a half hour of indescribable confusion followed her death. I was able to withdraw, unnoticed, to run into the garden, and to carry away the oaken chest. An hour later, it was concealed in the miserable hovel in which I dwelt. The following year I purchased Sermuse. He had confessed all, and he paused, trembling, trying to read his sentence in the eyes of his daughter. "'And can you hesitate?' she demanded. "'Ah, uh, you do not know. I know that Sermuse must be given up. This was the decree of his own conscience, that faint voice which speaks only in a whisper but which all the tumult on earth cannot overpower. No one saw me take away the chest, he faltered. If anyone suspected it, there is not a single proof against me. But no one does suspect it. Marie-Anne rose, her eyes flashed with a generous indignation. My father, she exclaimed, oh, my father! Then, in a calmer tone, she added, If others know nothing of this, can you forget it? M. Lacheneur appeared almost ready to succumb to the torture of the terrible conflict raging in his soul. "'Return!' he exclaimed. "'What shall I return? That which I have received? So be it. I consent. I will give the Duke the eighty thousand francs. To this amount I will add the interest on this sum since I have had it, and we shall be free of all obligation.' The girl sadly shook her head. "'Why do you resort to subterfuges which are so unworthy of you?' she asked gently. "'You know perfectly well that it was Sermuse which Mademoiselle Armand intended to entrust to the servant of her house, and it is Sermuse which must be returned.' The word servant 
was revolting to a man who at least while the empire endured had been a power in the land oh you are cruel my daughter he said with intense bitterness as cruel as a child who has never suffered as cruel as one who having never himself been tempted is without mercy for those who have yielded to temptation it is one of those acts which god alone can judge since god alone can read the depths of one's secret soul i am only a depositary you tell me it was indeed in this light that i formerly regarded myself if your poor sainted mother was still alive she would tell you the anxiety and anguish i felt on being made the master of riches which were not mine i trembled lest i should yield to their seductions i was afraid of myself i felt as a gambler might feel who had the winnings of others confided to his care as a drunkard might feel who had been placed in charge of a quantity of the most delicious wines your mother would tell you that i moved heaven and earth to find the duc de sermeuse but he had left the count d'artois and no one knew where he had gone or what had become of him ten years passed before i could make up my mind to inhabit the chateau yes ten years during which i had the furniture dusted each morning as if the master was to return that evening at last i ventured i had heard m d'escorval declare that the duke had been killed in battle i took up my abode here and from day to day in proportion as the domain of sermeuse became more beautiful and extensive beneath my care i felt myself more and more its rightful owner but this despairing pleading in behalf of a bad cause produced no impression upon marie anne's loyal heart restitution must be made she repeated monsieur lacheneur wrung his hands implacable he exclaimed she is implacable unfortunate girl does she not understand that it is for her sake i wish to remain where i am i am old and i am familiar with toil and poverty idleness has not removed the callosities from my hand what do i require to keep me alive until the day comes for me to take my place in the graveyard a crust of bread and an onion in the morning a porringer of soup in the evening and for the night a bundle of straw i could easily earn that but you unhappy child and your brother what will become of you we must not discuss nor haggle with duty my father i think however that you are needlessly alarmed i believe the duke is too noble-hearted ever to allow you to suffer want after the immense service you have rendered him the old servitor of the house of sermeuse laughed a loud bitter laugh <laughs> you believe that said he then you do not know the nobles who have been our masters for ages ah you are a worthy fellow very coldly said will be the only recompense i shall receive and you will see us me at my plough you out at service and if i venture to speak of the ten thousand francs that were given me i shall be treated as an impostor as an impudent fool by the holy name of god this shall not be oh my father no this shall not be and i realize as you cannot realize the disgrace of such a fall you think you are beloved in ceremony you are mistaken we have been too fortunate not to be the victims of hatred and jealousy if i fall to-morrow you will see all who kissed your hands to-day fall upon you to tear you to pieces his eyes glittered he believed he had found a victorious argument and then you yourself will realize the horror of the disgrace it will cost you the deadly anguish of a separation from him who your heart has chosen he had spoken truly for marie anne's beautiful eyes filled with tears if what you say proves true father she murmured in an altered voice i may perhaps die of sorrow but i cannot fail to realize that my confidence and my love has been misplaced and you still insist upon my returning sermeuse to its former owner honor speaks my father 
Monsieur Lacheneur made the armchair in which he was seated tremble by a violent blow of his fist. "'And if I am just as obstinate,' he exclaimed, "'if I keep the property, what will you do?' "'I shall say to myself, father, that honest poverty is better than stolen wealth. I shall leave this chateau, which belongs to the Duc de Sermuse, and I shall seek a situation as a servant in the neighborhood. Monsieur Lacheneur sank back in his armchair, sobbing. He knew his daughter's nature well enough to be assured that what she said, that she would do. But he was conquered. His daughter had won the battle. He had decided to make the heroic sacrifice. "'I will relinquish Sermuse,' he faltered. "'Come what may—' He paused suddenly. A visitor was entering the room. It was a young man about twenty years of age, of distinguished appearance, but with a rather melancholy and gentle manner. His eyes, when he entered the apartment, encountered those of Marie-Anne. He blushed slightly, and the girl half turned away, crimsoning to the roots of her hair. Monsieur, said the young man, my father sends me to inform you that the Duc de Sarmuse and his son have just arrived. They have asked the hospitality of our curé. Monsieur Lacheneur rose, unable to conceal his frightful agitation. You will thank the Baron d'Escorval for his attention, my dear Maurice, he responded. I shall have the honor of seeing him to-day, after a very momentous step which we are about to take my daughter and I. Young d'Escorval had seen at the first glance that his presence was inopportune, so he remained only a few moments. But as he was taking leave, Marianne found time to say, in a low voice, I think I know your heart, Maurice. This evening I shall know it certainly. End of chapter 2 Recording by Don Evans, www.donmevans.com Chapter 3 of Monsieur Lecoq, Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanna Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaborio Part 2, Chapter 3 Few of the inhabitants of Sermuse knew, except by name, the terrible duke whose arrival had thrown the whole village into commotion. Some of the oldest residents had a faint recollection of, of having seen him long ago, before eighty-nine indeed, when he came to visit his aunt, Mademoiselle Armand. His duties then had seldom permitted him to leave the court. If he had given no sign of life during the empire, it was because he had not been compelled to submit to the humiliations and suffering which so many of the immigrants were obliged to endure in their exile. On the contrary, he had received, in exchange for the wealth of which he had been deprived by the revolution, a princely fortune. Taking refuge in London after the defeat of the army of Conde, he had been so fortunate as to please the only daughter of Lord Holland, one of the richest peers in England, and he had married her. She possessed a fortune of two hundred and fifty thousand pounds sterling, more than six million francs. Still, the marriage was not a happy one. The chosen companion of the dissipated and licentious Count d'Artois was not likely to prove a very good husband. The young Duchess was contemplating a separation when she died in giving birth to a boy who was baptised under the names of Anne-Marie Marchal. The loss of his wife did not render the Duc de Sermuse inconsolable. He was rich and freer than he ever had been. As soon as les convenances permitted, he confided his son to the care of a relative of his wife and began his roving life again. Rumour had told the truth. He had fought, and that furiously, against France in the Austrian and then in the Russian ranks, and he took no pains to conceal the fact, convinced that he had only performed his duty. He considered that he had honestly and loyally gained the rank of general, which the emperor of all the Russias had bestowed upon him. 
He had not returned to France during the First Restoration, but his absence had been involuntary. His father-in-law, Lord Holland, had just died, and the Duke was detained in London by business connected with his son's immense inheritance. Then followed the Hundred Days. They exasperated him. But the good cause, as he styled it, having triumphed anew, he hastened to France. Alas, La Chineur judged the character of his former master correctly when he resisted the entreaties of his daughter. This man, who had been compelled to conceal himself during the first restoration, knew only too well that the returned émigrés had learned nothing and forgotten nothing. The Duc de Sermuse was no exception to the rule. He thought, and nothing could be more sadly absurd, that a mere act of authority would suffice to suppress for ever all the events of the revolution and of the empire. When he said, I do not admit that, he firmly believed that there was nothing more to be said, that controversy was ended, and that what had been was as if it had never been. If some who had seen Louis the Seventeenth at the helm in 1814 assured the Duke that France had changed in many respects since 1789, he responded with a shrug of the shoulders. Nonsense! As soon as we assert ourselves, all these rascals, whose rebellion alarms you, will quietly sink out of sight. Such was really his opinion. On the way from Montagnu to Sermuse, the Duke, comfortably ensconced in his Berlin, unfolded his theories for the benefit of his son. The king has been poorly advised, he said in conclusion. Besides, I am disposed to believe that he inclines too much to Jacobinism. If he would listen to my advice, he would make use of the twelve hundred thousand soldiers, which our friends have placed at his disposal, to bring his subjects to a sense of their duty. Twelve hundred thousand bayonets have far more eloquence than the articles of a charter. He continued his remarks on the subject until the carriage approached Sermuse. Though but little given to sentiment, he was really affected by the sight of the country in which he was born, where he had played as a child, and of which he had heard nothing since the death of his aunt. Everything was changed, still the outlines of the landscape remained the same. The valley of the Oiselle was as bright and laughing as in days gone by. I recognise it, he exclaimed, with a delight that made him forget politics. I recognise it. Soon the changes became more striking. The carriage entered Sermuse and rattled over the stones of the only street in the village. This street in former years had been unpaved and had always been rendered impassable by wet weather. Aha, murmured the Duke, this is an improvement. It was not long before he noticed others. The dilapidated thatched hovels had given place to pretty and comfortable white cottages with green blinds and a vine hanging gracefully over the door. As the carriage passed the public square in front of the church, Marshal observed the groups of peasants who were still talking there. What do you think of all these peasants, he inquired of his father. Do they have the appearance of people who are preparing a triumphal reception for their old masters? Monsieur de Samuel shrugged his shoulders. He was not the man to renounce an illusion for such a trifle. They do not know that I am in this poor chaise, he replied. When they know... Shouts of Vive le Monsieur le Duc de Sermuse interrupted him. Do you hear that, Marquis? he exclaimed. And pleased by these cries that proved him in the right, he leaned from the carriage window, waving his hand to the honest Chupin family, who were running behind the vehicle with noisy shouts. The old rascal, his wife, and his children all possessed powerful voices, and it was not strange that the Duke believed the whole village was welcoming him. He was convinced of it and when the Berlin stopped before the house of the curé, Monsieur de Sermuse was persuaded that the prestige of the nobility was greater than ever. Upon the threshold of the parsonage, Bibian, the old housekeeper, was standing. She knew who these guests must be, for the curé's servants always know what is going on. Monsieur has not yet returned from church, she said, in response to the duke's inquiry. But if the gentleman wish to wait, it will not be long before he comes, for the poor dear man has not breakfasted yet. Let us go in, the Duke said to his son, and guided by the housekeeper, they entered a sort of drawing-room where the table was spread. 
Monsieur de Semouze took inventory of the apartment in a single glance. The habits of a house reveal those of its master. This was clean, poor, and bare. The walls were whitewashed. A dozen chairs composed the entire furniture. Upon the table, laid with monastic simplicity, were only tin dishes. This was either the abode of an ambitious man or a saint. Will these gentlemen take any refreshments? inquired Bibien. Upon my word, replied Marcel, I must confess that the drive has whetted my appetite amazingly. Blessed Jesus, exclaimed the old housekeeper in evident despair, what am I to do, I who have nothing? That is to say, yes, I have an old hen left in the coop. Give me time to wring its neck, to pick it and clean it. She paused to listen, and they heard a step in the passage. Ah, she exclaimed, here is Monsieur le Curé now. The son of a poor farmer in the environs of Maintenot, he owed his Latin and tonsure to the privations of his family. Tall, angular, and solemn, he was as cold and impassive as the stones of his church. By what immense efforts of will, at the cost of what torture, had he made himself what he was? One could form some idea of the terrible restraint to which he had subjected himself by looking at his eyes, which occasionally emitted the lightnings of an impassioned soul. Was he old or young? The most subtle observer would have hesitated to say on seeing this pallid and emaciated face, cut in two by an immense nose, a real eagle's beak, as thin as the edge of a razor. He wore a white cassock, which had been patched and darned in numberless places, but which was a marvel of cleanliness, and which hung about his tall, attenuated body, like the sails of a disabled vessel. He was known as the Abbe Medon. At the sight of the two strangers seated in his drawing-room, he manifested some slight surprise. The carriage standing before the door had announced the presence of a visitor, but he had expected to find one of his parishioners. No one had warned him or the sacristan, and he was wondering with whom he had to deal and what they desired of him. Mechanically he turned to Bibienne, but the old servant had taken flight. The duke understood his host's astonishment. Upon my word, Abbe, he said, with the impertinent ease of a grand seigneur who makes himself at home everywhere, we have taken your house by storm and hold the position as you see. I am the Duc de Sermuse, and this is my son, the Marquis. The priest bowed, but he did not seem greatly impressed by the exalted rank of his guests. It is a great honour for me, he replied, in a more than reserved tone, to receive a visit from the former master of this place. He emphasised this word former in such a manner that it was impossible to doubt his sentiments and his opinions. Unfortunately, he continued, you will not find here the comforts to which you are accustomed, and I fear... Nonsense, interrupted the Duke. An old soldier is not fastidious, and what suffices for you, Monsieur Abbe, will suffice for us, and rest assured that we will amply repay you in one way or another for any inconvenience we may cause you. The priest's eye flashed. This want of tact, this disagreeable familiarity, this last insulting remark kindled with the anger of the man concealed beneath the priest. Besides, added Marshal gaily, we have been vastly amused by Bibien's anxieties. We already know that there is a chicken in the coop. That is to say, there was one, Monsieur le Marquis. The old housekeeper, who suddenly reappeared, explained her master's response. She seemed overwhelmed with despair. Blessed Virgin! Monsieur, what shall I do? she clamoured. The chicken has disappeared, someone has certainly stole it, for the coop is securely closed. Do not accuse your neighbour hastily, interrupted the curé. No one has stolen it from us. Bertrand was here this morning to ask alms in the name of her sick daughter. I had no money, and I gave her this fowl that she might make a good bullion for the sick girl. This explanation changed Bibian's consternation to fury. Planting herself in the centre of the room, one hand upon her hip, and gesticulating wildly with the other, she exclaimed, pointing to her master, This is just the sort of man he is. He has less sense than a baby. Any miserable peasant who meets him can make him believe anything he wishes. Any great falsehood brings tears to his eyes, and then they can do what they like with him. 
In that way they take the very shoes off his feet and the bread from his mouth. Bertrand's daughter, messieurs, is no more ill than you or I. Enough, said the priest sternly. Enough. Then knowing by experience that his voice had not the power to check her flood of reproaches, he took her by the arm and led her out into the passage. Monsieur de Semuse and his son exchanged a glance of consternation. Was this a comedy that had been prepared for their benefit? Evidently not, since their arrival had not been expected. But the priest, whose character had been so plainly revealed by this quarrel with his domestic, was not a man to their taste. At least he was evidently not the man they had hoped to find, not the auxiliary whose assistance was indispensable to the success of their plans. Yet they did not exchange a word, they listened. They heard the sound as of a discussion in the passage. The master spoke in low tones, but with an unmistakable accent of command. The servant uttered an astonished exclamation, but the listeners could not distinguish a word. Soon the priest re-entered the apartment. I hope, gentlemen, he said, with a dignity that could not fail to check any attempt at raillery, that you will excuse this ridiculous scene. The curé de Sermuse, thank God, is not so poor as she says. Neither the duke nor Marshal made any response. Even their remarkable assurance was very sensibly diminished, and Monsieur de Sermuse deemed it advisable to change the subject. This he did by relating the events which he had just witnessed in Paris, and by insisting that His Majesty Louis the Eighteenth had been welcomed with enthusiasm and transports of affection. Fortunately, the old housekeeper interrupted this recital. She entered, loaded with china, silver, and bottles, and behind her came a large man in a white apron, bearing three or four covered dishes in his hands. It was the order to go and obtain this repast from the village inn which had drawn from Bibiane so many exclamations of wonder and dismay in the passage. A moment later the curé and his guests took their places at the table. Had the much-lamented chicken constituted the dinner, the rations would have been short. This the worthy woman was obliged to confess on seeing the terrible appetite evinced by Monsieur de Sermuse and his son. One would have sworn that they had eaten nothing for a fortnight, she told her friends the next day. Abbe Medon was not hungry, though it was two o'clock, and he had eaten nothing since the previous evening. The sudden arrival of the former masters of Sermuse filled his heart with gloomy forebodings. Their coming, he believed, presaged the greatest misfortunes. So while he played with his knife and fork, pretending to eat, he was really occupied in watching his guests, and in studying them with all the penetration of a priest, which, by the way, is generally far superior to that of a physician or of a magistrate. The Duc de Sermuse was fifty-seven, but looked considerably younger. The storms of his youth, the dissipation of his riper years, the great excesses of every kind in which he had indulged, had not impaired his iron constitution in the least. Of Herculean build, he was extremely proud of his strength, and of his hands, which were well formed, but large, firmly knit, and powerful, such hands as rightly belonged to a gentleman whose ancestors had given many a crushing blow with ponderous battle-axe in the Crusades. His face revealed his character. He possessed all the graces and all the vices of a courtier. He was, at the same time, spiritual and ignorant, sceptical, and violently imbued with the prejudices of his class. Though less robust than his father, Marshal was a no less distinguished-looking cavalier. It was not strange that women raved over his blue eyes and the beautiful blonde hair which he inherited from his mother. To his father he owed energy, courage, and it must also be added, perversity but he was his superior in education and in intellect. If he shared his father's prejudices, he had not adopted them without weighing them carefully. What the father might do in a moment of excitement, the son was capable of doing in cold blood. It was thus that the abbey, with rare sagacity, read the characters of his guests. 
so it was with great sorrow but without surprise that he heard the duke advance on the questions of the day the impossible ideas shared by nearly all the emigres knowing the condition of the country and the state of public opinion the cure endeavoured to convince the obstinate man of his mistake but upon this subject the duke would not permit contradiction or even raillery and he was fast losing his temper when bibienne appeared at the parlour door monsieur le duc she said monsieur lacheneur and his daughter are without and desire to speak to you end of chapter three recording by joanna chapter four of monsieur le Coq, part two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanna Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaborio, Part 2, Chapter 4 This name Lachiner awakened no recollection in the mind of the Duke. First, he had never lived at Sermuse and even if he had, what courtier of the ancien regime ever troubled himself about the individual names of the peasants whom he regarded with such profound indifference? When a grand seigneur addressed these people, he said, Hello! Hi! There! Friend! My worthy fellow! So it was with the air of a man who was making an effort of memory that the Duc de Samouz repeated, Lacheneur! Monsieur Lacheneur! But Marshal, a closer observer than his father, had noticed that the priest's glance wavered at the sound of this name. "'Who is this person, Abbe? demanded the Duke lightly. "'Monsieur Lacheneur,' replied the priest, with very evident hesitation, "'is the present owner of the Chateau de Sermuse. Marshal, the precocious diplomat, could not repress a smile on hearing this response, which he had foreseen. But the duke bounded from his chair. Ah! he exclaimed, it is the rascal who has had the impudence. Let him come in, old woman, let him come in. Bibiane retired, and the priest's uneasiness increased. Permit me, Monsieur le Duc, he said hastily, to remark that Monsieur Lacheneur exercises a great influence in this region. To offend him would be impolitic. I understand you advise me to be conciliatory. Such sentiments are purely Jacobin. If His Majesty listens to the advice of such as you, all these sales of confiscated estates will be ratified. Zounds, our interests are the same. If the revolution has deprived the nobility of their property, it has also impoverished the clergy. The possessions of a priest are not of this world, monsieur, said the curé coldly. Monsieur de Semouse was about to make some impertinent response when Monsieur Lacheneur appeared, followed by his daughter. The wretched man was ghastly pale, great drops of perspiration stood out upon his temples. His restless, haggard eyes revealed his distress of mind. Marianne was as pale as her father, but her attitude and the light that burned in her eyes told of invincible energy and determination. "'Ah, well, friend,' said the Duke, "'so we are the owner of Sermuse, it seems.' This was said with such a careless insolence of manner that the curé blushed that they should thus treat, in his own house, a man whom he considered his equal. He rose and offered the visitors chairs. "'Will you take a seat, dear Monsieur Lacheneur?' said he, with a politeness intended as a lesson for the Duke. "'And you also, mademoiselle, do me the honour. But the father and the daughter both refused the proffered civility with a motion of the head. Monsieur le Duc, continued Lacheneur, I am an old servant of your house. Ah, indeed. Mademoiselle Armand, your aunt, accorded my poor mother the honour of acting as my godmother. Ah, yes, interrupted the Duc. I remember you now. Our family has shown great goodness to you and yours and it was to prove your gratitude, probably, that you made haste to purchase our estate? The former ploughboy was of humble origin, but his heart and his character had developed with his fortunes. He understood his own worth. Much as he was disliked, and even detested by his neighbours, everyone respected him. 
and here was a man who treated him with undisguised scorn. Why? By what right? Indignant at the outrage, he made a movement as if to retire. No one save his daughter knew the truth. He had only to keep silence, and Sir Muse remained his. Yes, he had still the power to keep Sir Muse, and he knew it, for he did not share the fears of the ignorant rustics. He was too well informed not to be able to distinguish between the hopes of the emigres and the possible. He knew that an abyss separated the dream from the reality. A beseeching word uttered in a low tone by his daughter made him turn again to the duke. If I purchase Sir Muse, he answered in a voice husky with emotion, it was in obedience to the command of your dying aunt and with the money which she gave me for that purpose. If you see me here, it is only because I come to restore to you the deposit confided in my keeping. Anyone not belonging to that class of spoilt fools which surround a throne would have been deeply touched. But the Duke thought this grand act of honesty and of generosity the most simple and natural thing in the world. That is very well, so far as the principle is concerned, said he. Let us now speak of the interest. Sir Mews, if I remember rightly, yielded an average income of 100,000 louis per year. These revenues, well invested, should have amounted to a very considerable amount. Where is this? This claim, thus advanced and at such a moment, was so outrageous that Marshal, disgusted, made a sign to his father, which the latter did not see. But the curé, hoping to recall the extortioner to something like a sense of shame, exclaimed, Monsieur le Duc! Oh, Monsieur le Duc! Lachiner shrugged his shoulders with an air of resignation. The income I have used for my own living expenses and in educating my children, but most of it has been expended in improving the estate, which today yields an income twice as large as in former years. That is to say, for twenty years, Monsieur Lacheneur has played the part of Lord of the Manor, a delightful comedy. You are rich now, I suppose. I possess nothing, but I hope you will allow me to take ten thousand francs which your aunt gave to me. Ah, she gave you ten thousand francs, and when? On the same evening that she gave me the eighty thousand francs intended for the purchase of the estate. Perfect. What proof can you furnish that she gave you this sum? Lacheneur stood motionless and speechless. He tried to reply, but he could not. If he opened his lips, it would only be to pour forth a torrent of menaces, insults, and invectives. Marianne stepped quickly forward. The proof, monsieur, said she in a clear ringing voice, is the word of this man who, of his own free will, comes to return to you, to give you a fortune. As she sprang forward, her beautiful dark hair escaped from its confinement. The rich blood crimsoned her cheeks. Her dark eyes flashed brilliantly, and sorrow, anger, horror at the humiliation imparted a sublime expression to her face. She was so beautiful that Marshal regarded her with wonder. Lovely, he murmured in English, beautiful as an angel. These words, which she understood, abashed Marianne, but she had said enough. Her father felt that he was avenged. He drew from his pocket a roll of papers and throwing them upon the table. Here are your titles, he said, addressing the duke in a tone full of implacable hatred. Keep the legacy that your aunt gave me. I wish nothing of yours. I shall never set foot in Sermuse again. Penniless I entered it, penniless I will leave it. He quitted the room with head proudly erect, and when they were outside he said but one word to his daughter. Well, you have done your duty, she replied. It is those who have not done it who are to be pitied. She had no opportunity to say more. Marshal came running after them, anxious for another chance of seeing this young girl whose beauty had made such an impression upon him. I hastened after you, he said, addressing Marianne rather than Monsieur Lacheneur, to reassure you. All this will be arranged, mademoiselle. Eyes so beautiful as yours should never know tears. I will be your advocate with my father. Mademoiselle Lacheneur has no need of an advocate, a harsh voice interrupted. Marcel turned and saw the young man, who that morning went to warn Monsieur Lacheneur of the Duke's arrival. 
I am the Marquis de Sermouze, he said insolently. And I, said the other quietly, am Maurice de Corval. They surveyed each other for a moment, each expecting, perhaps, an insult from the other. Instinctively, they felt that they were to be enemies, and the bitterest animosity spoke in the glances they exchanged. Perhaps they felt a presentiment that they were to be champions of two different principles, as well as rivals. Marshal, remembering his father, yielded. "'We shall meet again, Monsieur de Corval,' he said as he retired." At this threat, Maurice shrugged his shoulders and said, You had better not desire it. End of chapter 4、Mm. Chapter 5 of Monsieur Lecoq, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford. Monsieur Le Coq by Emile Gaboriau, Part Two, Chapter Five. The abode of the Baron d'Escorval, that brick structure with stone trimmings which was visible from the superb avenue leading to Sermeuse, was small and unpretentious. Its chief attraction was a pretty lawn that extended to the banks of the Oiselle and a small but beautifully shaded park. It was known as the Chateau d'Escorval. But that appellation was gross flattery. Any petty manufacturer who'd amassed a small fortune would have desired a larger, handsomer, and more imposing establishment. M. d'Escorval, and it will be an eternal honor to him in history, was not rich. Although he had been entrusted with several of those missions from which generals and diplomats often return laden with millions, M. d'Escorval's worldly possessions. Consisted only of the little patrimony bequeathed him by his father, a property which yielded an income of from twenty to twenty five thousand francs a year. This modest dwelling, situated about a mile from Sermeuse, represented the savings of ten years. He had built it in eighteen six from a plan drawn by his own hand, and it was the dearest spot on earth to him. He always hastened to this retreat when his work allowed him a few days of rest. But this time he had not come to Escorval of his own free will. He had been compelled to leave Paris by the prescribed list of the twenty fourth of July, that fatal list which summoned the enthusiastic La b e d o y e r e and the honest and virtuous Drouot before a court martial. And even in this solitude, M. u d'Escorval's situation was not without danger. He was one of those who, some days before the disaster of Waterloo, Had strongly urged the emperor to order the execution of Fouche, the former minister of police. Now Fouche knew this counsel, and he was powerful. Take care, M. u s i e u Descoval's friends wrote him from Paris. But he put his trust in Providence and faced the future, threatening though it was, with the unalterable serenity of a pure conscience. The baron was still young, he was not yet fifty. But anxiety, work, and long nights passed in struggling with the most arduous difficulties of the imperial policy had made him old before his time. He was tall, slightly inclined to embonpoint, and stooped a little. His calm eyes, his serious mouth, his broad furrowed forehead, and his austere manners inspired respect. He must be stern and inflexible, said those who saw him for the first time. But they were mistaken. If, in the exercise of his official duties, this truly great man had the strength to resist all temptations to swerve from the path of right, if, when duty was at stake, he was as rigid as iron, in private life he was as unassuming as a child, and kind and gentle even to the verge of weakness. To this nobility of character he owed his domestic happiness. That rare and precious happiness which fills one's existence with a celestial perfume. During the bloodiest epoch of the reign of terror, M. u s i e u d'Escorval had wrested from the guillotine a young girl named Victoire Laure de l a l l e u a distant cousin of the r e t o of Comarin, as beautiful as an angel and only three years younger than himself. He loved her, and though she was an orphan destitute of fortune, he married her. 
considering the treasure of her virgin heart of far greater value than the most magnificent dowry. She was an honest woman, as her husband was an honest man, in the most strict and vigorous sense of the word. She was seldom seen at the Tuileries, where M. d'Escorval's worth made him eagerly welcomed. The splendours of the imperial court, which at that time surpassed all the pomp of the time of Louis the Fourteenth, had no attractions for her. Grace, beauty, youth and accomplishments, she reserved them all for the adornment of her home. Her husband was her god. She lived in him and through him. She had not a thought which did not belong to him. The short time that he could spare from his arduous labours to devote to her were her happiest hours. And when in the evening they sat beside the fire in their modest drawing-room, with their son Maurice playing on the rug at their feet, it seemed to them that they had nothing to wish for here below. The overthrow of the empire surprised them in the heyday of their happiness. Surprised them? No. For a long time M. d'Escorval had seen the prodigious edifice erected by the genius whom he had made his idol totter as if about to fall. Certainly he felt intense chagrin at this fall, but he was heartbroken at the sight of all the treason and cowardice which followed it. He was indignant and horrified at the rising en masse of the avaricious, who hastened to gorge themselves with the spoil. Under these circumstances, exile from Paris seemed an actual blessing. Besides, as he remarked to the baroness, we shall soon be forgotten here. But even while he said this, he felt many misgivings. Still, by his side, his noble wife presented a tranquil face, even while she trembled for the safety of her adored husband. On this first Sunday in August, M. d'Escorval and his wife had been unusually sad. A vague presentiment of approaching misfortune weighed heavily upon their hearts. At the same hour that Lacheneur presented himself at the house of the Abbe Midon, they were seated upon the terrace in front of the house, gazing anxiously at the two roads leading from Escorval to the chateau and to the village of Sermeuse. Warned that same morning by his friends in Montagnac of the arrival of the duke, the baron had sent his son to inform M. Lacheneur. He had requested him to be absent as short a time as possible, but in spite of this fact the hours were rolling by, and Maurice had not returned. What if something has happened to him? both father and mother were thinking. No, nothing had happened to him. Only a word from Mademoiselle Lacheneur had sufficed to make him forget his usual deferences to his father's wishes. This evening, she had said, I shall certainly know your heart. What could this mean? Could she doubt him? Tortured by the most cruel anxieties, the poor youth could not resolve to go away without an explanation, and he hung around the chateau, hoping that Marianne would reappear. She did reappear at last, but leaning upon the arm of her father. Young d'Escorval followed them at a distance, and soon saw them enter the parsonage. What were they going to do there? He knew that the duke and his son were within. The time that they remained there, and which he passed in the public square, seemed more than a century long. They emerged at last, however, and he was about to join them, when he was prevented by the appearance of Martial, whose promises he overheard. Maurice knew nothing of life, he was as innocent as a child, but he could not mistake the intentions that dictated this step on the part of the Marquis de Sermeuse. At the thought that a libertine's caprice should dare rest for an instant upon the pure and beautiful girl whom he loved with all the strength of his being, whom he had sworn should be his wife, all his blood mounted madly to his brain. He felt a wild longing to chastise the insolent wretch. Fortunately, unfortunately perhaps, his hand was arrested by the recollection of a phrase which he had heard his father repeat a thousand times. Calmness and irony are the only weapons worthy of the strong. And he possessed sufficient strength of will to appear calm, while in reality he was beside himself with passion. It was Martial who lost his self-control and who threatened him. Ah, yes, I will find you again, upstart, repeated Maurice, through his set teeth as he watched his enemy move away. 
for Martial had turned to discover that Marianne and her father had left him. He saw them standing about a hundred paces from him. Although he was surprised at their indifference, he made haste to join them, and addressed M. Lacheneur. "'We are just going to your father's house,' was the response he received, in an almost ferocious tone. A glance from Marianne commanded silence. He obeyed, and walked a few steps behind them, with his head bowed upon his breast, terribly anxious, and seeking vainly to explain what had passed. His attitude betrayed such intense sorrow that his mother divined it as soon as she caught sight of him. All the anguish which this courageous woman had hidden for a month found utterance in a single cry. "'Ah! here is misfortune,' said she. "'We shall not escape it.' It was indeed misfortune. One could not doubt it when one saw M. Lacheneur enter the drawing-room. He advanced with the heavy uncertain step of a drunken man, his eye void of expression, his features distorted, his lips pale and trembling. "'What has happened?' asked the baron eagerly. But the other did not seem to hear him. "'Ah! I warned her,' he murmured, continuing a monologue which had begun before he entered the room. "'I told my daughter so.' Madame d'Escorval, after kissing Marianne, drew the girl toward her. "'What has happened? For God's sake, tell me what has happened!' she exclaimed. With a gesture expressive of the most sorrowful resignation, the girl motioned her to look and to listen to M. Lacheneur. He had recovered from that stupor, the gift of God, which follows cries that are too terrible for human endurance. Like a sleeper who on waking finds his miseries forgotten during his slumber lying in wait for him, he regained with consciousness the capacity to suffer. "'It is only this, Monsieur le Baron,' replied the unfortunate man in a harsh, unnatural voice. "'I rose this morning the richest proprietor in the country, and I shall lie down to-night poorer than the poorest beggar in this commune. I had everything, I no longer have anything, nothing but my two hands. They earned me my bread for twenty-five years. They will earn it for me now until the day of my death. I had a beautiful dream. It ended." Before this outburst of despair, M. d'Escorval turned pale. "'You must exaggerate your misfortune,' he faltered. Explain what has happened." Unconscious of what he was doing, M. Lacheneur threw his hat upon a chair and flinging back his long grey hair, he said, To you I will tell all. I came here for that purpose. I know you, I know your heart, and have you not done me the honour to call me your friend? Then, with the cruel exactness of the living, breathing truth, he related the scene which had just taken place at the presbytery. The baron listened petrified with astonishment, almost doubting the evidence of his own senses. Madame d'Escorval's indignant and sorrowful exclamations showed that every noble sentiment in her soul revolted against such injustice. But there was one auditor, whom Marie-Anne alone observed, and who was moved to his very entrails by this recital. This auditor was Maurice. Leaning against the door, pale as death, he tried most energetically, but in vain, to repress the tears of rage and sorrow which swelled up in his eyes. To insult Lacheneur was to insult Marianne, that is to say, to injure, to strike, to outrage him in all that he held most dear in the world. Ah, it is certain that Martial, had he been within his reach, would have paid dearly for these insults to the father of the girl Maurice loved but he swore that this chastisement was only deferred, that it should surely come. And it was not mere angry boasting. This young man, though so modest and so gentle in manner, had a heart that was inaccessible to fear. His beautiful dark eyes, which had the trembling timidity of the eyes of a young girl, met the gaze of an enemy without flinching. When M. Lacheneur had repeated the last words which he had addressed to the Duc de Sermeuse, M. d'Escorval offered him his hand. "'I have told you already that I was your friend,' he said, in a voice faltering with emotion, "'but I must tell you to-day that I am proud of having such a friend as you.' The unfortunate man trembled at the touch of that loyal hand which clasped his so warmly, 
and his face betrayed an ineffable satisfaction. "'If my father had not returned it,' murmured the obstinate Marianne, "'my father would have been an unfaithful guardian, a thief. He has done only his duty.' M. d'Escorval turned to the young girl, a little surprised. "'You speak the truth, mademoiselle,' he said reproachfully. But when you are as old as I am, and have had my experience, you will know that the accomplishment of a duty is, under certain circumstances, a heroism of which few persons are capable." M. Lacheneur turned to his friend. "'Ah! your words do me good, monsieur,' said he. "'Now I am content with what I have done.' The Baroness rose, too much the woman to know how to resist the generous dictates of her heart. And I also, Monsieur Lacheneur, she said, desire to press your hand. I wish to tell you that I esteem you as much as I despise the ingrates who have sought to humiliate you when they should have fallen at your feet. They are heartless monsters, the like of whom certainly cannot be found upon the earth. Alas! sighed the Baron. The Allies have brought back others who, like these men, think the world created exclusively for their benefit. And these people wish to be our masters, growled Lacheneur. By some strange fatality, no one chanced to hear the remark made by M. Lacheneur. Had they overheard and questioned him, he would probably have disclosed some of the projects which were as yet an embryo in his own mind, and in that case what disastrous consequences might have been averted. M. d'Escorval had regained his usual coolness. Now, my dear friend, he inquired, what course do you propose to pursue with these members of the Sermeuse family? They will hear nothing more from me, for some time at least. What, shall you not claim the ten thousand francs that they owe you? I shall ask them for nothing. You will be compelled to do so. Since you have alluded to the legacy, your own honour will demand that you insist upon its payment by all legal methods. There are still judges in France. M. Lacheneur shook his head. The judges will not accord me the justice I desire. I shall not apply to them. But, no, monsieur, no. I wish to have nothing to do with these men. I shall not even go to the chateau to remove my clothing, nor that of my daughter. If they send it to us, very well. If it pleases them to keep it, so much the better. The more shameful, infamous, and odious their conduct appears, the better I shall be satisfied." The baron made no reply, but his wife spoke, believing she had a sure means of conquering this incomprehensible obstinacy. "'I should understand your determination if you were alone in the world,' said she. "'But you have children.' "'My son is eighteen, madame. He possesses good health and an excellent education. He can make his own way in Paris if he chooses to remain there. "'But your daughter?' "'Marianne will remain with me.' M. d'Escorval thought it his duty to interfere. "'Take care, my dear friend, that your grief does not overthrow your reason,' said he. "'Reflect what will become of you, your daughter and yourself.' The wretched man smiled sadly. "'Oh,' he replied, "'we are not as destitute as I said. I exaggerated our misfortune. We are still landed proprietors. Last year an old cousin, whom I could never induce to come and live at Sermeuse, died, bequeathing all her property to Marianne. This property consisted of a poor little cottage near the Reche, with a little garden and a few acres of sterile land. In compliance with my daughter's entreaties, I repaired the cottage, and sent there a few articles of furniture, a table, some chairs, and a couple of beds. My daughter designed it as a home for old Father Griva and his wife and I, surrounded by wealth and luxury, said to myself, How comfortable those two old people will be there! They will live as snug as a bug in a rug. Well, what I thought so comfortable for others will be good enough for me. I will raise vegetables, and Marianne shall sell them. Was he speaking seriously? Maurice must have supposed so, for he sprang forward. This shall not be, Monsieur Lacheneur, he exclaimed. Oh! No, this shall not be, for I love Marianne, and I ask you to give her to me for my wife. End of chapter 5
Chapter Six of Monsieur Lecoq, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monsieur Lecoq by Emile Gaborio, Part Two, Chapter Six. Maurice and Marianne had loved each other for many years. As children, they had played together in the magnificent grounds surrounding the Chateau de Sermeuse and in the park at Escorval. Together they chased the brilliant butterflies, searched for pebbles on the banks of the river, or rolled in the hay while their mothers sauntered through the meadows bordering the Oiselle, for their mothers were friends. Madame Lacheneur had been reared like other poor peasant girls. That is to say, on the day of her marriage, it was only with great difficulty she succeeded in inscribing her name upon the register. But from the example of her husband she had learned that prosperity, as well as noblesse, entails certain obligations upon one, and with rare courage, crowned with still rarer success, she had undertaken to acquire an education in keeping with her fortune and her new rank and the baroness had made no effort to resist the sympathy that attracted her to this meritorious young woman, in whom she had discerned a really superior mind and a truly refined nature. When Madame Lacheneur died, Madame d'Escorval mourned for her as she would have mourned for a favorite sister. From that moment Maurice's attachment assumed a more serious character. Educated in a Parisian lyceum, his teachers sometimes had occasion to complain of his want of application. "'If your professors are not satisfied with you,' said his mother, "'you shall not accompany me to Escorval on the coming of your vacation, "'and you will not see your little friend.' And the simple threat was always sufficient to make the schoolboy resume his studies with redoubled diligence. So each year as it passed strengthened the grande passion which preserved Maurice from the restlessness and the errors of adolescence. The two children were equally timid and artless, and equally infatuated with each other. Long walks in the twilight under the eyes of their parents, a glance that revealed their delight at meeting each other, flowers exchanged between them, which were religiously preserved, such were their simple pleasures. But that magical and sublime word, love, so sweet to utter and so sweet to hear, had never once dropped from their lips. The audacity of Maurice had never gone beyond a furtive pressure of the hand. The parents could not be ignorant of this mutual affection, and if they pretended to shut their eyes it was only because it did not displease them nor disturb their plans. Monsieur and Madame d'Escorval saw no objection to their son's marriage with a young girl whose nobility of character they appreciated, and who was as beautiful as she was good. That she was the richest heiress in all the country round about was naturally no objection. So far as M. Lacheneur was concerned, he was delighted at the prospect of a marriage which would ally him, a former ploughboy, with an old family whose head was universally respected. So, although no direct allusion to the subject had ever escaped the lips of the baron or of M. Lacheneur, there was a tacit agreement between the two families. Yes, the marriage was considered a foregone conclusion. And yet this impetuous and unexpected declaration by Maurice struck every one dumb. In spite of his agitation, the young man perceived the effect produced by his words, and frightened by his own boldness, he turned and looked questioningly at his father. The baron's face was grave, even sad, but his attitude expressed no displeasure. This gave renewed courage to the anxious lover. "'You will excuse me, monsieur,' he said, addressing Lacheneur, "'for presenting my request in such a manner and at such a time. But surely, when fate glowers ominously upon you, that is the time when your friends should declare themselves, and deem themselves fortunate if their devotion can make you forget the infamous treatment to which you have been subjected. As he spoke, he was watching Marianne. Blushing and embarrassed, she turned away her head, perhaps to conceal the tears which inundated her face, tears of joy and gratitude. The love of the man she adored came forth victorious from a test which it would not be prudent for many heiresses to impose. Now she could truly say that she knew Maurice's heart. He, however, continued, 
I have not consulted my father, sir, but I know his affection for me and his esteem for you. When the happiness of my life is at stake, he will not oppose me. He who married my dear mother without a dowry must understand my feelings. He was silent, awaiting the verdict. I approve your course, my son, said M. d'Escorval, deeply affected. You have conducted yourself like an honourable man. Certainly you are very young to become the head of a family, but as you say, circumstances demand it. He turned to M. Lacheneur and added, My dear friend, I, in my son's behalf, ask the hand of your daughter in marriage. Maurice had not expected so little opposition. In his delight he was almost tempted to bless the hateful Duc de Sermeuse, to whom he would owe his approaching happiness. He sprang toward his father, and seizing his hands he raised them to his lips, faltering, "'Thanks, you are so good, I love you. Oh, how happy I am!' Alas, the poor boy was in too much haste to rejoice. A gleam of pride flashed in M. Lacheneur's eyes, but his face soon resumed its gloomy expression. "'Believe me, Monsieur le Baron, I am deeply touched by your grandeur of soul, yes, deeply touched. You wish to make me forget my humiliation, but for this very reason I should be the most contemptible of men if I did not refuse the great honour you desire to confer upon my daughter.' "'What?' exclaimed the Baron, in utter astonishment. "'You refuse?' "'I am compelled to do so.' Thunderstruck at first, Maurice afterward renewed the attack with an energy which no one had ever suspected in his character before. "'Do you, then, wish to ruin my life, monsieur?' he exclaimed. "'To ruin our life? For if I love Marianne, she also loves me.' It was easy to see that he spoke the truth. The unhappy girl, crimson with happy blushes the moment before, had suddenly become whiter than marble, as she looked imploringly at her father. "'It cannot be,' repeated M. Lacheneur, "'and the day will come when you will bless the decision I make known at this moment.' Alarmed by her son's evident agony, Madame d'Escorval interposed. "'You must have reasons for this refusal.' "'None that I can disclose, madame, but never while I live shall my daughter be your son's wife.' "'Ah! it will kill my child!' exclaimed the baroness. M. Lacheneur shook his head. M. Maurice,' said he, "'is young. He will console himself. He will forget.' "'Never!' interrupted the unhappy lover. "'Never!' "'And your daughter?' inquired the baroness. "'Ah! this was the weak spot in his armour. The instinct of a mother was not mistaken. M. Lacheneur hesitated a moment but he finally conquered the weakness that had threatened to master him. "'Marianne,' he replied slowly, "'knows her duty too well not to obey when I command. When I tell her the motive that governs my conduct, she will become resigned, and if she suffers, she will know how to conceal her sufferings.' He paused suddenly. They heard in the distance of firing of musketry, the discharge of rifles, whose sharp ring overpowered even the sullen roar of cannon. Every face grew pale. Circumstances imparted to these sounds an ominous significance. With the same anguish clutching the hearts of both, M. d'Escorval and Lacheneur sprang out upon the terrace. But all was still again. Extended as was the horizon, the eye could discern nothing unusual. The sky was blue, not a particle of smoke hung over the trees. "'It is the enemy,' muttered M. Lacheneur, in a tone which told how gladly he would have shouldered his gun, and with five hundred others marched against the united allies. He paused. The explosions were repeated with still greater violence, and for a period of five minutes succeeded each other without cessation. M. d'Escorval listened with knitted brows. "'That is not the fire of an engagement,' he murmured. To remain long in such a state of uncertainty was out of the question. "'If you will permit me, father,' ventured Maurice, "'I will go and ascertain.' "'Go,' replied the baron quietly. "'But if it is anything which I doubt, "'do not expose yourself to danger. Return.' "'Oh, be prudent,' insisted Madame d'Escorval, "'who already saw her son exposed to the most frightful peril.' 
Be prudent, entreated Marianne, who alone understood what attractions danger might have for a despairing and unhappy man. These precautions were unnecessary. As Maurice was rushing to the door, his father stopped him. Wait, said he, here is someone who can probably give us information. A man had just appeared around a turn of the road leading to Sermeuse. He was advancing bareheaded in the middle of a dusty road, with hurried strides, and occasionally brandishing his stick, as if threatening an enemy visible to himself alone. Soon they were able to distinguish his features. "'It is Jean Louisneau,' exclaimed M. Lacheneur. "'The owner of the vineyards on the borderie? "'The same, the handsomest young farmer in the country, and the best also. "'Ah, he has good blood in his veins. "'We may well be proud of him.' "'Ask him to stop,' said M. d'Escorval. Lacheneur leaned over the balustrade, and forming a trumpet out of his two hands, he called, "'Oh, Jean Louisneau!' The robust young farmer raised his head. "'Come up!' shouted Lacheneur. "'The baron wishes to speak to you.' Jean Louisneau responded by a gesture of assent. They saw him enter the gate, cross the garden, and at last appear at the door of the drawing-room. His features were distorted with fury. His disordered clothing gave evidence of a serious conflict. His cravat was gone, and his torn shirt-collar revealed his muscular throat. "'Where is this fighting?' demanded Lacheneur eagerly. "'And with whom?' Jean Louisneau gave a nervous laugh, which resembled a roar of rage. "'They are not fighting,' he replied. "'They are amusing themselves.' This firing which you hear is in honour of Monsieur le Duc de Sermeuse. Impossible! I know it very well, and yet what I have told you is the truth. It is the work of that miserable wretch and thief, Chupin. Ah, canaille! If I ever find him within reach of my arm, he will never steal again. Monsieur Lacheneur was confounded. Tell us what has happened, he said excitedly. Oh, it is as clear as daylight. When the duke arrived at Sermeuse, Chupin, the old scoundrel, with his two rascally boys and that old hag, his wife, ran after the carriage like beggars after a diligence, crying, Vive Monsieur le Duc! The duke was enchanted, for he doubtless expected a volley of stones, and he placed a six-franc piece in the hand of each of the wretches. This money gave Chupin an appetite for more, so he took it into his head to give this old noble a reception like that which was given to the emperor. Having learned through Bibienne, whose tongue is as long as a viper's, all that has passed at the presbytery, between you, Monsieur Lacheneur, and the duke, he came and proclaimed it in the market-place. When they heard it, all who had purchased national lands were frightened. Chupin had counted on this, and soon he began telling the poor fools that they must burn powder under the duke's nose if they wished him to confirm their titles to their property. And did they believe him? Implicitly. It did not take them long to make their preparations. They went to the town hall and took the firemen's rifles, and the guns used for firing a salute on fete days. The mayor gave them the powder, and you heard— when I left Sermeuse, there were more than two hundred idiots before the presbytery, shouting, Vive Monseigneur! Vive le Duc de Sermeuse! It was as d'Escorval had thought. The same pitiful farce that was played in Paris, only on a smaller scale, he murmured. Avarice and human cowardice are the same the world over. Meanwhile, Jean Louisneau was going on with his recital. To make the fate complete, the devil must have warned all the nobility in the neighbourhood, for they all came running. They say that Monsieur de Sermeuse is a favourite with the king, and that he can get anything he wishes. So you can imagine how they all greeted him. I am only a poor peasant, but never would I lie down in the dust before any man as these old nobles who were so haughty with us did before the duke. They kissed his hands, and he allowed them to do it. He walked about the square with the Marquis de Courtomieux. And his son, interrupted Maurice. The Marquis Martial, is it not? He is also walking before the church with Mademoiselle Blanche de Courtomieux upon his arm. Ah, I do not understand how people can call her pretty, a little bit of a thing so blonde that one might suppose her hair was grey. Ah, how those two laughed and made fun of the peasants. They say they are going to marry each other. And even this evening there is to be a banquet at the Chateau de Courtomieux in honour of the Duke. 
He had told all he knew. He paused. You have forgotten only one thing, said M. Lacheneur. That is to tell us how your clothing happened to be torn, as if you had been fighting. The young farmer hesitated for a moment, then replied somewhat brusquely, I can tell you all the same. While Chupin was preaching, I also preached, but not in the same strain. The scoundrel reported me. So in crossing the square, the duke paused before me and remarked, So you are an evil-disposed person? I said no, but I knew my rights. Then he took me by the coat and shook me, and told me that he would cure me, and that he would take possession of his vineyard again. Saint Dieu! When I felt the old rascal's hand upon me, my blood boiled. I pinioned him. Fortunately, six or seven men fell upon me, and compelled me to let him go. But he had better make up his mind not to come prowling round my vineyard. He clenched his hands, his eyes blazed ominously, his whole person breathed an intense desire for vengeance. And M. d'Escorval was silent, fearing to aggravate this hatred so imprudently kindled, and whose explosion, he believed, would be terrible. M. Lacheneur had risen from his chair. "'I must go and take possession of my cottage,' he remarked to Chanluineau. "'You will accompany me. I have a proposition to make to you.' M. and Madame d'Escorval endeavoured to detain him, but he would not allow himself to be persuaded, and he departed with his daughter." But Maurice did not despair. Marianne had promised to meet him the following day in the pine grove near the Reche. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Monsieur Le Coq, Part 2 – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Monsieur Lecoq by Emilie Gaboureau. Part 2. Chapter 7. The demonstrations which had greeted the Duc de Sermuse had been correctly reported by Chen Luino. Chupin had found the secret of kindling to a white heat the enthusiasm of the cold and calculating peasants who were his neighbours he was a dangerous rascal the old robber shrewd and cautious bold as those who possess nothing can afford to be as patient as a savage in short one of the most consummate scoundrels that ever existed the peasants feared him and yet they had no conception of his real character. All his resources of mind had, until now, been expended in evading the precipice of the rural code. To save himself from falling into the hands of the gendarmes, and to steal a few sacks of wheat, he had expended treasures of intrigue which would have made the fortunes of twenty diplomats. Circumstances, as he always said, had been against him. So he desperately caught at the first and only opportunity worthy of his talent which had ever presented itself. Of course, the wily rustic had said nothing of the true circumstances which attended the restoration of Sermus to its former owner. From him the peasants learned only the bare fact, and the news spread rapidly from group to group. Monsieur Le Genoch has given up Sermus, said he. Chateau, forests, vineyards, fields. He surrenders everything. This was enough, and more than enough to terrify every landowner in the village. If Le Genoch, this man who was so powerful in their eyes, considered the danger so threatening that he deemed it necessary or advisable to make a complete surrender, what was to become of them, poor devils, without aid, without counsel, without defence? They were told that the government was about to betray their interests, that a decree was in process of preparation which would render their title deeds worthless. They could see no hope of salvation, except through the duke's generosity, the generosity which Chupin painted with the glowing colours of the rainbow. When one is not strong enough to weather the gale, 
one must bow like a reed before it, and rise again after the storm has passed. Such was their conclusion. And they bowed, and their apparent enthusiasm was all the more vociferous on account of the rage and fear that filled their hearts. A close observer would have detected an undercurrent of anger and menace in their shouts. Each man also said to himself, what do we risk by crying, Vive le Duc? Nothing, absolutely nothing, if he is contented with that as a compensation for his lost property. Good. If he is not content, we shall have time afterward to adopt other measures. So they shouted themselves hoarse. And while the Duke was sipping his coffee in the little drawing-room of the presbytery, he expressed his lively satisfaction at the scene without. He, this grand seigneur, of times gone by, this man of absurd prejudice and obstinate illusions, the unconquerable and the incorrigible, he took these acclamations, truly spurious coin, as Chateaubriand says, for ready money. How you have deceived me, Kyo, he was saying to Abmidon, how could you declare that your people were unfavourably disposed towards us? One is compelled to believe that these evil intentions exist only in your mind and in your own heart. Abmedon was silent. What could he reply? He could not understand this sudden revolution in public opinion, this abrupt change from gloom and discontent to excessive gaiety. There is somebody at the bottom of all this, he thought. It was not long before it became apparent who that somebody was. Emboldened by his success without, Chupin ventured to present himself at the presbytery. He entered the drawing-room with his back rounded in a circle, scraping and cringing, an obsequious smile upon his lips. And through the half-open door one could discern, in the shadows of the passage, the far from reassuring faces of his two sons. He came as an ambassador, he declared, after an interminable litany of protestations. He came to implore Monseigneur to show himself upon the public square. Ah, well, yes, exclaimed the Duke, rising. Yes, I will yield to the wishes of these good people. Follow me, Marquise. As he appeared at the door of the presbytery, a loud shout rent to the air. The rifles were discharged, the guns belched forth their smoke and fire. Never had Sermuse heard such a salvo of artillery. Three windows of the Bouffe Cron were shattered. A veritable grand seigneur, the Duc de Sermuse, knew how to preserve an appearance of haughtiness and indifference. Any display of emotion was, in his opinion, vulgar. But, in reality, he was delighted charmed so delighted that he desired to reward his welcomers a glance over the deeds handed him by la Genieur had showed him that sermus had been restored to him intact the portions of the immense domain which had been detached and sold separately were of relatively minor importance the duke thought it would be politic and, at the same time, inexpensive to abandon all claim to these few acres, which were now shared by forty or fifty peasants. "'My friends!' he exclaimed in a loud voice. "'I renounce, for myself and for my descendants, all claim to the land belonging to my house, which you have purchased. They are yours. I give them to you.' By this absurd pretense of a gift, Monsieur de Sermus thought to add the finishing touch to his popularity. A great mistake! It simply assured the popularity of Chupin, the organizer of the farce. And while the Duke was promenading through the crowd with a proud and self-satisfied air, the peasants were secretly laughing and jeering at him. And if they promptly took sides with him against Jean Louisneau, it was only because his gift was still fresh in their mind, except for this. But the duke had not time to think much about this encounter, 
which produced a vivid impression upon his son. One of his former companions in exile, the Marquise de Courtornieu, whom he had informed of his arrival, hastened to welcome him, accompanied by his daughter, Mademoiselle Blanche. Marshal could do no less than offer his arm to the daughter of his father's friend, and they took a leisurely promenade in the shade of the lofty trees, while the Duke renewed his acquaintance with all the nobility of the neighbourhood. There was not a single nobleman who did not hasten to press the hand of the Duke de Sermus. First, he possessed, it was said, a property of more than twenty millions in England. Then, he was the friend of the king, and each neighbour had some favour to ask for himself, for his relatives, or for his friends. Poor king! He should have had entire France to divide like a cake between these comrades, whose voracious appetites it was impossible to satisfy. That evening, after a grand banquet at the Chateau de Courtenorieu, the duke slept in the Chateau de Sermus, in the room which had been occupied by La Chaigneur. Like Louis the Eighteenth, he laughingly said, in the chamber of Bonaparte. He was gay, chatty, and full of confidence in the future. It is good to be in one's own house, he remarked to his son, again and again. But Marshall responded only mechanically. His mind was occupied with thoughts of two women who had made a profound impression upon his by no means susceptible heart that day. He was thinking of those two young girls so utterly unlike. Blanche de Courtenay, Marianne Lacheneur. End of chapter 7 Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway the 29th of October, 2011. Chapter 8 of Monsieur Le Coq, Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Monsieur Le Coq by Emilie Gaborion Part 2 Chapter 8 Only those who, in the bright springtime of life, have loved, have been loved in return, and have suddenly seen the impassable gulf open between them and happiness, can realize Maurice d'Escorval's disappointment. All the dreams of his life, all his future plans, were based upon his love for Marianne. If this love failed him, the enchanted castle which hope had erected would crumble and fall, burying him in the ruins. Without Marianne, he saw neither aim nor motive in his existence. Still, he did not suffer himself to be deluded by false hopes. Although at first his appointed meeting with Marianne on the following day seemed salvation itself, on reflection he was forced to admit that this interview would change nothing, since everything depended upon the will of another party, the will of Monsieur Lacheneur. The remainder of the day he passed in mournful silence. The dinner hour came. He took his seat at a table, but it was impossible for him to swallow a morsel, and he soon requested his parents' permission to withdraw. Monsieur d'Escorval and the baroness exchanged a sorrowful glance, but did not allow themselves to offer any comment. They respected his grief. They knew that his was one of those sorrows which are only aggravated by any attempt of consolation. "'Poor Maurice!' murmured Madame Escorval, as soon as her son had left the room, and, as her husband made no reply, she added hesitatingly, "'Perhaps it will not be prudent for us to leave him too entirely to the dictates of his despair.' The baron shuddered. He divined only too well the terrible apprehension of his wife. "'We have nothing to fear,' he replied quickly, 
I heard Marianne promise to meet Maurice tomorrow in the grove at the Reche. The anxious mother breathed more freely. Her blood had frozen with horror at the thought that her son might, perhaps, be contemplating suicide. But she was a mother, and her husband's assurances did not satisfy her. She hastily ascended the stair leading to her son's room, softly opened the door, and looked in. He was so engrossed in his gloomy reverie that he had heard nothing, and did not even suspect the presence of the anxious mother who was watching over him. He was sitting at the window, his elbows resting upon the sill, his head supported by his hands, looking out into the night. There was no moon, but the night was clear, and over beyond the light fog that indicated the course of the Oiselle, one could discern the imposing mass of the Chateau de Sermus, with its towers and fanciful turrets. More than once he had sat thus silently gazing at this chateau, which sheltered what was dearest and most precious in all the world to him. From his windows he could see those of the room occupied by Marianne, and his heart always quickened its throbbing when he saw them illuminated. She is there, he thought, in her virgil chamber. She is kneeling to say her prayers. She murmurs my name after that of her father, imploring God's blessing upon us both. But this evening he was not waiting for a light to gleam through the panes of that dear window. Marianne was no longer at Sermus. She had been driven away. Where was she now? She, accustomed to all the luxury that wealth could procure, no longer had any home except a poor thatch-covered hovel, whose walls were not even whitewashed, whose only floor was the earth itself, dusty as the public highway in summer, frozen or muddy in winter. She was reduced to the necessity of occupying herself the humble abode she, in her charitable heart, had intended as an asylum for one of her pensioners. What was she doing now? Doubtless she was weeping. At this thought, Poor Maurice was heartbroken. What was his surprise, a little after midnight, to see the chateau brilliantly illuminated? The duke and his son had repaired to the chateau after the banquet given by the Marquise de Courtenay was over, and, before going to bed, they made a tour of inspection through this magnificent abode in which their ancestors had lived. They, therefore, might be said to have taken possession of the mansion whose threshold Monsieur de Sermus had not crossed for twenty-two years, and which Marshal had never seen. Maurice saw the lights leap from story to story, from casement to casement, until at last even the windows of Marianne's room were illuminated. At this sight the unhappy youth could not restrain a cry of rage. These men, these strangers dared enter this virgin bower, which he, even in thought, scarcely dared to penetrate. They trampled carelessly over the delicate carpet with the heavy boots. Maurice trembled in thinking of the liberties which they, in their insolent familiarity, might venture upon. He fancied he could see them examining and handling the thousand petty trifles with which young girls love to surround themselves. They opened the presses. Perhaps they were reading an unfinished letter lying upon her writing-desk. Never until this evening had Marshall supposed he could hate another as he hated these men. At last, in despair, he threw himself upon his bed, and passed the reminder of the night in thinking over what he should say to Marianne on the morrow, and in seeking some issue from his inextricable labyrinth. He rose before daybreak, and wandered about the park like a soul in distress, fearing, yet longing, for the hour that would decide his fate. Madame d'Escorval was obliged to exert all her authority to make him take some nourishment. He had quite forgotten that he had passed twenty-four hours without eating. When eleven o'clock sounded, he left the house. 
the land of the Rachet are situated on the other side of Oiselle. Maurice, to reach his destination, was obliged to cross the river at the ferry only a short distance from his home. When he reached the river bank, he found six or seven peasants who were waiting to cross. These people did not observe Maurice. They were talking earnestly, and he listened. It is certainly true, said one of the men. I heard it from Jean Louisnot himself only last evening. He was wild with delight. I invite you all to the wedding, he cried. I am betrothed to Monsieur Le Chinoir's daughter. The affair is decided. This astounding news positively stunned Maurice. He was actually unable to think or to move. Besides, he has been in love with her for a long time. Everyone knows that. One had only to see his eyes when he met her. Coals of fire were nothing to them. But while her father was so rich, he did not dare to speak. Now that the old man has met with these reverses, he ventures to offer himself, and is accepted. An unfortunate thing for him, remarked a little old man. Why so? If Monsieur Le Chigneur is ruined, as they say. The others laughed heartily. Ruined? Monsieur Le Chigneur? they exclaimed in chorus. How absurd! He is richer than all of us together. Do you suppose that he has been stupid enough not to have laid anything aside during all these years? He has put his money not in grounds, as he pretends, but somewhere else. You are saying what is untrue, interrupted Maurice indignantly. Monsieur Le Chignon left Sermuse as poor as he entered it. On recognizing Monsieur de Scorval's son, the peasants became extremely cautious. He questioned them, but could obtain only vague and unsatisfactory answers. A peasant, when interrogated, will never give a response which he thinks will be displeasing to his questioner. He is afraid of compromising himself. The news he had heard, however, caused Maurice to hasten on still more rapidly after crossing the Oiselle. Marianne, Marie, Jean Louisneau, he repeated. It is impossible! It is impossible! End of chapter 8 Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway The 29th of October, 2011Chapter 9 of Monsieur Le Coq, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Monsieur Le Coq by Emilie Gaboriau, Part 2, Chapter 9. The Reche, literally translated the Waste, where Marianne had promised to meet Maurice, owed its name to the rebellious and sterile character of the soil. Nature seemed to have laid her curse upon it. Nothing would grow there. The ground was covered with stones, and the sandy soil defied all attempts to enrich it. A few stunted oaks rose here and there above the thorns and broom plant. But on the lowlands of the Reche is a flourishing grove. The fees are straight and strong, for the floods of winter have deposited in some of the cleft of the rock sufficient soil to sustain them and the wild clematis and honeysuckle that cling to their branches. On reaching this grove, Maurice consulted his watch. It marked the hour of midday. He had supposed that he was late, but he was more than an hour in advance of the appointed time. He seated himself upon a high rock, from which he could survey the entire resh, and waited. The day was magnificent, the air intensely hot. The rays of the August sun fell with a scorching violence upon the sandy soil, and withered the few plants which had sprung up since the last rain. The stillness was profound, almost terrible. Not a sound broke the silence, not even the buzzing of an insect, nor a whisper of breeze in the trees. All nature seemed sleeping. And on no side 
was there anything to remind one of life, motion, or mankind. This repose of nature, which contrasted so vividly with the tumult raging in his own heart, exerted a beneficial effect upon Maurice. These few moments of solitude afforded him an opportunity to regain his composure, to collect his thoughts scattered by the storm of passion which had swept over his soul, as leaves are scattered by the fierce November gale. With sorrow comes experience, and that cruel knowledge of life which teaches one to guard oneself against one's hope. It was not until he heard the conversation of these peasants that Maurice fully realized the horror of Lacheneur's position. Suddenly precipitated from the social eminence which he had attained, he found in the valley of humiliations into which he was cast only hatred, distrust, and scorn. Both factions despised and denied him. Traitor! cried one. Thief! cried the other. He no longer held any social status. He was the fallen man, the man who had been, and who was no more. Was not the excessive misery of such a position a sufficient explanation of the strangest and wildest resolutions? This thought made Maurice tremble. Connecting the stories of the peasants with the words addressed to Jean Lionneau at Escorval by Monsieur Lachenor on the preceding evening, he arrived at the conclusion that this report of Marianne's approaching marriage to the young Fanner was not so improbable as he had first supposed. But why should Monsieur Lachenor give his daughter to an uncultured peasant? From mercenary motives? Certainly not since he had just refused an alliance of which he had been proud in his days of prosperity. Could it be in order to satisfy his wounded pride, then? Perhaps he did not wish it to be said that he owed anything to a son-in-law. Maurice was exhausting all his ingenuity and penetration in endeavouring to solve this mystery, when at last, on a footpath which crosses the waste, a woman appeared. Marianne. He rose, but fearing observation, did not venture to leave the shelter of the grove. Marianne must have felt a similar fear, for she hurried on, casting anxious glances on every side as she ran. Maurice remarked, not without surprise, that she was bareheaded, and that she had neither shawl nor scarf about her shoulders. As she reached the edge of the wood, he sprang towards her, and catching her hand, raised it to his lips which she had so often yielded to him, was now gently withdrawn, with so sad a gesture that he could not help feeling there was no hope. "'I came, Maurice,' she began, "'because I could not endure the thought of your anxiety. By doing so I have betrayed my father's confidence. He was obliged to leave home. I hastened here, and yet I promised him, only two hours ago, that I would never see you again. You hear me?' Never, she spoke hurriedly, but Maurice was appalled by the firmness of her accent. Had he been less agitated, he would have seen what a terrible effort this semblance of calmness cost a young girl. He would have understood it from her pallor, from the contraction of her lips, from the redness of the eyelids which she had vainly bathed with fresh water, and which betrayed the tears that had fallen during the night. If I have come, she continued, it is only to tell you that, for your own sake, as well as for mine, there must not remain in the secret recesses of our heart even the slightest shadow of a hope. All is over. We are separated for ever. Only weak natures revolt against the destiny which they cannot alter. Let us accept our fate uncomplainingly. I wish to see you once more, and to say this. Have courage, Maurice. Go away. Leave us, Corval. Forget me. "'Forget you, Marianne!' exclaimed the wretched young man. "'Forget you!' His eyes met hers, and in a husky voice he added, "'Will you then forget me?' "'I am a woman, Maurice.' But he interrupted her. "'Ah! I did not expect this,' he said despondently. "'Poor fool that I was! I believe that you would find a way to touch your father's heart.' She blushed slightly, hesitated, and said, I have thrown myself at my father's feet. 
he repulsed me. Maurice was thunderstruck, but recovered himself. It was because you did not know how to speak to him, he exclaimed in a passion of fury. But I shall know. I will present such arguments that he will be forced to yield. What right has he to ruin my happiness with his caprices? I love you. By right of this love you are mine. Mine rather than his. I will make him understand this. You shall see. Where is he? Where can I find him? Already he was starting to go. He knew not where. Marianne caught him by the arm. Remain, she commanded. Remain. So you have failed to understand me, Maurice. Ah, well, you must know the truth. I am acquainted now with the reason of my father's refusal, and though his decision should cost me my life, I approve it. Do not go to find my father. If, moved by your prayers, he gave his consent, I should have the courage to refuse mine. Maurice was so beside himself that this reply did not enlighten him. Crazed with anger and despair, and with no remorse for the insult he addressed to this woman whom he loved so deeply, he exclaimed, "'Is it for the Chan Louis then, that you are reserving your consent? He believes so, since he goes about everywhere saying that you will soon be his wife.' Marianne shuddered, as if a knife had entered her very heart, and yet— there was more sorrow than anger in the glance she cast upon Maurice. "'Must I stoop so low as to defend myself from such an imputation?' she asked sadly. "'Must I declare that if even I suspect such an arrangement between Jean Luino and my father, I have not been consulted? "'Must I tell you that there are some sacrifices which are beyond the strength of poor human nature? "'Understand this. I have found strength to renounce the man I love.' I shall never be able to accept another in his place. Maurice hung his head, abashed by her earnest words, dazzled by the sublime expression of her face. Reason returned. He realized the enormity of his suspicions, and was horrified with himself for having dared to give utterance to them. Oh, pardon! he faltered. Pardon! What did the mysterious causes of all these events, which had so rapidly succeeded each other, or Monsieur Lachinor's secret, or Marianne's reticence, matter to him now? He was seeking some chance of salvation. He believed that he had found it. "'We must fly!' he exclaimed. "'Fly at once, without pausing to look back. Before night we shall have passed the frontier.' He sprang towards her with outstretched arms, as if to seize her and bear her away, but she checked him by a single look. "'Fly!' said she reproachfully. "'Fly! And it is you, Maurice, who counsel me thus. What, while misfortune is crushing my poor father to the earth, shall I add despair and shame to his sorrows? His friends have deserted him. Shall I, his daughter, also abandon him? Ah! If I did that, I should be the vilest, the most cowardly of creatures. If my father, yesterday, when I believed him the owner of Sermuse, had demanded the sacrifice to which I consented last evening, I might, perhaps, have resolved upon the extreme measure you have counselled. In broad daylight I might have left Sermuse on the arm of my lover. It is not the world that I fear." but if one might consent to fly from the chateau of a rich and happy father, one cannot consent to desert the poor abode of a despairing and penniless parent. Leave me, Maurice, where honour holds me. It will not be difficult for me, who am the daughter of generations of peasants, to become a peasant. Go, I cannot endure more. Go, and remember that one cannot be utterly wretched if one's conscience is clean and one's duty fulfilled. Maurice was about to reply, when a crackling of dry branches made him turn his head. Scarcely ten paces off, Marshal de Sermuse was standing motionless, leaning upon his gun. End of chapter 9 Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway The 13th of November, 2011
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Monsieur Le Coq by Emily Gaboriau. Part 2. Chapter 10. The Duc de Sermus had slept little and poorly on the night following his return, or his restoration, as he styled it. Inaccessible, as he pretended to be, to the emotions which agitated the common herd, the scenes of the day had greatly excited him. He could not help reviewing them, although he made it the rule of his life never to reflect. While exposed to the scrutiny of the peasants and of his acquaintances at the Chateau de Cotonneau, he felt that his honour required him to appear cold and indifferent, but as soon as he had retired to the privacy of his chamber, he gave free vent to his excessive joy. For his joy was intense, almost virgin on delirium. Now he was forced to admit to himself the immense service Le Chenor had rendered him in restoring Sermus. This poor man, to whom he had displayed the blackest ingratitude, this man, honest to heroism, whom he had treated as an unfaithful servant, had just relieved him of an anxiety which had poisoned his life. La Chenure had just placed the Duc de Sermus beyond the reach of not probable but very possible calamity which he had dreaded for some time. If his secret anxiety had been made known, it would have created much merriment. Nonsense! people would have exclaimed. Every one knows that the Sermus possesses property to the amount of at least eight or ten millions in England. This was true. Only these millions, which he had accrued from the estate of the Duchess and of Lord Holland, had not been bequeathed to the Duke. He enjoyed absolute control of this enormous fortune. He disposed of the capital and the immense revenues to please himself, but it all belonged to his only son. The Duke possessed nothing, a pitiful income of twelve hundred francs, perhaps, but, strictly speaking, not even the means of subsistence. Marshall, certainly, had never said a word which would lead him to suspect that he had any intention of removing his property from his father's control. But he might possibly utter this word. Had he not good reason to believe that sooner or later this fatal word would be uttered? And even at the thought of such contingency he shuddered with horror. He saw himself reduced to a pension, a very handsome pension undoubtedly, but still a fixed, immutable, regular pension, by which he would be obliged to regulate his expenditures. He would be obliged to calculate that two ends might meet, he who had been accustomed to inexhaustible coffers. And this will necessarily happen sooner or later, he thought, if Marshall should marry, or if he should become ambitious, or meet with evil consulars. That will be the end of my reign. He watched and studied his son, as a jealous woman studies and watches the lover she mistrusts. He thought he read in his eyes many thoughts which were not there, and according as he saw him, gay or sad, careless or preoccupied, he was reassured or still more alarmed. Sometimes he imagined the worst. If I should quarrel with Marshall, he thought, he would take possession of his entire fortune, and I should be left without bread. These torturing apprehensions were, to a man who judged the sentiments of others by his own, a terrible chastisement. Ah, no one would have wished his existence at the price he paid for it, not even the poor wretches who envied his lot and apparent happiness as they saw him roll by in his magnificent carriage. There were days when he almost went mad. "'What am I?' he exclaimed, foaming with rage. "'A mere plaything in the hands of a child. My son owns me. If I displease him, he casts me aside. Yes, he can dismiss me as he would a lackey. If I enjoy his fortune, it is only because he is willing that I should do so. I own my very existence, as well as my luxuries, to his charity. 
but a moment of anger, even of caprice, may deprive me of everything. With such ideas in his brain, the duke could not love his son. He hated him. He passionately envied him all the advantages he possessed, his youth, his millions, his physical beauty, and his talents, which were really of a superior order. We meet every day mothers who are jealous of their daughters, and some fathers. This was one of those cases. The duke, however, showed no sign of mental disquietude, and if Marshall had possessed less penetration, he would have believed that his father adored him. But if he had detected the duke's secret, he did not allow him to discover it, nor did he abuse his power. Their manner toward each other was perfect. The duke was kind even to weakness, Marshall full of deference. But their relations were not those of father and son. One was in constant fear of displeasing the other. The other was a little too sure of his power. They lived on a footing of perfect equality, like two companions of the same age. From this trying situation, Lachenor had rescued the duke. The owner of Sermuse, an estate worth more than a million, the duke was free from his son's tyranny. He had recovered his liberty. What brilliant projects flitted through his brain that night! He beheld himself the richest landowner in that locality. He was the chosen friend of the king. Had he not a right to aspire to anything? Such prospect enchanted him. He felt twenty years younger, the twenty years that had been passed in exile. So, rising before nine o'clock, he went to awaken Marshal. On returning from dining with the Marquise de Courtenay the evening before, the Duke had gone through the chateau, but this hasty examination by candlelight had not satisfied his curiosity. He wished to see it in detail by daylight. Followed by his son, he explored one after another of the rooms of the princely abode, and, with every step, the recollections of his infancy crowded upon him. Lacheneur had respected everything. The duke found articles as old as himself, religiously preserved, occupying the old familiar places from which they had never been removed. When his inspection was concluded, "'Decidedly, Marquise,' he exclaimed, "'this Lacheneur was not such a rascal as I supposed. I am disposed to forgive him a great deal, on account of the care which he have taken of our house in our absence.' Marshal seemed engrossed in thought. "'I think, monsieur,' he said at last, "'that we should testify our gratitude to this man "'by paying him a large indemnity.' "'This word excited the duke's anger. "'An indemnity!' he exclaimed. "'Are you mad, Marquise? "'Think of the income that he has received from my estate. "'Have you forgotten the calculation made for us last evening "'by the Chevalier de la Livandière?' "'The Chevalier is a fool,' declared Marshal promptly. "'He forgot that Lacheneur has trebled the value of Sermuse. "'I think that our family honour requires us to bestow upon this man "'an indemnity of at least one hundred thousand francs. "'This would, moreover, be a good stroke of policy "'in the present state of public sentiment, "'and His Majesty would, I am sure, be much pleased.' "'Stroke of policy. Public sentiment.' His Majesty, one might have obtained almost anything from Monsieur de Sermuse by these arguments. "'Heavenly powers!' he exclaimed. "'A hundred thousand francs! How you talk! It is all very well for you, with your fortune. Still, if you really think so—' "'Ah, my dear sir, is not my fortune yours? Yes, such is really my opinion. So much so, indeed, that if you will allow me to do so, I will see Le Chignor myself.' and arrange the matter in such a way that his pride will not be wounded. He is a devotion which it would be very well to retain. The duke opened his eyes to their widest extent. La Chignor's pride, he murmured, devotion which it would be well to retain. Why do you sing in this strain? Whence comes this extraordinary interest? He paused, enlightened by a sudden recollection. 
"'I understand,' he exclaimed. "'I understand. He has a pretty daughter.' Marshall smiled without replying. "'Yes, pretty as a rose,' continued the Duke. "'But one hundred thousand francs. Sounds! That is a round sum to pay for such a whim. But, if you insist upon it—' Armed with this authorization, Marshall, two hours later, started on his mission. The first peasant he met told him the way to the cottage, which Monsieur Lacheneur now occupied. "'Follow the river,' said the man, "'and when you see a pine grove upon your left, cross it.' Marshall was crossing it when he heard the sound of voices. He approached, recognized Marianne and Maurice d'Escorval, and obeying an angry impulse, he paused. End of chapter 10 Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway, the 13th of November, 2011. Chapter 11 of Monsieur Le Coq, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Oliva. Monsieur Le Coq by Emile Gaborio, Part Two, Chapter Eleven. During the decisive moments of life, when one's entire future depends upon a word or a gesture, twenty contradictory inspirations can traverse the mind in the time occupied by a flash of lightning. On the sudden apparition of the young Marquis de Sermeuse, Maurice d'Escorval's first thought was this: How long has he been there? has he been playing the spy has he been listening to us what did he hear his first impulse was to spring upon his enemy to strike him in the face and compel him to engage in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle the thought of marianne checked him he reflected upon the possible even probable results of a quarrel born of such circumstances the combat which would ensue would cost this pure young girl her reputation martial would talk of it and country people are pitiless he saw this girl whom he looked so devotedly upon become the talk of the neighborhood saw the finger of scorn pointed at her and possessed sufficient self-control to master his anger all these reflections had occupied only half a second then politely touching his hat and stepping toward martial you are a stranger monsieur said he in a voice which was frightfully altered and you have doubtless lost your way his words were ill-chosen and defeated his prudent intentions a curt mind your own business would have been less wounding he forgot that this word stranger was the most deadly insult that one could cast in the face of the former emigre who had returned with the allied armies still the young marquis did not change his insolently nonchalant attitude he touched the visor of his hunting cap with his finger and replied it is true i have lost my way agitated as marianne was she could not fail to understand that her presence was all that restrained the hatred of these two young men their attitude the glance with which they measured each other did not leave the shadow of a doubt on that score if one was ready to spring upon the other the other was on the alert ready to defend himself the silence of nearly a moment which followed was as threatening as the profound calm which precedes the storm martial was the first to break it a peasant's directions are not generally remarkable for their clearness he said lightly and for more than an hour i have been seeking the house to which m lacheneur has retired ah i am sent to him by the duc de sermeuse my father knowing what he did maurice supposed that these strangely rapacious individuals had some new demand to make i thought said he that all relations between m lacheneur and m de sermeuse were broken off last evening at the house of the abbe 
this was said in the most provoking manner and yet martial never so much as frowned he had sworn that he would remain calm and he had strength enough to keep his word if these relations as god forbid have been broken off he replied believe me monsieur d'escorval it is no fault of ours then it is not as people say what people who the people here in the neighborhood ah and what do these people say the truth that you have been guilty of an offence which a man of honour could never forgive nor forget the young marquis shook his head gravely you are quick to condemn sir he said coldly permit me to hope that m lacheneur will be less severe than yourself and that his resentment just i confess will vanish before he hesitated before a truthful explanation such an expression from the lips of this haughty young aristocrat was it possible martial profited by the effect he had produced to advance toward marianne and addressing himself exclusively to her seemed after that to ignore the presence of maurice completely for there has been a mistake a misunderstanding mademoiselle he continued do not doubt it the sermeuse are not ingrates how could any one have supposed that we would intentionally give offence to a devoted friend of our family and that at a moment when he had rendered us a most signal service a true gentleman like my father and a hero of probity like yours cannot fail to esteem each other i admit that in the scene of yesterday m de sermeuse did not appear to advantage but the step he takes to-day proves his sincere regret certainly this was not the cavalier tone which he had employed in addressing marianne for the first time on the square in front of the church he had removed his hat he remained half inclined before her and he spoke in a tone of profound respect as though it were a haughty duchess and not the humble daughter of that rascal lacheneur whom he was addressing was it only a rouet's manoeuvre or had he also involuntarily submitted to the power of this beautiful girl it was both and it would have been difficult for him to say where the voluntary ended and where the involuntary began he continued my father is an old man who has suffered cruelly exile is hard to bear but if sorrows and deceptions have embittered his character they have not changed his heart his apparent imperiousness and arrogance conceal a kindness of heart which i have often seen degenerate into positive weakness and why should i not confess it the duc de sermeuse with his white hair still retains the illusions of a child he refuses to believe that the world has progressed during the past twenty years moreover people had deceived him by the most absurd fabrications to speak plainly even while we were in montaignac m lacheneur's enemies succeeded in prejudicing my father against him one would have sworn that he was speaking the truth so persuasive was his voice so entirely did the expression of his face his glance and his gestures accord with his words and maurice who felt who was certain that the young man was lying impudently lying was abashed by this scientific prevarication which is so universally practised in good society and of which he was entirely ignorant but what did the marquis desire here and why this farce need i tell you mademoiselle he resumed all that i suffered last evening in the little drawing-room in the presbytery no never in my whole life can i recollect such a cruel moment i understood and i did honour to m lacheneur's heroism hearing of our arrival he without hesitation without delay hastened to voluntarily surrender a princely fortune and he was insulted this excessive injustice horrified me and if i did not openly protest against it if i did not show my indignation it was only because contradiction drives my father to the verge of frenzy and what good would it have done for me to protest 
the filial love and piety which you displayed were far more powerful in their effect than any words of mine would have been you were scarcely out of the village before m de sairmeuse already ashamed of his injustice said to me i have been wrong but i am an old man it is hard for me to decide to make the first advance you marquis go and find m lacheneur and obtain his forgiveness marianne redder than a peony and terribly embarrassed lowered her eyes i thank you monsieur she faltered in the name of my father oh do not thank me interrupted martial earnestly it will be my duty on the contrary to render you thanks if you can induce m lacheneur to accept the reparation which is due him and he will accept it if you will only condescend to plead our cause who could resist your sweet voice your beautiful beseeching eyes however inexperienced maurice might be he could no longer fail to comprehend martial's intentions this man whom he mortally hated already dared to speak of love to marianne and before him maurice in other words the marquis not content with having ignored and insulted him presumed to take an insolent advantage of his supposed simplicity the certainty of this insult sent all his blood in a boiling torrent to his brain he seized martial by the arm and with irresistible power whirled him twice around then threw him more than ten feet exclaiming this last is too much marquis de sairmeuse maurice's attitude was so threatening that martial fully expected another attack the violence of the shock had thrown him down upon one knee without rising he lifted his gun ready to take aim it was not from anything like cowardice on the part of the marquis de sairmeuse that he decided to fire upon an unarmed foe but the affront which he had received was so deadly and so ignoble in his opinion that he would have shot maurice like a dog rather than feel the weight of his finger upon him again this expression of anger from maurice marianne had been expecting and hoping for every moment she was even more inexperienced than her lover but she was a woman and could not fail to understand the meaning of the young marquis he was evidently paying his court to her and with what intentions it was only too easy to divine her agitation while the marquis spoke in a more and more tender voice changed first to stupor then to indignation as she realized his marvellous audacity after that how could she help blessing the violence which put an end to a situation which was so insulting for her and so humiliating for maurice an ordinary woman would have thrown herself between the two men who were ready to kill each other marianne did not move a muscle was it not the duty of maurice to protect her when she was insulted who then if not he should defend her from the insolent gallantry of this libertine she would have blushed she who was energy personified to love a weak and pusillanimous man but any intervention was unnecessary maurice comprehended that this was one of those affronts which the person insulted must not seem to suspect under penalty of giving the offending party the advantage he felt that marianne must not be regarded as the cause of the quarrel his instant recognition of the situation proved a powerful reaction in his mind and he recovered as if by magic his coolness and the free exercise of his faculties yes he resumed defiantly this is hypocrisy enough to dare to prate of reparation after the insults that you and yours have inflicted is adding intentional humiliation to insult i will not permit it martial had thrown aside his gun he now rose and brushed the knee of his pantaloons to which a few particles of dust had adhered with a phlegm whose secret he had learned in england he was too discerning not to perceive that maurice had disguised the true cause of his outburst of passion but what did it matter to him had he avowed it the marquis would not have been displeased yet it was necessary to make some response 
and to preserve the superiority which he imagined he had maintained up to that time you will never know monsieur he said glancing alternately at his gun and at marianne all that you owe to mademoiselle lacheneur we shall meet again i hope you have made that remark before maurice interrupted tauntingly nothing is easier than to find me the first peasant you meet will point out the house of baron d'escorval eh bien sir i cannot promise that you will not see two of my friends oh whenever it may please you certainly but it would gratify me to know by what right you make yourself the judge of monsieur lacheneur's honor and take it upon yourself to defend what has not been attacked who has given you this right from martial's sneering tone maurice was certain that he had overheard at least a part of his conversation with marianne my right he replied is that of friendship if i tell you that your advances are unwelcome it is because i know that m lacheneur will accept nothing from you no nothing under whatever guise you may offer these alms which you tender merely to appease your own conscience he will never forgive the affront which is his honor and your shame ah you thought to degrade him messieurs de sairmeuse and you have lifted him far above your more grandeur he receive anything from you go learn that your millions will never give you a pleasure equal to the ineffable joy he will feel when seeing you roll by in your carriage he says to himself those people owe everything to me his burning words vibrated with such intensity of feeling that marianne could not resist the impulse to press his hand and this gesture was his revenge upon martial who turned pale with passion but i have still another right continued maurice my father yesterday had the honor of asking m lacheneur the hand of his daughter and i refused it cried a terrible voice marianne and both young men turned with the same movement of alarm and surprise m lacheneur stood before them and by his side was chanlouineau who surveyed the group with threatening eyes yes i refused it resumed m lacheneur and i do not believe that my daughter will marry any one without my consent what did you promise me this morning marianne can it be you you who grant a rendezvous to gallants in the forest return to the house instantly but father return he repeated with an oath return i command you she obeyed and departed not without giving maurice a look in which he read a farewell that she believed would be eternal as soon as she had gone perhaps twenty paces m lacheneur with folded arms confronted maurice as for you monsieur d'escorval said he rudely i hope that you will no longer undertake to prowl around my daughter i swear to you monsieur oh no oaths if you please it is an evil action to endeavor to turn a young girl from her duty which is obedience you have broken for ever all relations between your family and mine the poor youth tried to excuse himself but m lacheneur interrupted him enough enough said he go back to your home and as maurice hesitated he seized him by the collar and dragged him to the little footpath leading through the grove it was the work of scarcely ten seconds and yet he found time to whisper in the young man's ear in his formerly friendly tones go you little wretch do you wish to render all my precautions useless he watched maurice as he disappeared bewildered by the scene he had just witnessed and stupefied by what he had just heard and it was not until he saw that young d'escorval was out of hearing that he turned to martial as i have had the honor of meeting you monsieur le marquis said he i deem it my duty to inform you that chupin and his sons are searching for you everywhere it is at the insistence of the duke your father who is anxious for you to repair at once to the chateau de courtomieu he turned to chanlouineau and added we will now proceed on our way but martial detained him with a gesture i am much surprised to hear that they are seeking me said he my father knows very well where he sent me 
i was going to your house monsieur and at his request to my house to your house yes monsieur to express our sincere regret at the scene which took place at the presbytery last evening and without waiting for any response martial with wonderful cleverness and felicity of expression began to repeat to the father the story which he had just related to the daughter according to his version his father and himself were in despair how could m lacheneur suppose them guilty of such black ingratitude why had he retired so precipitately the duc de sairmeuse held at m lacheneur's disposal any amount which it might please him to mention sixty a hundred thousand francs even more but m lacheneur did not appear to be dazzled in the least and when martial had concluded he replied respectfully but coldly that he would consider the matter this coldness amazed chanlouineau he did not conceal the fact when the marquis after many earnest protestations at last wended his way homeward we have misjudged these people he declared but m lacheneur shrugged his shoulders and so you are foolish enough to suppose that it was to me that he offered all that money zounds i have ears ah well my poor boy you must not believe all they hear if you have the truth is that these large sums were intended to win the favor of my daughter she has pleased this coxcomb of a marquis and he wishes to make her his mistress chanlouineau stopped short with eyes flashing and hands clenched good god he exclaimed prove that and i am yours body and soul to do anything you desire end of chapter eleven recording by tony oliva chapter twelve of monsieur lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur lecoq by emile gaborio part two chapter twelve no never in my whole life have i met a woman who can compare with this marianne what grace and what dignity ah her beauty is divine so martial was thinking while returning to sermeuse after his proposals to m lacheneur at the risk of losing his way he took the shortest course which led across the fields and over ditches which he leaped with the aid of his gun he found a pleasure entirely novel and very delightful in picturing marianne as he had just seen her blushing and paling about to swoon then lifting her head haughtily in her pride and disdain who would have suspected that such indomitable energy and such an impassioned soul was hidden beneath such girlish artlessness and apparent coldness what an adorable expression illumined her face what passion shone in those great black eyes when she looked at that little fool d'escorval what would not one give to be regarded thus even for a moment how could the boy help being crazy about her he himself loved her without being as yet willing to confess it what other name could be given to this passion which had overpowered reason and to the furious desires which agitated him ah he exclaimed she shall be mine yes she shall be mine i will have her consequently he began to study the strategic side of the undertaking which this resolution involved with the sagacity of one who had not been without an extended experience in such matters his debut he was forced to admit had been neither fortunate nor adroit conveyed compliments and money had both been rejected if marianne had heard his covert insinuations with evident horror m lacheneur had received with even more than coldness his advances and his offers of actual wealth moreover he remembered chanlouineau's terrible eyes how he measured me that magnificent rustic he growled at a sign from marianne he would have crushed me like an eggshell without a thought of my ancestors 
ah does he also love her there will be three rivals in that case but the more difficult and even perilous the undertaking seemed the more his passions were inflamed my failures can be repaired he thought occasions of meeting shall not be wanting will it not be necessary to hold frequent interviews with m lacheneur in effecting a formal transfer of sermeuse i will win him over to my side with the daughter my course is plain profiting by my unfortunate experience i will in the future be as timid as i have been bold and she will be hard to please if she is not flattered by this triumph of her beauty d'escorval remains to be disposed of but this was the point upon which martial was most exercised he had it is true seen this rival rudely dismissed by m lacheneur and yet the anger of the latter had seemed to him too great to be absolutely real he suspected a comedy but for whose benefit for his or for chanlouineau's and yet what could possibly be the motive and yet he reflected my hands are tied and i cannot call this little d'escorval to account for his insolence to swallow such an affront in silence is hard still he is brave there is no denying that perhaps i can find some other way to provoke his anger but even then what could i do if i harmed a hair on his head marianne would never forgive me ah i would give a handsome sum in exchange for some little device to send him out of the country revolving in his mind these plans whose frightful consequences he could neither calculate nor foresee martial was walking up the avenue leading to the chateau when he heard hurried footsteps behind him he turned and seeing two men running after him and motioning to him to stop he paused it was chupin accompanied by one of his sons this old rascal had been enrolled among the servants charged with preparing sermeuse for the reception of the duke and he had already discovered the secret of making himself useful to his master which was by seeming to be indispensable ah oh, monsieur he cried we've been searching for you everywhere my son and i it was monsieur le duc very well said martial dryly i am returning but chupin was not sensitive and although he had not been very favorably received he ventured to follow the marquis at a little distance but sufficiently near to make himself heard he also had his schemes for it was not long before he began a long recital of the calumnies which had been spread about the neighborhood in regard to the lacheneur affair why did he choose this subject in preference to any other did he suspect the young marquis's passion for marianne according to this report lacheneur he no longer said monsieur was unquestionably a rascal the complete surrender of sermeuse was only a farce as he must possess thousands and hundreds of thousands of francs since he was about to marry his daughter if the scoundrel had felt only suspicions they were changed into certainty by the eagerness with which martial demanded how is mademoiselle lacheneur to be married yes monsieur and to whom to chanlouineau the fellow whom the peasants wished to kill yesterday upon the square because he was disrespectful to the duke he is an avaricious man and if marianne does not bring him a good round sum as a dowry he will never marry her no matter how beautiful she may be are you sure of what you say it is true my eldest son heard from chanlouineau and from lacheneur that the wedding would take place within a month and turning to his son is it not true boy yes promptly replied the youth who had heard nothing of the kind martial was silent ashamed perhaps of allowing himself to listen to the gossip but glad to have been informed of such an important circumstance if chupin was not telling a falsehood and what reason could he have for doing so it became evident that m lacheneur's conduct concealed some great mystery why without some potent motive should he have refused to give his daughter to maurice d'escorval whom she loved to bestow her upon a peasant as he reached sermeuse he was swearing that he would discover this motive a strange scene awaited him in the broad open space 
extending from the front of the chateau to the parterre lay a huge pile of all kinds of clothing linen plate and furniture one might have supposed that the occupants of the chateau were moving a half dozen men were running to and fro and standing in the centre of the rubbish was the duc de sairmeuse giving orders martial did not understand the whole meaning of the scene at first he went to his father and after saluting him respectfully inquired what is all this m de sairmeuse laughed heartily what can you not guess he replied it is very simple however when the lawful master on his return sleeps beneath the bed coverings of the usurper it is delightful the first night not so pleasant the second everything here reminds me too forcibly of monsieur lacheneur it seems to me that i am in his house and the thought is unendurable so i have had them collect everything belonging to him and to his daughter everything in fact which did not belong to the chateau in former years the servants will put it all into a cart and carry it to him the young marquis gave fervent thanks to heaven that he had arrived before it was too late had his father's project been executed he would have been obliged to bid farewell to all his hopes you surely will not do this monsieur le duc said he earnestly and why pray who will prevent me from doing it no one most assuredly but you will decide on reflection that a man who has not conducted himself too badly has a right to some consideration the duke seemed greatly astonished consideration he exclaimed this rascal has a right to some consideration well this is one of the poorest of jokes what i give him that is to say you give him a hundred thousand francs and that will not content him he is entitled to consideration you who are after the daughter may give it to him if you like but i shall do as i like very well but monsieur i would think twice if i were in your place lacheneur has surrendered sermeuse that is all very well but how can you authenticate your claim to the property what would you do if in case you imprudently irritated him he should change his mind what would become of your right to the estate m sermeuse actually turned green zounds he exclaimed i had not thought of that here you fellows take all these things back again and that quickly and as they were obeying his order now he remarked let us hasten to coutomieu they have already sent for us twice it must be business of the utmost importance which demands our attention end of chapter twelve recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter thirteen of monsieur le coq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur le coq by emile gaborio part two chapter thirteen the chateau de courtomieu is next to sermeuse the most magnificent habitation in the arrondissement of montaignac the approach to the castle was by a long and narrow road badly paved when the carriage containing martial and his father turned from the public highway into this rough road the jolting aroused the duke from the profound reverie into which he had fallen on leaving sermeuse the marquis thought that he had caused this unusual fit of abstraction it is the result of my adroit manoeuvre he said to himself not without secret satisfaction until the restitution of sermeuse is legalized i can make my father do anything i wish yes anything and if it is necessary he will even invite lacheneur and marianne to his table he was mistaken the duke had already forgotten the affair his most vivid impressions lasted no longer than an indentation in the sand he lowered the glass in front of the carriage and after ordering the coachman to drive more slowly now he said to his son let us talk a little are you really in love with that little lacheneur martial could not repress a start oh in love he said lightly that would perhaps be saying too much let me say that she has taken my fancy 
that will be sufficient the duke regarded his son with a bantering air really you delight me he exclaimed i feared that this love affair might derange at least for the moment certain plans that i have formed for i have formed certain plans for you the devil yes i have my plans and i will communicate them to you later in detail i will content myself to-day by recommending you to examine mademoiselle blanche de courtomieu martial made no reply this recommendation was entirely unnecessary if mademoiselle lacheneur had made him forget mademoiselle de courtomieu that morning for some moments the remembrance of marianne was now effaced by the radiant image of blanche before discussing the daughter resumed the duke let us speak of the father he is one of my strongest friends and i know him thoroughly you have heard men reproach me for what they style my prejudices have you not well in comparison with the marquis de courtomieu i am only a jacobin oh my father really nothing could be more true if i am behind the age in which i live he belongs to the reign of louis fourteenth only for there is an only the principles which i openly avow he keeps locked up in his snuff-box and trust him for not forgetting to open it at the opportune moment he has suffered cruelly for his opinions in the sense of having so often been obliged to conceal them he concealed them first under the consulate when he returned from exile he dissimulated them even more courageously under the empire for he played the part of a kind of chamberlain to bonaparte this dear marquis but chut do not remind him of that proof of heroism he has deplored it bitterly since the battle of Lutzon. this was the tone in which m de sairmeuse was accustomed to speak of his best friends the history of his fortune he continued is the history of his marriages i say marriages because he has married a number of times and always advantageously yes in a period of fifteen years he has had the misfortune of losing three wives each richer than the other his daughter is the child of his third and last wife a cis blossac she died in eighteen o nine he comforted himself after each bereavement by purchasing a quantity of lands or bonds so that now he is as rich as you are marquis and his influence is powerful and widespread i forgot one detail however he believes they tell me in the growing power of the clergy and has become very devout he checked himself the carriage had stopped before the entrance of the chateau de courtomieu and the marquis came forward to receive his guests in person a nattering distinction which he seldom lavished upon his visitors the marquis was long rather than tall and very solemn in deportment the head that surmounted his angular form was remarkably small a characteristic of his race and covered with thin glossy black hair and lighted by cold round black eyes the pride that becomes a gentleman and the humility that befits a christian were continually at war with each other in his countenance he pressed the hands of m de sairmeuse and martial overwhelming them with compliments uttered in a thin rather nasal voice which issuing from his immense body was as astonishing as the sound of a flute issuing from the pipes of an orphiclide would be at last you have come he said we were waiting for you before beginning our deliberations upon a very grave and also very delicate matter we are thinking of addressing a petition to his majesty the nobility who have suffered so much during the revolution have a right to expect ample compensation our neighbors to the number of sixteen are now assembled in my cabinet transformed for the time into a council chamber martial shuddered at the thought of all the ridiculous and tiresome conversation he would probably be obliged to hear and his father's recommendation occurred to him shall we not have the honor of paying our respects to mademoiselle de courtomieu my daughter must be in the drawing-room with our cousin replied the marquis in an indifferent tone at least if she is not in the garden 
this might be construed into go and look for her if you choose at least martial understood it that way and when they entered the hall he allowed his father and the marquis to go upstairs without him a servant opened the door of the drawing-room for him but it was empty very well said he i know my way to the garden but he explored it in vain no one was to be found he decided to return to the house and march bravely into the presence of the dreaded enemy he had turned to retrace his steps when through the foliage of a bower of jasmine he thought he could distinguish a white dress he advanced softly and his heart quickened its throbbing when he saw that he was right mademoiselle blanche de courtomieu was seated on a bench beside an old lady and was engaged in reading a letter in a low voice she must have been greatly preoccupied since she had not heard martial's footsteps approaching he was only ten paces from her so near that he could distinguish the shadow of her long eyelashes he paused holding his breath in a delicious ecstasy ah how beautiful she is he thought beautiful no but pretty yes as pretty as heart could desire with her great velvety blue eyes and her pouting lips she was a blonde but one of those dazzling and radiant blondes found only in the countries of the sun and from her hair drawn high upon the top of her head escaped a profusion of ravishing glittering ringlets which seemed almost to sparkle in the play of the light breeze one might perhaps have wished her a trifle larger but she had the winning charm of all delicate and mignon women and her figure was of exquisite roundness and her dimpled hands were those of an infant alas these attractive exteriors are often deceitful as much and even more so than the appearances of a man like the marquis de courtomieu the apparently innocent and artless young girl possessed the parched hollow soul of an experienced woman of the world or of an old courtier she had been so petted at the convent in the capacity of only daughter of a grand seigneur and millionaire she had been surrounded by so much adulation that all her good qualities had been blighted in the bud by the poisonous breath of flattery she was only nineteen and still it was impossible for any person to have been more susceptible to the charms of wealth and of satisfied ambition she dreamed of a position at court as a schoolgirl dreams of a lover if she had deigned to notice martial for she had remarked him it was only because her father had told her that this young man would lift his wife to the highest sphere of power thereupon she had uttered a very well we will see that would have changed an enamoured suitor's love into disgust martial advanced a few steps and mademoiselle blanche on seeing him sprang up with a pretty affectation of intense timidity bowing low before her he said gently and with profound deference monsieur de courtomieu mademoiselle was so kind as to tell me where i might have the honour of finding you i had not courage to brave those formidable discussions inside but he pointed to the letter the young girl held in her hand and added but i fear that i am de trop oh not in the least monsieur le marquis although this letter which i have been reading has i confess interested me deeply it was written by a poor child in whom i have taken a great interest whom i have sent for sometimes when i was lonely marianne lacheneur accustomed from his infancy to the hypocrisy of drawing-rooms the young marquis had taught his face not to betray his feelings he could have laughed gaily with anguish at his heart he could have preserved the sternest gravity when inwardly convulsed with merriment and yet this name of marianne upon the lips of mademoiselle de courtomieu caused his glance to waver they know each other he thought in an instant he was himself again but mademoiselle blanche had perceived his momentary agitation what can it mean she wondered much disturbed still it was with the perfect assumption of innocence that she continued in fact you must have seen her this poor marianne monsieur le marquis since her father was the guardian of sermeuse yes i have seen her mademoiselle replied martial quietly is she not remarkably beautiful her beauty is of an unusual type 
it quite takes one by surprise a fool would have protested the marquis was not guilty of this folly yes she is very beautiful said he this apparent frankness disconcerted mademoiselle blanche a trifle and it was with an air of hypocritical compassion that she murmured poor girl what will become of her here is her father reduced to delving in the ground oh you exaggerate mademoiselle my father will always preserve lacheneur from anything of that kind of course i might have known that but where will he find a husband for marianne one has been found already i understand that she is to marry a youth in the neighborhood who has some property a certain chanlouineau the artless schoolgirl was more cunning than the marquis she had satisfied herself that she had just grounds for her suspicions and she experienced a certain anger on finding him so well informed in regard to everything that concerned mademoiselle lacheneur and do you believe that this is the husband of whom she had dreamed ah well god grant that she may be happy for we were very fond of her very were we not aunt medea aunt medea was the old lady seated beside mademoiselle blanche yes very she replied this aunt or cousin rather was a poor relation whom m de courtornieu had sheltered and who was forced to pay dearly for her bread since mademoiselle blanche compelled her to play the part of echo it grieves me to see these friendly relations which were so dear to me broken resumed mademoiselle de courtornieu but listen to what marianne has written she drew from her belt where she had placed it mademoiselle lacheneur's letter and read my dear blanche you know that the duc de sairmeuse has returned the news fell upon us like a thunderbolt my father and i had become too much accustomed to regard as our own the deposit which had been entrusted to our fidelity we have been punished for it at least we have done our duty and now all is ended she whom you have called your friend will be hereafter only a poor peasant girl as her mother was before her the most subtle observer would have supposed that mademoiselle blanche was experiencing the keenest emotion one would have sworn that it was only by intense effort that she succeeded in restraining her tears that they were even trembling behind her long lashes the truth was that she was thinking only of discovering upon martial's face some indication of his feelings but now that he was on guard his features might have been marble for any sign of emotion they betrayed so she continued i should utter an untruth if i said that i have not suffered on account of this sudden change but i have courage i shall learn how to submit i shall i hope have strength to forget for i must forget the remembrances of past felicity would render my present misery intolerable mademoiselle de courtornieu suddenly folded up the letter you have heard it monsieur said she can you understand such pride as that and they accuse us daughters of the nobility of being proud martial made no response he felt that his altered voice would betray him how much more would he have been moved if he had been allowed to read the concluding lines one must live my dear blanche added marianne and i feel no false shame in asking you to aid me i sew very nicely as you know and i could earn my livelihood by embroidery if i knew more people i will call to-day at courtornieu to ask you to give me a list of ladies to whom i can present myself on your recommendation but mademoiselle de courtornieu had taken good care not to allude to the touching request she had read the letter to martial as a test she had not succeeded so much the worse she rose and accepted his arm to return to the house she seemed to have forgotten her friend and she was chatting gaily when they approached the chateau she was interrupted by a sound of voices raised to the highest pitch it was the address to the king which was agitating the council convened in m de courtornieu's cabinet mademoiselle blanche paused i am trespassing upon your kindness monsieur i am boring you with my silly chat when you should undoubtedly be up there certainly not he replied laughing what should i do there the role of men of action does not begin until the orators have concluded 
he spoke so energetically in spite of his jesting tone that mademoiselle de courtornieu was fascinated she saw before her she believed a man who as her father had said would rise to the highest position in the political world unfortunately her admiration was disturbed by a ring of the great bell that always announces visitors she trembled let go her hold on martial's arm and said very earnestly ah uh, no matter i wish very much to know what is going on up there if i ask my father he will laugh at my curiosity while you monsieur if you are present at the conference you will tell me all a wish thus expressed was a command the marquis bowed and obeyed she dismisses me he said to himself as he ascended the staircase nothing could be more evident and that without much ceremony why the devil does she wish to get rid of me why because a single peal of the bell announced a visitor for mademoiselle blanche because she was expecting a visit from her friend and because she wished at any cost to prevent a meeting between martial and marianne she did not love him and yet an agony of jealousy was torturing her such was her nature her presentiments were realized it was indeed mademoiselle lacheneur who was awaiting her in the drawing-room the poor girl was paler than usual but nothing in her manner betrayed the frightful anguish she had suffered during the past two or three days and her voice in asking from her former friend a list of customers was as calm and as natural as in other days when she was asking her to come and spend an afternoon at sairmeuse so when the two girls embraced each other their roles were reversed it was marianne who had been crushed by misfortune it was mademoiselle blanche who wept but while writing a list of the names of persons in the neighborhood with whom she was acquainted mademoiselle de courtornieu did not neglect this favorable opportunity for verifying the suspicions which had been aroused by martial's momentary agitation it is inconceivable she remarked to her friend that the duc de sairmeuse should allow you to be reduced to such an extremity marianne's nature was so royal that she did not wish an unjust accusation to rest even upon the man who had treated her father so cruelly the duke is not to blame she replied gently he offered us a very considerable sum this morning through his son mademoiselle blanche started as if a viper had stung her so you have seen the marquis marianne yes uh, has he been to your house he was going there when he met me in the grove on the waste she blushed as she spoke she turned crimson at the thought of martial's impertinent gallantry this girl who had just emerged from a convent was terribly experienced but she misunderstood the cause of marianne's confusion she could dissimulate however and when marianne went away mademoiselle blanche embraced her with every sign of the most ardent affection but she was almost suffocated with rage what she thought they have met but once and yet they are so strongly impressed with each other do they love each other already End of chapter thirteen recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter fourteen of monsieur lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur lecoq by emile gaborio part two chapter fourteen if martial had faithfully reported to mademoiselle blanche all that he heard in the marquis de courtornieu's cabinet he would probably have astonished her a little he himself if he had sincerely confessed his impressions and his reflections would have been obliged to admit that he was greatly amazed but this unfortunate man who in days to come would be compelled to reproach himself bitterly for the excess of his fanaticism refused to confess this truth even to himself his life was to be spent in defending prejudices which his own reason condemned forced by mademoiselle blanche's will into the midst of a discussion he was really disgusted with the ridiculous and intense greediness 
of m de courtomieu's noble guests decorations fortune honors power they desired everything they were satisfied that their pure devotion deserved the most munificent rewards it was only the most modest who declared that he would be content with the epaulets of a lieutenant-general many were the recriminations stinging words and bitter reproaches the marquis de courtomieu who acted as president of the council was nearly exhausted with exclaiming be calm gentlemen be calm a little moderation if you please all these men are mad thought martial with difficulty restraining an intense desire to laugh they are insane enough to be placed in a madhouse but he was not obliged to render a report of the seance the deliberations were soon fortunately interrupted by a summons to dinner mademoiselle blanche when the young marquis rejoined her quite forgot to question him about the doings of the council in fact what did the hopes and plans of these people matter to her she cared very little about them or about the people themselves since they were below her father in rank and most of them were not as rich an absorbing thought a thought of her future and of her happiness filled her mind to the exclusion of all other subjects the few moments that she had passed alone after marianne's departure she had spent in grave reflection martial's mind and person pleased her in him were combined all the qualifications which any ambitious woman would desire in a husband and she decided that he should be her husband probably she would not have arrived at this conclusion so quickly had it not been for the feeling of jealousy aroused in her heart but from the very moment that she could believe or suspect that another woman was likely to dispute the possession of martial with her she desired him from that moment she was completely controlled by one of those strange passions in which the heart has no part but which take entire possession of the brain and lead to the worst of follies let the woman whose pulse has never quickened its beating under the influence of this counterfeit of love cast the first stone that she could be vanquished in this struggle for supremacy that there could be any doubt of the result were thoughts which never once entered the mind of mademoiselle blanche she had been told so often it had been repeated again and again that the man whom she would choose must esteem himself fortunate above all others she had seen her father besieged by so many suitors for her hand besides she thought smiling proudly as she surveyed her reflection in the large mirrors am i not as pretty as marianne far prettier murmured the voice of vanity and you possess what your rival does not birth wit the genius of coquetry she did indeed possess sufficient cleverness and patience to assume and to sustain the character which seemed most likely to dazzle and to fascinate martial as to maintaining this character after marriage if it did not please her to do so that was another matter the result of all this was that during dinner mademoiselle blanche exercised all her powers of fascination upon the young marquis she was so evidently desirous of pleasing him that several of the guests remarked it some were even shocked by such a breach of conventionality but blanche de courtomieu could do as she chose she was well aware of that was she not the richest heiress for miles and miles around no slander can tarnish the brilliancy of a fortune of more than a million in hard cash do you know that those two young people will have a joint income of between seven and eight hundred thousand francs said one old viscount to his neighbor martial yielded unresistingly to the charm of his position how could he suspect unworthy motives in a young girl whose eyes were so pure whose laugh rang out with the crystalline clearness of childhood involuntarily he compared her with the grave and thoughtful marianne and his imagination floated from one to the other inflamed by the strangeness of the contrast he occupied a seat beside mademoiselle blanche at table and they chatted gaily amusing themselves at the expense of the other guests who were again conversing upon political matters 
and whose enthusiasm waxed warmer and warmer as course succeeded course champagne was served with the dessert and the company drank to the allies whose victorious bayonets had forced a passage for the king to return to paris they drank to the english to the prussians and to the russians whose horses were trampling the crops underfoot the name of d'escorval heard above the clink of the glasses suddenly aroused martial from his dream of enchantment an old gentleman had just risen and proposed that active measures should be taken to rid the neighbourhood of the baron d'escorval the presence of such a man dishonours our country said he he is a frantic jacobin and admitted to be dangerous since m fouche has him upon his list of suspected persons and he is even now under the surveillance of the police this discourse could not have failed to arouse intense anxiety in m d'escorval's breast had he seen the ferocity expressed in almost every face still no one spoke hesitation could be read in every eye martial too had turned so white that mademoiselle blanche remarked his pallor and thought he was ill in fact a terrible struggle was going on in the soul of the young marquis a conflict between his honour and passion had he not longed only a few hours before to find some way of driving maurice from the country ah well the opportunity he so ardently desired now presented itself it was impossible to imagine a better one if the proposed step was taken the baron d'escorval and his family would be forced to leave france for ever the company hesitated martial saw it and felt that a single word from him for or against would decide the matter after a few minutes of frightful uncertainty honour triumphed he rose and declared that the proposed measure was bad impolitic monsieur d'escorval he remarked is one of those men who diffuse around them a perfume of honesty and justice have the good sense to respect the consideration which is justly his as he had foreseen his words decided the matter the cold and haughty manner which he knew so well how to assume his few but incisive words produced a great effect it would evidently be a great mistake was the general cry martial reseated himself mademoiselle blanche leaned toward him you have done well she murmured you know how to defend your friends m d'escorval is not my friend replied martial in a voice which revealed the struggle through which he had passed the injustice of the proposed measure incensed me that is all mademoiselle de courtomieu was not to be deceived by an explanation like this still she added then your conduct is all the more grand monsieur but such was not the opinion of the duc de sairmeuse on returning to the chateau some hours later he reproached his son for his intervention why the devil did you meddle with the matter inquired the duke i would not have liked to take upon myself the odium of the proposition but since it had been made i was anxious to prevent such an act of useless folly useless folly zounds marquis you carry matters with a high hand do you think that this damned baron adores you what would you say if you heard that he was conspiring against us i should answer with a shrug of the shoulders you would very well do me the favour to question chupin End of chapter 14. Recording by Tony Oliva, Albuquerque. Chapter 15 of Monsieur Le Coq, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Oliva. Monsieur Le Coq, by emile gaboriau part two chapter fifteen it was only two weeks since the duc de sairmeuse had returned to france he had not yet had time to shake the dust of exile from his feet and already his imagination saw enemies on every side he had been at sairmeuse only two days and yet he unhesitatingly accepted the venomous reports which chupin poured into his ears the suspicions which he was endeavouring to make martial share were cruelly unjust 
at the moment when the duke accused the baron of conspiring against the house of sairmeuse that unfortunate man was weeping at the bedside of his son who was he believed at the point of death maurice was indeed dangerously ill his excessively nervous organization had succumbed before the rude assaults of destiny when in obedience to m lacheneur's imperative order he left the grove on the reche he lost the power of reflecting calmly and deliberately upon the situation marie anne's incomprehensible obstinacy the insults he had received from the marquis and lacheneur's feigned anger were mingled in inextricable confusion forming one immense intolerable misfortune too crushing for his powers of resistance the peasants who met him on his homeward way were struck by his singular demeanor and felt convinced that some great catastrophe had just befallen the house of the baron d'escorval some bowed others spoke to him but he did not see or hear them force of habit that physical memory which mounts guard when the mind is far away brought him back to his home his features were so distorted with suffering that madame d'escorval on seeing him was seized with a most sinister presentiment and dared not address him he spoke first all is over he said hoarsely but do not be worried mother i have some courage as you shall see he did in fact seat himself at the table with a resolute air he ate even more than usual and his father noticed without alluding to it that he drank more wine than usual he was very pale his eyes glittered his gestures were excited and his voice was husky he talked a great deal and even jested why will he not weep thought madame d'escorval then i should not be so much alarmed and i could try to comfort him this was maurice's last effort when dinner was over he went to his room and when his mother who had gone again and again to listen at his door finally decided to enter his chamber she found him lying upon the bed muttering incoherently she approached him he did not appear to recognize or even to see her she spoke to him he did not seem to hear his face was scarlet his lips were parched she took his hand it was burning and still he was shivering and his teeth were chattering as if with cold a mist swam before the eyes of the poor woman she feared she was about to faint but summoning all her strength she conquered her weakness and dragging herself to the staircase she cried help help my son is dying with a bound m d'escorval reached his son's chamber looked at him and dashed out again summoned a servant and ordered him to gallop to montaignac and bring a physician without a moment's delay there was indeed a doctor at sermeuse but he was the most stupid of men a former surgeon in the army who had been dismissed for incompetency the peasants shunned him as they would the plague and in case of sickness always sent for the cure m d'escorval followed their example knowing that the physician from montaignac could not arrive until nearly morning abbe midon had never frequented the medical schools but since he had been a priest the poor so often asked advice of him that he applied himself to the study of medicine and aided by experience he had acquired a knowledge of the art which would have won him a diploma from the faculty anywhere at whatever hour of the day or night parishioners came to ask his assistance he was always ready his only answer let us go at once and when the people of the neighborhood met him on the road with his little box of medicine slung over his shoulder they took off their hats respectfully and stood aside to let him pass those who did not respect the priest honored the man for m d'escorval above all others abbe midon would make haste the baron was his friend and a terrible apprehension seized him when he saw madame d'escorval at the gate watching for him by the way in which she rushed to meet him he thought she was about to announce some irreparable misfortune but no she took his hand and without uttering a word she led him to her son's chamber the condition of the poor youth was really very critical the abbe perceived this at a glance but it was not hopeless 
we will get him out of this he said with a smile that reawakened hope and with the coolness of an old practitioner he bled him freely and ordered applications of ice to his head in a moment all the household were busied in fulfilling the cure's orders he took advantage of the opportunity to draw the baron aside in the embrasure of a window what has happened he asked a disappointment in love m d'escorval replied with a despairing gesture m lacheneur has refused the hand of his daughter which i asked in behalf of my son maurice was to have seen marianne to-day what passed between them i do not know the result you see the baroness re-entered the room and the two men said no more a truly funereal silence pervaded the apartment broken only by the moans of maurice his excitement instead of abating had increased in violence delirium peopled his brain with phantoms and the name of marianne martial de sermeuse and chanlouineau dropped so incoherently from his lips that it was impossible to read his thoughts how long that night seemed to m d'escorval and his wife those only know who have counted each second beside the sick-bed of some loved one certainly their confidence in the companion in their vigil was great but he was not a regular physician like the other the one whose coming they awaited just as the light of the morning made the candles turn pale they heard the furious gallop of a horse and soon the doctor from montaignac entered he examined maurice carefully and after a short conference with the priest i see no immediate danger he declared all that can be done has been done the malady must be allowed to take its course i will return he did return the next day and many days after for it was not until a week had passed that maurice was declared out of danger then he confided to his father all that had taken place in the grove on the reche the slightest detail of the scene had engraved itself indelibly upon his memory when the recital was ended are you quite sure asked his father that you correctly understood marianne's reply did she tell you that if her father gave his consent to your marriage she would refuse hers those were her very words and still she loves you i am sure of it you were not mistaken in m lacheneur's tone when he said to you go you little wretch do you wish to render all my precautions useless no m d'escorval sat for a moment in silence this passes comprehension he murmured at last and so low that his son could not hear him he added i will see lacheneur to-morrow this mystery must be explained End of chapter fifteen recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter sixteen of m lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva m lecoq by emile gaborio part two chapter sixteen the cottage where m lacheneur had taken refuge was situated on a hill overlooking the water it was as he had said a small and humble dwelling but it was rather less miserable than the abodes of most of the peasants of the district it was only one story high but it was divided into three rooms and the roof was covered with thatch in front was a tiny garden in which a few fruit trees some withered cabbages and a vine which covered the cottage to the roof managed to find subsistence this garden was a mere nothing but even this slight conquest over the sterility of the soil had cost lacheneur's deceased aunt almost unlimited courage and patience for more than twenty years the poor woman had never for a single day failed to throw upon her garden three or four basketfuls of richer soil which she was obliged to bring more than half a league it had been more than a year since she died but the little pathway which her patient feet had worn in the performance of this daily task was still distinctly visible 
this was the path which m d'escorval faithful to his resolution took the following day in the hope of wresting from marianne's father the secret of his inexplicable conduct he was so engrossed in his own thoughts that he failed to notice the overpowering heat as he climbed the rough hillside in the full glare of the noonday sun when he reached the summit however he paused to take breath and while wiping the perspiration from his brow he turned to look back on the road which he had traversed it was the first time he had visited the spot and he was surprised at the extent of the landscape which stretched before him from this point which is the most elevated in the surrounding country one can survey the entire valley of the oiselle and discern in the distance the redoubtable citadel of montaignac built upon an almost inaccessible rock this last circumstance which the baron was afterward doomed to recall in the midst of the most terrible scenes did not strike him then lacheneur's house absorbed all his attention his imagination pictured vividly the sufferings of this unfortunate man who only two days before had relinquished the splendors of the chateau de sairmeuse to repair to this wretched abode he rapped at the door of the cottage come in said a voice the baron lifted the latch and entered the room was small with unwhitewashed walls but with no other floor than the ground no ceiling save the thatch that formed the roof a bed a table and two wooden benches constituted the entire furniture seated upon a stool near the tiny window sat marianne busily at work upon a piece of embroidery she had abandoned her former mode of dress and her costume was that worn by the peasant girls when m d'escorval entered she rose and for a moment they remained silently standing face to face she apparently calm he visibly agitated he was looking at marianne and she seemed to him transfigured she was much paler and considerably thinner but her beauty had a strange and touching charm the sublime radiance of heroic resignation and of duty nobly fulfilled still remembering his son he was astonished to see this tranquillity you do not ask me for news of maurice he said reproachfully i had news of him this morning monsieur as i have had every day i know that he is improving and that since day before yesterday he has been allowed to take a little nourishment you have not forgotten him then she trembled a faint blush suffused throat and forehead but it was in a calm voice that she replied maurice knows that it would be impossible for me to forget him even if i wished to do so and yet you have told him that you approve your father's decision i told him so monsieur and i shall have the courage to repeat it but you have made maurice wretched unhappy child he has almost died she raised her head proudly sought m d'escorval's eyes and when she had found them look at me monsieur do you think that i too do not suffer m d'escorval was abashed for a moment but recovering himself he took marianne's hand and pressing it affectionately he said so maurice loves you you love him you suffer he has nearly died and still you reject him it must be so monsieur you say this my dear child you say this and you undoubtedly believe it but i who have sought to discover the necessity of this immense sacrifice have failed to find it explain to me then why this must be so marianne who knows but you are frightened by chimeras which my experience can scatter with a breath have you no confidence in me am i not an old friend it may be that your father in his despair has adopted extreme resolutions speak let us combat them together lacheneur knows how devotedly i am attached to him i will speak to him he will listen to me i can tell you nothing monsieur what you are so cruel as to remain inflexible when a father entreats you on his knees a father who says to you marianne you hold in your hands the happiness the life the reason of my son tears glittered in marianne's eyes but she drew away her hand ah it is you who are cruel monsieur it is you who are without pity 
do you not see what i suffer and that it is impossible for me to endure further torture no i have nothing to tell you there is nothing you can say to my father why do you seek to impair my courage when i require it all to struggle against my despair maurice must forget me he must never see me again this is fate and he must not fight against it it would be folly we are parted for ever beseech maurice to leave the country and if he refuses you who are his father must command him to do so and you too monsieur in heaven's name flee from us we shall bring misfortune upon you never return here our house is accursed the fate that overshadows us will ruin you also she spoke almost wildly her voice was so loud that it penetrated an adjoining room the communicating door opened and m lacheneur appeared upon the threshold at the sight of m d'escorval he uttered an oath but there was more sorrow and anxiety than anger in his manner as he said you monsieur you here the consternation into which marianne's words had thrown m d'escorval was so intense that it was with great difficulty he stammered out a response you have abandoned us entirely i was anxious about you have you forgotten our old friendship i come to you the brow of the former master of sairmeuse remained overcast why did you not inform me of the honor that the baron had done me marianne he said sternly she tried to speak but could not and it was the baron who replied why i have but just come my dear friend m lacheneur looked suspiciously first at his daughter then at the baron what did they say to each other while they were alone he was evidently wondering but however great may have been his disquietude he seemed to master it and it was with his old-time affability of manner that he invited m d'escorval to follow him into the adjoining room it is my reception room and my cabinet combined he said smiling this room which was much larger than the first was as scantily furnished but it contained several piles of small books and an infinite number of tiny packages two men were engaged in arranging and sorting these articles one was chanlouineau m d'escorval did not remember that he had ever seen the other who was a young man this is my son jean monsieur said lacheneur he has changed since you last saw him ten years ago it was true it had been at least ten years since the baron had seen lacheneur's son how time flies he had left him a boy he found him a man jean was just twenty but his haggard features and his precocious beard made him appear much older he was tall and well formed and his face indicated more than average intelligence still he did not impress one favorably his restless eyes were always invading yours and his smile betrayed an unusual degree of shrewdness amounting almost to cunning as his father presented him he bowed profoundly but he was very evidently out of temper m lacheneur resumed having no longer the means to maintain jean in paris i have made him return my ruin will perhaps be a blessing to him the air of great cities is not good for the son of a peasant fools that we are we send them there to teach them to rise above their fathers but they do nothing of the kind they think only of degrading themselves father interrupted the young man father wait at least until we are alone monsieur d'escorval is not a stranger chanlouineau evidently sided with the son since he made repeated signs to m lacheneur to be silent either he did not see them or he pretended not to see them for he continued i must have wearied you monsieur by telling you again and again i am pleased with my son he has a commendable ambition he is working faithfully he will succeed ah i was a poor foolish father the friend who carried jean the order to return has enlightened me to my sorrow this model young man you see here left the gaming-house only to run to public balls he was in love with a wretched little ballet girl in some low theatre and to please this creature he also went upon the stage with his face painted red and white 
to appear upon the stage is not a crime no but it is a crime to deceive one's father and to affect virtues which one does not possess have i ever refused you money no notwithstanding that you have contracted debts everywhere and you owe at least twenty thousand francs jean hung his head he was evidently angry but he feared his father twenty thousand francs repeated m lacheneur i had them a fortnight ago now i have nothing i can hope to obtain this sum only through the generosity of the duc de sairmeuse and his son these words from lacheneur's lips astonished the baron lacheneur perceived it and it was with every appearance of sincerity and good faith that he resumed does what i say surprise you i understand why my anger at first made me give utterance to all sorts of absurd threats but i am calm now and i realize my injustice what could i expect the duke to do to make me a present of sammers he was a trifle brusque i confess but that is his way uh, at heart he is the best of men have you seen him again no but i have seen his son i have even been with him to the chateau to designate the articles which i desire to keep oh he refused me nothing everything was placed at my disposal everything i selected what i wished furniture clothing linen it is all to be brought here and i shall be quite a grand seigneur why not seek another house this this pleases me monsieur its situation suits me perfectly in fact why should not the sermeurs have regretted their odious conduct was it impossible that lacheneur in spite of his indignation should conclude to accept honorable separation such were m d'escorval's reflections to say that the marquis has been kind is saying too little continued lacheneur he has shown us the most delicate attentions for example having noticed how much marianne regrets the loss of her flowers he has declared that he is going to send her plants to stock our small garden and that they shall be renewed every month like all passionate men m lacheneur overdid his part this last remark was too much it awakened a sinister suspicion in m d'escorval's mind good god he thought does this wretched man meditate some crime he glanced at chanlouineau and his anxiety increased on hearing the names of the marquis and of marianne the robust farmer had turned livid it is decided said lacheneur with an air of the lost satisfaction that they will give me the ten thousand francs bequeathed to me by mademoiselle armand moreover i am to fix upon such a sum as i consider a just recompense for my services and that is not all they have offered me the position of manager at sermeuse and i was to be allowed to occupy the gamekeeper's cottage where i lived so long but on reflection i refused this offer after having enjoyed for so long a time a fortune which did not belong to me i am anxious to amass a fortune of my own would it be indiscreet in me to inquire what you intend to do not the least in the world i am going to turn peddler m d'escorval could not believe his ears peddler he repeated yes monsieur look there is my pack in that corner but this is absurd exclaimed m d'escorval people can scarcely earn their daily bread in this way you are wrong monsieur i have considered the subject carefully the profits are thirty per cent and if besides there will be three of us to sell goods for i shall confide one pack to my son and another to chanlouineau what chanlouineau he has become my partner in the enterprise and his farm who will take care of that he will employ day laborers and then as if wishing to make m d'escorval understand that his visit had lasted quite long enough lacheneur began arranging the little packages which were destined to fill the pack of the travelling merchant 
but the baron was not to be gotten rid of so easily now that his suspicions had become almost a certainty i must speak with you he said brusquely m lacheneur turned i am very busy he replied with a very evident reluctance i ask only five minutes but if you have not the time to spare to-day i will return to-morrow day after to-morrow and every day until i can see you in private lacheneur saw plainly that it would be impossible to escape this interview so with the gesture of a man who resigns himself to a necessity addressing his son and chanlouineau he said go outside for a few moments they obeyed and as soon as the door had closed behind them lacheneur said i know very well monsieur the arguments you intend to advance and the reason of your coming you come to ask me again for marianne i know that my refusal has nearly killed maurice believe me i have suffered cruelly at the thought but my refusal is none the less irrevocable there is no power in the world capable of changing my resolution do not ask my motives i shall not reveal them but rest assured that they are sufficient are we not your friends you monsieur exclaimed lacheneur in tones of the most lively affection you ah you know it well you are the best the only friends i have here below i should be the basest and the most miserable of men if i did not guard the recollection of all your kindnesses until my eyes close in death yes you are my friends yes i am devoted to you and it is for that very reason that i answered no no never there could no longer be any doubt m d'escorval seized lacheneur's hands and almost crushing them in his grasp unfortunate man he exclaimed hoarsely what do you intend to do of what terrible vengeance are you dreaming i swear to you oh do not swear you cannot deceive a man of my age and of my experience i divine your intentions you hate the samus family more mortally than ever i yes you and if you pretend to forget it it is only that they may forget it these people have offended you too cruelly not to fear you you understand this and you are doing all in your power to reassure them you accept their advances you kneel before them why because they will be more completely in your power when you have lulled their suspicions to rest and then you can strike them more surely he paused the communicating door opened and marianne appeared upon the threshold father said she here is the marquis de sairmeuse this name which marianne uttered in a voice of such perfect composure in the midst of this excited discussion possessed such a powerful significance that m d'escorval stood as if petrified he dares to come here he thought how can it be that he does not fear the walls will fall and crush him m lacheneur cast a withering glance at his daughter he suspected her of a ruse which would force him to reveal his secret for a second the most furious passion contracted his features but by a prodigious effort of will he succeeded in regaining his composure he sprang to the door pushed marianne aside and leaning out he said deign to excuse me monsieur if i take the liberty of asking you to wait a moment i am just finishing some business and i will be with you in a moment neither agitation nor anger could be detected in his voice but rather a respectful deference and a feeling of profound gratitude having said this he closed the door and turned to m d'escorval the baron still standing with folded arms had witnessed this scene with the air of a man who distrusts the evidence of his own senses and yet he understood the meaning of it only too well so this young man comes here he said to lacheneur almost every day not at this hour usually but a trifle later and you receive him you welcome him certainly monsieur how can i be insensible to the honor he confers upon me moreover we have subjects of mutual interest to discuss we are now occupied in legalizing the restitution of sermeuse 
i can also give him much useful information and many hints regarding the management of the property and do you expect to make me your old friend believe that a man of your superior intelligence is deceived by the excuses the marquis makes for these frequent visits look me in the eye and then tell me if you dare that you believe these visits are addressed to you lacheneur's eye did not waver to whom else would they be addressed he inquired this obstinate serenity disappointed the baron's expectations he could not have received a heavier blow take care lacheneur he said sternly think of the situation in which you place your daughter between chanlouineau who wishes to make her his wife and m de sairmeuse who desires to make her who desires to make her his mistress is that what you mean oh say the word but what does that matter i am sure of marianne m d'escorval shuddered in other words said he in bitter indignation you make your daughter's honor and reputation your stake in the game you are playing this was too much lacheneur could restrain his furious passion no longer well yes he exclaimed with a frightful oath yes you have spoken the truth marianne must be and will be the instrument of my plans a man situated as i am is free from the considerations that restrain other men fortune friends life honor i have been forced to sacrifice all perish my daughter's virtue perish my daughter herself what do they matter if i can but succeed he was terrible in his fanaticism and in his mad excitement he clenched his hands as if he were threatening some invisible enemy his eyes were wild and bloodshot the baron seized him by the coat as if to prevent his escape you admit it then he said you wish to revenge yourself on the sermeuse family and you have made chanlouineau know your accomplice but lacheneur with a sudden movement freed himself i admit nothing he replied and yet i wish to reassure you he raised his hand as if to take an oath and in a solemn voice he said before god who hears my words by all that i hold sacred in this world by the memory of my sainted wife who lies beneath the sod i swear that i am plotting nothing against the sermeuse family that i had no thought of touching a hair of their heads i use them only because they are absolutely indispensable to me they will aid me without injuring themselves lacheneur this time spoke the truth his hearer felt it still he pretended to doubt he thought by retaining his own self-possession and exciting the anger of this unfortunate man still more he might perhaps discover his real intentions so it was with an air of suspicion that he said how can one believe this assurance after the avowal you have just made lacheneur saw the snare he regained his self-possession as if by magic so be it monsieur refuse to believe me but you will wring from me only one more word on this subject i have said too much already i know that you are guided solely by friendship for me my gratitude is great but i cannot reply to your question the events of the past few days have dug a deep abyss between you and me do not endeavor to pass it why should we ever meet again i must say to you what i said only yesterday to abbe midon if you are my friend you will never come here again never by night or by day or under any pretext whatever even if they tell you that i am dying do not come this house is fatal and if you meet me turn away shun me as you would a pestilence whose touch is deadly the baron was silent this was in substance what marianne had said to him only under another form but there is still a wiser course that you might pursue everything here is certain to augment the sorrow and despair which afflicts your son there is not a path nor a tree nor a flower which does not cruelly remind him of his former happiness leave this place take him with you and go far away ah how can i do this fouche has virtually imprisoned me here all the more reason why you should listen to my advice you were a friend of the emperor hence you are regarded with suspicion you are surrounded by spies 
your enemies are watching for an opportunity to ruin you the slightest pretext would suffice to throw you into prison a letter a word an act capable of being misconstrued the frontier is not far off go and wait in a foreign land for happier times that is something which i will not do said m d'escorval proudly his words and accent showed the folly of further discussion lacheneur understood this only too well and seemed to despair ah you are like abbe midon he said sadly you will not believe who knows how much your coming here this morning will cost you it is said that no one can escape his destiny but if some day the hand of the executioner is laid upon your shoulder remember that i warned you and do not curse me he paused and seeing that even this sinister prophecy produced no impression upon the baron he pressed his hand as if to bid him an eternal farewell and opened the door to admit the marquis de sairmeuse martial was perhaps annoyed at meeting m d'escorval but he nevertheless bowed with studied politeness and began a lively conversation with m lacheneur telling him that the articles he had selected at the chateau were on their way m d'escorval could do no more to speak with marianne was impossible chanlouineau and jean would not let him go out of their sight he reluctantly departed and oppressed by cruel forebodings he descended the hill which he had climbed an hour before so full of hope what should he say to maurice he had reached the little grove of pines when a hurried footstep behind him made him turn the marquis de sairmeuse was following him and motioned him to stop the baron paused greatly surprised martial with that air of ingenuousness which he knew so well how to assume and in an almost brusque tone said i hope monsieur that you will excuse me for having followed you when you hear what i have to say i am not of your party i loathe what you adore but i have none of the passion nor the malice of your enemies for this reason i tell you that if i were in your place i would take a journey the frontier is but a few miles away a good horse a short gallop and you have crossed it a word to the wise is salvation and without waiting for any response he turned and retraced his steps m d'escorval was amazed and confounded one might suppose there was a conspiracy to drive me away he murmured but i have good reason to distrust the disinterestedness of this young man martial was already far off had he been less preoccupied he would have perceived two figures in the wood mademoiselle blanche de courtomieu followed by the inevitable aunt medea had come to play the spy end of chapter sixteen recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter seventeen of m lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur lecoq by emile gaboriau part two chapter seventeen the marquis de courtomieu idolized his daughter everyone spoke of that as an incontestable and uncontested fact when persons spoke to him of his daughter they always said you who adore your daughter and when he spoke of himself he said i who adore blanche the truth was that he would have given a good deal even a third of his fortune to be rid of her this smiling young girl who seemed such an artless child had gained an absolute control over him she forced him to bow like a reed to her every caprice and heaven knows she had enough of them in the hope of making his escape he had thrown her aunt medea but in less than three months that poor woman had been completely subjugated and did not serve to divert his daughter's attention from him even for a moment sometimes the marquis revolted but nine times out of ten he paid dearly for his attempts at rebellion when mademoiselle blanche turned her cold and steel-like eyes upon him with a certain peculiar expression his courage evaporated her weapon was irony 
and knowing his weak points she struck with wonderful precision it is easy to understand how devoutly he prayed and hoped that some honest young man by speedily marrying his daughter would free him from this cruel bondage but where was he to find this liberator the marquis had announced everywhere his intention of bestowing a dowry of a million upon his daughter of course this had brought a host of eager suitors not only from the immediate neighbourhood but from parts remote but unfortunately though many of them would have suited m de courtornieu well enough not a single one had been so fortunate as to please mademoiselle blanche her father presented some suitor she received him graciously lavished all her charms upon him but as soon as his back was turned she disappointed all her father's hopes by rejecting him he is too small she said or too large his rank is not equal to ours i think him stupid he is a fool his nose is so ugly from these summary decisions there was no appeal arguments and persuasions were useless the condemned man no longer existed still as this view of aspirants to her hand amused her she encouraged her father in his efforts he was beginning to despair when fate dropped the duc de sairmeuse and son at his very door when he saw martial he had a presentiment of his approaching release he will be my son-in-law he thought the marquis believed it best to strike the iron while it was hot so the very next day he broached the subject to the duke his overtures were favourably received possessed with the desire of transforming sairmeuse into a little principality the duke could not fail to be delighted with an alliance with one of the oldest and wealthiest families in the neighbourhood the conference was short martial my son possesses in his own right an income of at least six hundred thousand francs said the duke i shall give my daughter at least yes at least fifteen hundred thousand francs as her marriage portion declared the marquis his majesty is favourably disposed toward me i can obtain any important diplomatic position for martial in case of trouble i have many friends among the opposition the treaty was thus concluded but m de courtornieu took good care not to speak of it to his daughter if he told her how much he desired the match she would be sure to oppose it non-interference seemed advisable the correctness of his judgment was fully demonstrated one morning mademoiselle blanche made her appearance in his cabinet your capricious daughter has decided papa that she would like to become the marquise de sairmeuse said she peremptorily it cost m de courtornieu quite an effort to conceal his delight but he feared if she discovered his satisfaction that the game would be lost he presented several objections they were quickly disposed of and at last he ventured to say then the marriage is half decided one of the parties consents it only remains to ascertain if the other will consent declared the vain heiress and in fact for several days mademoiselle blanche had been applying herself assiduously and quite successfully to the work of fascination which was to bring martial to her feet after having made an advance with studied frankness and simplicity sure of the effect she had produced she now proceeded to beat a retreat a manoeuvre so simple that it was almost sure to succeed until now she had been gay spirituel and coquettish gradually she became quiet and reserved the giddy schoolgirl had given place to the shrinking virgin with what perfection she played her part in the divine comedy of first love martial could not fail to be fascinated by the modest artlessness and chaste fears of the heart which seemed to be waking for him when he appeared mademoiselle blanche blushed and was silent at a word from him she became confused he could only occasionally catch a glimpse of her beautiful eyes through the shelter of their long lashes who had taught her this refinement of coquetry they say that the convent is an excellent teacher but what she had not learned was that the most clever often become dupes of their own imagination and that great comedienne generally conclude by shedding real tears 
she learned this one evening when a laughing remark made by the duc de sairmeuse revealed the fact that martial was in the habit of going to lacheneur's house every day what she experienced now could not be compared with the jealousy or rather anger which had previously agitated her this was an acute bitter and intolerable sorrow before she had been able to retain her composure now it was impossible that she might not betray herself she left the drawing-room precipitately and hastened to her own room where she burst into a fit of passionate sobbing can it be that he does not love me she murmured this thought made her cold with terror for the first time this haughty heiress distrusted her own power she reflected that martial's position was so exalted that he could afford to despise rank that he was so rich that wealth had no attractions for him and that she herself might not be so pretty and so charming as flatterers had led her to suppose still martial's conduct during the past week and heaven knows with what fidelity her memory recalled each incident was well calculated to reassure her he had not it is true formally declared himself but it was evident that he was paying his addresses to her his manner was that of the most respectful but the most infatuated of lovers her reflections were interrupted by the entrance of her maid bringing a large bouquet of roses which had just been sent by martial she took the flowers and while arranging them in a large japanese vase she bedewed them with the first real sincere tears she had shed since her entrance into the world she was so pale and sad so unlike herself when she appeared the next morning at breakfast that aunt medea was alarmed mademoiselle blanche had prepared an excuse and she uttered it in such sweet tones that the poor lady was as much amazed as if she had witnessed a miracle m de courtornieu was no less astonished of what new freak is this doleful face the preface he wondered he was still more alarmed when immediately after breakfast his daughter asked a moment's conversation with him she followed him into his study and as soon as they were alone without giving her father time to seat himself mademoiselle blanche entreated him to tell her all that had passed between the duc de sairmeuse and himself and asked if martial had been informed of the intended alliance and what he had replied her voice was meek her eyes tearful her manner indicated the most intense anxiety the marquis was delighted my wilful daughter has been playing with fire he thought stroking his chin caressingly and upon my word she has burned herself yesterday my child he replied the duc de sairmeuse formally demanded your hand on behalf of his son your consent is all that is lacking so rest easy my beautiful lovelorn damsel you will be a duchess she hid her face in her hands to conceal her blushes you know my decision father she faltered in an almost inaudible voice we must make haste he started back thinking he had not heard her words aright make haste he repeated yes father i have fears what fears in heaven's name i will tell you when everything is settled she replied as she made her escape from the room she did not doubt the reports which had reached her ears of martial's frequent visits to marianne but she wished to see for herself so as soon as she left her father she obliged aunt medea to dress herself and without vouchsafing a single word of explanation took her with her to the reche and stationed herself where she could command a view of m lacheneur's house it chanced to be the very day on which m d'escorval came to ask an explanation from his friend she saw him come then after a little martial made his appearance she had not been mistaken now she could go home satisfied but no she resolved to count the seconds which martial passed with marianne m d'escorval did not remain long she saw martial hasten out after him and speak to him she breathed again his visit had not lasted a half hour and doubtless he was going away not at all after a moment's conversation with the baron he returned to the house what are we doing here demanded aunt medea let me alone replied mademoiselle blanche angrily hold your tongue she heard the sound of wheels the tramp of horses hoofs blows of the whip and oaths 
the wagons bearing the furniture and clothing belonging to monsieur lacheneur were coming this noise martial must have heard within the house for he came out and after him came monsieur lacheneur jean chanlouineau and marianne every one was soon busy in unloading the wagons and positively from the movements of the young marquis de sairmeuse one would have sworn that he was giving orders he came and went hurrying to and fro talking to everybody not even disdaining to lend a hand occasionally he a nobleman makes himself at home in that wretched hovel mademoiselle blanche said to herself how horrible ah this dangerous creature will do with him whatever she desires all this was nothing compared with what was to come a third wagon appeared drawn by a single horse and laden with pots of flowers and shrubs this sight drew a cry of rage from mademoiselle de courtomieu which must have carried terror to aunt medea's heart flowers she exclaimed in a voice hoarse with passion he sends flowers to her as he does to me only he sends me a bouquet while for her he despoils the gardens of sairmeuse what are you saying about flowers inquired the impoverished relative mademoiselle blanche replied that she had not made the slightest allusion to flowers she was suffocating and yet she compelled herself to remain there three mortal hours all the time that was required to unload the furniture the wagons had been gone some time when martial again appeared upon the threshold marianne had accompanied him to the door and they were talking together it seemed impossible for him to make up his mind to depart he did so at last however but he left slowly and with evident reluctance marianne remaining in the door gave him a friendly gesture of farewell i wish to speak to this creature exclaimed mademoiselle blanche come aunt at once had marianne at that moment been within the reach of mademoiselle de courtomieu's voice she would certainly have learned the secret of her former friend's anger and hatred but fate willed it otherwise at least three hundred yards of rough ground separated the place where mademoiselle blanche had stationed herself from the lacheneur cottage it required a moment to cross this space and that was time enough to change all the girl's intentions she had not traversed a quarter of the distance before she bitterly regretted having shown herself at all but to retrace her steps now was impossible for marianne who was still standing upon the threshold had seen her approaching there remained barely time to regain her self-control and to compose her features she profited by it she had her sweetest smile upon her lips as she greeted marianne still she was embarrassed she did not know what excuse to give for her visit and to gain time she pretended to be quite out of breath ah it is not very easy to reach you dear marianne she said at last you live uh, upon the summit of a veritable mountain mademoiselle lacheneur said not a word she was greatly surprised and she did not attempt to conceal the fact and medea pretended to know the road continued mademoiselle blanche but she led me astray did you not aunt as usual the impecunious relative assented and her niece resumed but at last we are here i could not my dearest resign myself to hearing nothing from you especially after all your misfortunes what have you been doing did my recommendation procure for you the work you desired marianne could not fail to be deeply touched by this kindly interest on the part of her former friend so with perfect frankness and without any false shame she confessed that all her efforts had been fruitless it had even seemed to her that several ladies had taken pleasure in treating her unkindly but mademoiselle blanche was not listening a few steps from her stood the flowers brought from sairmeuse and their perfume rekindled her anger at least she interrupted you have here what will almost make you forget the gardens of sairmeuse who sent you these beautiful flowers marianne turned crimson she did not speak for a moment but at last she replied or rather stammered it is an attention from the marquis de sairmeuse so she confesses it thought mademoiselle de courtomieu amazed at what she was pleased to consider an outrageous piece of impudence but she succeeded in concealing her rage beneath a loud burst of laughter and it was in a tone of raillery that she said take care my dear friend i am going to call you to account it is from my fiance that you are accepting flowers what 
the marquis de sairmeuse has demanded the hand of your friend yes my darling and my father has given it to him it is a secret as yet but i see no danger in confiding in your friendship she believed that she had inflicted a mortal wound upon marianne's heart but though she watched her closely she failed to detect the slightest trace of emotion upon her face what dissimulation she thought then aloud and with affected gaiety she resumed and the country folk will see two weddings at about the same time since you also are going to be married my dear i yes you you little deceiver everybody knows that you are engaged to a young man in the neighborhood named wait uh, i know jean louineau thus the report that annoyed marianne so much reached her from every side everybody is for once mistaken said she energetically i shall never be that young man's wife but why they speak well of him personally and he is quite rich because faltered marianne because maurice d'escorval's name trembled upon her lips but unfortunately she did not utter it prevented by a strange expression on the face of her friend how often one's destiny depends upon a circumstance apparently as trivial as this impudent worthless creature thought mademoiselle blanche then in cold and sneering tones that betrayed her hatred unmistakably she said you are wrong believe me to refuse this offer this chanlouineau will at all events save you from the painful necessity of laboring with your own hands and of going from door to door in quest of work which is refused you but no matter i she laid great stress upon this word i will be more generous than your old acquaintances i have a great deal of embroidery to be done i shall send it to you by my maid and you two may agree upon the price we must go good-bye my dear come aunt medea she departed leaving marianne petrified with surprise sorrow and indignation although less experienced than mademoiselle blanche she comprehended that this strange visit concealed some mystery but what for more than a minute she stood motionless gazing after her departing guests then she started suddenly as a hand was laid gently upon her shoulder she trembled and turning quickly found herself face to face with her father lacheneur's face was whiter than his linen and a sinister light glittered in his eye i was there said he pointing to the door and i heard all father what would you try to defend her after she came here to crush you with her insolent good fortune after she overwhelmed you with her ironical pity and with her scorn i tell you they are all like this these girls whose heads have been turned by flattery and who believe that in their veins flows a different blood from ours but patience the day of reckoning is near at hand those whom he threatened would have shuddered had they seen him at that moment so terrible was the rage revealed by his accent so formidable did he appear and you my beloved daughter my poor marianne you did not understand the insults she heaped upon you you are wondering why she should have treated you with such disdain ah oh, well i will tell you she imagines that the marquis de sairmeuse is your lover marianne tottered beneath the terrible blow and a nervous spasm shook her from head to foot can this be possible she exclaimed great god what shame what humiliation and why should this astonish you said lacheneur coldly have you not expected this ever since the day when you my devoted daughter consented for the sake of my plans to submit to the attentions of this marquis whom you loathe as much as i despise but maurice maurice will despise me i can bear anything yes everything but that m lacheneur made no reply marianne's despair was heartbreaking he felt that he could not bear to witness it that it would shake his resolution and he re-entered the house but his penetration was not at fault while waiting to find a revenge which would be worthy of her mademoiselle blanche armed herself with a weapon of which jealousy and hatred so often avail themselves calumny two or three abominable stories which she concocted and which she forced aunt medea to circulate everywhere did not produce the desired effect marianne's reputation was of course ruined by them but martial's visits instead of ceasing became longer and more frequent 
dissatisfied with his progress and fearful that he was being duped he even watched the house so it happened that one evening when he was quite sure that lacheneur his son and chanlouineau were absent martial saw a man leave the house and hasten across the fields he rushed after him but the man escaped him he believed however that he recognized maurice d'escorval end of chapter seventeen recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter eighteen of monsieur lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur lecoq by emile gaboriau part two chapter eighteen after his son's confession m d'escorval was prudent enough to make no allusion to the hopes he himself entertained my poor maurice he thought is heartbroken but resigned it is better for him to remain without hope than to be exposed to the danger of another disappointment but passion is not always blind what the baron concealed maurice divined and he clung to this faint hope as tenaciously as a drowning man clings to the plank which is his only hope of salvation if he asked his parents no questions it was only because he was convinced that they would not tell him the truth but he watched all that went on in the house with that subtleness of penetration which fever so often imparts not one of his father's movements escaped his vigilant eye and ear consequently he heard him put on his boots ask for his hat and select a cane from among those standing in the vestibule he also heard the outer gate grate upon its hinges my father is going out he said to himself and weak as he was he succeeded in dragging himself to the window in time to satisfy himself of the truth of his conjectures if my father is going out he thought it can only be to visit m lacheneur then he has not relinquished all hope an armchair was standing near by he sank into it intending to watch for his father's return by doing so he might know his destiny a few moments sooner three long hours passed before the baron returned by his father's dejected manner he plainly saw that all hope was lost he was sure of it as sure as the criminal who reads the fatal verdict in the solemn face of the judge he had need of all his energy to regain his couch for a moment he felt that he was dying but he was ashamed of this weakness which he judged unworthy of him he determined to know what had passed to know the details he rang and told the servant that he wished to speak to his father m d'escorval promptly made his appearance well cried maurice m d'escorval felt that denial was useless lacheneur is deaf to my remonstrances and to my entreaties he replied sadly nothing remains for you but to submit my son i shall not tell you that uh, time will assuage the sorrow that now seems insupportable you would not believe me but i do say to you that you are a man and that you must prove your courage i say even more fight against thoughts of marianne as a traveller on the verge of a precipice fights against the thought of vertigo have you seen marianne father have you spoken to her i found her even more inflexible than lacheneur they reject me and they receive chanlouineau perhaps chanlouineau is living there my god and martial de sairmeuse he is their familiar guest i saw him there that each of these responses fell upon maurice like a thunderbolt was only too evident but m d'escorval had armed himself with the impassable courage of a surgeon who does not relax his hold on his instruments because the patient groans and writhes in agony m d'escorval wished to extinguish the last ray of hope in the heart of his son it is evident that m lacheneur has lost his reason exclaimed maurice the baron shook his head despondently i thought so myself at first he murmured but what does he say in justification of his conduct he must say something nothing he refuses any explanation 
and you father with all your knowledge of human nature with all your wide experience have not been able to fathom his intentions i have my suspicions Monsieur d'escorval replied but only suspicions it is possible that lacheneur listening to the voice of hatred is dreaming of a terrible revenge who knows if he does not think of organizing some conspiracy of which he is to be the leader these suppositions would explain everything chanlouineau is his aider and abettor and he pretends to be reconciled to the marquis de sairmeuse in order to get information through him the blood had returned to the pale cheeks of maurice such a conspiracy would not explain monsieur lacheneur's obstinate rejection of my suit alas yes my poor boy it is through marianne that lacheneur exerts such an influence over chanlouineau and the marquis de sairmeuse if she became your wife to-day they would desert him to-morrow then too it is precisely because he loves us that he is determined we shall not be mixed up in an enterprise the success of which is extremely doubtful but these are mere conjectures then i see that it is necessary to submit to be resigned forget i cannot faltered maurice he said this because he wished to reassure his father but he thought exactly the opposite if lacheneur is organizing a conspiracy he said to himself he must need assistance why should i not offer mine if i aid him in his preparations if i share his hopes and his dangers it will be impossible for him to refuse me the hand of his daughter whatever he may desire to undertake i can surely be of greater assistance than chanlouineau from that moment maurice thought only of doing everything possible to hasten his convalescence this was so rapid so extraordinarily rapid as to astonish abbe midon who had taken the place of the physician from montaignac i would never have believed that maurice could have been thus consoled said madame d'escorval delighted to see her son's wonderful improvement in health and spirits but the baron made no response he regarded this almost miraculous recovery with distrust he was assailed by a vague suspicion of the truth he questioned his son but skilfully as he did it he could draw nothing from him maurice had decided to say nothing to his parents what good would it do to trouble them besides he feared remonstrance and opposition and he was resolved to carry out his plans even if he was compelled to leave the paternal roof in the second week of september the abbe declared that maurice might resume his ordinary life and that as the weather was pleasant it would be well for him to spend much of his time in the open air in his delight maurice embraced the worthy priest what happiness he exclaimed then i can hunt once more he really cared but little for the chase but he deemed it expedient to pretend a great passion for it since it would furnish him with an excuse for frequent and protracted absences never had he felt more happy than on the morning when with his gun upon his shoulder he crossed the oiselle and started for the abode of m lacheneur on reaching the little grove on the reche he paused for a moment at a place which commanded a view of the cottage while he stood there he saw jean lacheneur and chanlouineau leave the house each laden with a peddler's pack maurice was therefore sure that Monsieur lacheneur and marianne were alone in the house he hastened to the cottage and entered without stopping to rap marianne and her father were kneeling on the hearth upon which a huge fire was blazing on hearing the door open they turned and at the sight of maurice they both sprang up blushing and confused what brings you here they exclaimed in the same breath under other circumstances maurice d'escorval would have been dismayed by such a hostile greeting but now he scarcely noticed it you have no business to return here against my wishes and after what i have said to you monsieur d'escorval said lacheneur rudely maurice smiled he was perfectly cool and not a detail of the scene before him had escaped his notice 
if he had felt any doubts before they were now dissipated he saw upon the fire a large kettle of melted lead and several bullet moulds stood on the hearth beside the andirons if i venture to present myself at your house monsieur said maurice gravely and impressively it is because i know all i have discovered your revengeful project you are looking for men to aid you are you not very well look me in the face in the eyes and tell me if i am not one of those whom a leader is glad to enroll among all his followers m lacheneur was terribly agitated i do not know what you mean he faltered forgetting his feigned anger i have no projects would you assert this upon oath why are you casting these bullets you are clumsy conspirators you should lock your door some one else might have entered and adding example to precept he turned and pushed the bolt this is only an imprudence he continued but to reject a soldier who comes to you voluntarily would be a fault for which your associate would have a right to call you to account i have no desire understand me to force myself into your confidence no i give myself to you blindly body and soul whatever your cause may be i declare it mine what you wish i wish i adopt your plans your enemies are my enemies command i will obey i ask only one favor that of fighting of triumphing or of dying by your side oh refuse father exclaimed marianne refuse to accept this offer would be a crime a crime and why if you please because our cause is not your cause because its success is doubtful because dangers surround us on every side a scornful exclamation from maurice interrupted her and it is you who think to dissuade me by pointing out the dangers that threaten you the dangers that you are braving maurice so if imminent peril menaced me instead of coming to my aid you would desert me you would hide yourself saying let him perish so that i may be saved speak would you do this she averted her face and made no reply she could not force herself to utter an untruth and she was unwilling to answer i would act as you are acting she waited for her father's decision if i should comply with your request maurice said m lacheneur in less than three days you would curse me and ruin us by some outburst of anger you love marianne could you see unmoved the frightful position in which she is placed remember she must not discourage the addresses either of chanlouineau or of the marquis de sairmeuse you regard me oh i know as well as you do that it is a shameful and odious role that i impose upon her that she is compelled to play a part in which she will lose a young girl's most precious possession her reputation maurice did not wince so be it he said calmly marianne's fate will be that of all women who have devoted themselves to the political advancement of the man whom they love be he father brother or lover she will be slandered insulted calumniated what does it matter she may continue her task i consent to it for i shall never doubt her and i shall know how to hold my peace if we succeed she shall be my wife if we fail the gesture which concluded the sentence said more strongly than any protestations that he was ready resigned to anything m lacheneur was greatly moved at least give me time for reflection said he there is no necessity for further reflection monsieur but you are only a child maurice and your father is my friend what of that rash boy do you not understand that by compromising yourself you also compromise baron d'escorval you think you are risking only your own head you are endangering your father's life but maurice violently interrupted him there has been too much parleying already he exclaimed there have been too many remonstrances answer me in a word only understand this if you reject me i will return to my father's house and with this gun which i hold in my hand i will blow out my brains this was no idle threat it was evident that what he said that would he do his listeners were so convinced of this that marianne turned to her father with clasped hands and a look of entreaty you are one of us then said m lacheneur sternly but do not forget 
that you forced me to consent by threats and whatever may happen to you or yours remember that you would have it so but these gloomy words produced no impression upon maurice he was wild with joy now continued m lacheneur i must tell you my hopes and acquaint you with the cause for which i am laboring what does that matter to me maurice exclaimed gaily and springing toward marianne he seized her hand and raised it to his lips crying with the joyous laugh of youth my cause here it is lacheneur turned away perhaps he recollected that a sacrifice of his pride was all that was necessary to assure the happiness of these poor children but if a feeling of remorse entered his mind he drove it away and with increased sternness he said still monsieur d'escorval it is necessary for you to understand our agreement make known your conditions sir first your visits here after certain rumors that i have put in circulation would arouse suspicion you must come here only at night and then only at hours that have been agreed upon in advance never when you are not expected the attitude of maurice expressed his entire consent moreover you must find some way to cross the river without having recourse to the ferryman who is a dangerous fellow we have an old skiff i will persuade my father to have it repaired very well will you also promise me to avoid the marquis de sairmeuse i will oh, wait a moment we must be prepared for any emergency it may be that in spite of our precautions you will meet him here monsieur de sairmeuse is arrogance itself and he hates you you detest him and you are very hasty swear to me that if he provokes you you will ignore his insults but i should be considered a coward monsieur probably will you swear maurice hesitated but an imploring look from marianne decided him i swear he said gravely as far as chanlouineau is concerned it would be better not to let him know of our agreement but i will take care of this matter m lacheneur paused and reflected for a moment as if striving to discover if he had forgotten anything nothing remains maurice he resumed but to give you a last and very important piece of advice do you know my son certainly we were formerly the best of comrades during our vacations very well when you know my secret for i shall confide it to you without reserve beware of jean what sir beware of jean i repeat it and he blushed deeply as he added ah it is a painful avowal for a father but i have no confidence in my own son he knows no more in regard to my plans than i told him on the day of his arrival i deceive him because i fear he might betray us perhaps it would be wise to send him away but in that case what would people say most assuredly they would say that i was very avaricious of my own blood while i was very ready to risk the lives of others still i may be mistaken i may misjudge him he sighed and added beware end of chapter eighteen recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter nineteen of monsieur lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur lecoq by emile gaboriau part two chapter nineteen so it was really maurice d'escorval whom the marquis de sairmeuse had seen leaving lacheneur's house martial was not certain of it but the very possibility made his heart swell with anger what part am i playing here then he exclaimed indignantly he had been so completely blinded by passion that he would not have been likely to discover the real condition of affairs even if no pains had been taken to deceive him lacheneur's formal courtesy and politeness he regarded as sincere he believed in the studied respect shown him by jean and the almost servile obsequiousness of chanlouineau did not surprise him in the least and since marianne welcomed him politely he concluded that his suit was progressing favorably having himself forgotten he supposed that everyone else had ceased to remember 
moreover he was of the opinion that he had acted with great generosity and that he was entitled to the deep gratitude of the lacheneur family for m lacheneur had received the legacy bequeathed him by mademoiselle armand and an indemnity besides all the furniture he had chosen to take from the chateau a total of at least sixty thousand francs he must be hard to please if he is not satisfied growled the duke enraged at such prodigality though it did not cost him a penny martial had supposed himself the only visitor at the cottage on the reche and when he discovered that such was not the case he became furious am i then the dupe of a shameless girl he thought he was so incensed that for more than a week he did not go to lacheneur's house his father concluded that his ill-humor and gloom was caused by some misunderstanding with marianne and he took advantage of this opportunity to gain his son's consent to an alliance with blanche de courtomieu a victim to the most cruel doubts and fears martial goaded to the last extremity exclaimed very well i will marry mademoiselle blanche the duke did not allow such a good resolution to grow cold in less than forty-eight hours the engagement was made public the marriage contract was drawn up and it was announced that the wedding would take place early in the spring a grand banquet was given at sairmeuse in honor of the betrothal a banquet all the more brilliant since there were other victories to be celebrated the duc de sairmeuse had just received with his brevet of lieutenant-general a commission placing him in command of the military department of montaignac the marquis de courtomieu had also received an appointment making him provost marshal of the same district blanche had triumphed after this public betrothal martial was bound to her for a fortnight indeed he scarcely left her side in her society there was a charm whose sweetness almost made him forget his love for marianne but unfortunately the haughty heiress could not resist the temptation to make a slighting allusion to marianne and to the lowliness of the marquis's former tastes she found an opportunity to say that she furnished marianne with work to aid her in earning a living martial forced himself to smile but the indignity which marianne had received aroused his sympathy and indignation and the next day he went to lacheneur's house in the warmth of the greeting that awaited him there all his anger vanished all his suspicions evaporated marianne's eyes beamed with joy on seeing him again he noticed it oh i shall win her yet he thought all the household were really delighted at his return the son of the commander of the military forces at montaignac and the prospective son-in-law of the provost marshal martial was a most valuable instrument through him we shall have an eye and an ear in the enemy's camp said lacheneur the marquis de sermeuse will be our spy he was for he soon resumed his daily visits to the cottage it was now december and the roads were terrible but neither rain snow nor mud could keep martial from the cottage he made his appearance generally as early as ten o'clock seated himself upon a stool in the shadow of a tall fireplace and he and marianne talked by the hour she seemed greatly interested in matters at montaignac and he told her all that he knew in regard to affairs there sometimes they were alone lacheneur chanlouineau and jean were tramping about the country with their merchandise business was prospering so well that m lacheneur had purchased a horse in order to extend his journeys but martial's conversation was generally interrupted by visitors it was really surprising to see how many peasants came to the house to speak to m lacheneur there was an interminable procession of them and to each of these peasants marianne had something to say in private then she offered each man refreshments the house seemed almost like a common drinking saloon but what can daunt the courage of a lover martial endured all this without a murmur he laughed and jested with the comers and goers he shook hands with them sometimes he even drank with them he gave many other proofs of moral courage he offered to assist m lacheneur in making up his accounts and once it happened about the middle of february 
seeing chanlouineau worrying over the composition of a letter he actually offered to act as his amanuensis the damned letter is not for me but for an uncle of mine who is about to marry off his daughter said chanlouineau martial took a seat at the table and at chanlouineau's dictation but not without many erasures indicted the following epistle my dear friend we are at last agreed and the marriage has been decided upon we are now busy with preparations for the wedding which will take place on blank we invite you to give us the pleasure of your company we count upon you and be assured that the more friends you bring with you the better we shall be pleased had martial seen the smile upon chanlouineau's lips when he requested him to leave the date for the wedding a blank he would certainly have suspected that he had been caught in a snare but he was in love ah oh, marquis remarked his father one day chupin tells me you are always at lacheneur's when will you recover from your penchant for that little girl martial did not reply he felt that he was at that little girl's mercy each glance of hers made his heart throb wildly by her side he was a willing captive if she had asked him to make her his wife he would not have said no but marianne had not this ambition all her thoughts all her wishes were for her father's success maurice and marianne had become m lacheneur's most intrepid auxiliaries they were looking forward to such a magnificent reward such feverish activity as maurice displayed all day long he hurried from hamlet to hamlet and in the evening as soon as dinner was over he made his escape from the drawing-room sprang into his boat and hastened to the reche m d'escorval could not fail to remark the long and frequent absences of his son he watched him and soon became absolutely certain that lacheneur had to use the baron's own expression seduced him greatly alarmed he decided to go and see his former friend and fearing another repulse he begged abbe midon to accompany him it was on the fourth of march at about half past four o'clock that m d'escorval and the cure started for the reche they were so anxious and troubled in mind that they scarcely exchanged a dozen words as they wended their way onward a strange sight met their eyes as they emerged from the grove on the reche night was falling but it was still light enough for them to distinguish objects only a short distance from them before lacheneur's house stood a group of about a dozen persons and m lacheneur was speaking and gesticulating excitedly what was he saying neither the baron nor the priest could distinguish his words but when he ceased the most vociferous acclamations rent the air suddenly a match glowed between his fingers he set fire to a bundle of straw and tossed it upon the thatched roof of his cottage crying out in a terrible voice the die is cast this will prove to you that i shall not draw back five minutes later the house was in flames in the distance the baron and his companions saw the windows of the citadel at montaignac illuminated by a red glare and upon every hillside glowed the light of other incendiary fires the country was responding to lacheneur's signal end of chapter nineteen recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter twenty of monsieur lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur lecoq by emile gaboriau part two chapter twenty ah ambition is a fine thing the duc de sairmeuse and the marquis de courtomieu were past middle age their lives had been marked by many storms and vicissitudes they were the possessors of millions and the owners of the most sumptuous residences in the province under these circumstances one might have supposed that they would desire to end their days in peace and quietness it would have been easy for them to create a life of happiness by doing good to those around them 
and by preparing for their last hours a chorus of benedictions and of regrets but no they longed to have a hand in managing the ship of state they were not content to be simply passengers and the duke appointed to the command of the military forces and the marquis made presiding judge of the court at montaignac were both obliged to leave their beautiful homes and take up their abode in rather dingy quarters in town they did not murmur at the change their vanity was satisfied louis eighteenth was on the throne their prejudices were triumphant they were happy it is true that dissatisfaction was rife on every side but had they not hundreds and thousands of allies at hand to suppress it and when wise and thoughtful persons spoke of discontent the duke and his associates regarded them as visionaries on the fourth of march eighteen sixteen the duke was just sitting down to dinner when a loud noise was heard in the vestibule he rose but at that very instant the door was flung open and a man entered panting and breathless this man was chupin the former poacher whom m de sairmeuse had elevated to the position of head gamekeeper it was evident that something extraordinary had happened what is it inquired the duke they are coming cried chupin they are already on the way who who by way of response chupin handed the duke a copy of the letter written by martial under chanlouineau's dictation m de sairmeuse read my dear friend we are at last agreed and the marriage is decided we are now busy in preparing for the wedding which will take place on the fourth of march the date was no longer blank but still the duke did not comprehend well what of it he demanded chupin tore his hair they are on the way he repeated i speak of the peasants they intend to take possession of montaignac dethrone louis eighteenth bring back the emperor or at least the son of the emperor miserable wretches they have deceived me i suspected this outbreak but i did not think it was so near at hand this terrible blow so entirely unexpected stupefied the duke for a moment how many are there he demanded ah how do i know monsieur two thousand perhaps perhaps ten thousand all the townspeople are with us no monsieur no the rebels have accomplices here all the retired officers stand ready to assist them who are the leaders of the movement lacheneur abbe midon chanlouineau baron d'escorval enough cried the duke now that danger was certain his coolness returned and his herculean form a trifle bowed by the weight of years rose to its full height he gave the bell rope a violent pull a valet appeared my uniform commanded m de sairmeuse my pistols quick the servant was about to obey when the duke exclaimed wait let some one take a horse and go tell my son to come here without a moment's delay take one of the swiftest horses the messenger ought to go to sairmeuse and return in two hours chupin endeavored to attract the duke's attention by pulling the skirt of his coat m de sairmeuse turned what is it the old poacher put his finger on his lip recommending silence but as soon as the valet had left the room he said it is useless to send for the marquis and why you fool because monsieur because excuse me i zounds will you speak or will you not chupin regretted that he had gone so far because the marquis well he is engaged in it the duke overturned the table with a terrible blow of his clenched fist you lie wretch he thundered with the most horrible oaths he was so formidable in his anger that the old poacher sprang to the door and turned the knob ready to take flight may i lose my head if i do not speak the truth he insisted ah lacheneur's daughter is a regular sorceress all the gallants of the neighborhood are in the ranks chanlouineau young d'escorval your son m de sairmeuse was pouring forth a torrent of curses upon marianne when his valet re-entered the room he suddenly checked himself put on his uniform and ordering chupin to follow him hastened from the house 
he was still hoping that chupin had exaggerated the danger but when he reached the place d'armes which commanded an extended view of the surrounding country his illusions were put to flight signal lights gleamed upon every side montaignac seemed surrounded by a circle of flame these are the signals murmured chupin the rebels will be here before two o'clock in the morning the duke made no response but hastened to consult m de courtomieu he was striding toward his friend's house when on hastily turning a corner he saw two men talking in a doorway and on seeing the glittering of the duke's epaulets both of them took flight the duke instinctively started in pursuit overtook one man and seizing him by the collar he asked sternly who are you what is your name the man was silent and his captor shook him so roughly that two pistols which had been hidden under his long coat fell to the ground ah brigand exclaimed m de sairmeuse so you are one of the conspirators against the king then without another word he dragged the man to the citadel gave him in charge of the astonished soldiers and again started for m de courtomieu's house he expected the marquis would be terrified not in the least he seemed delighted at last comes an opportunity for us to display our devotion and our zeal and without danger we have good walls strong gates and three thousand soldiers at our command these peasants are fools but be grateful for their folly my dear duke and run and order out the montaignac chasseur but suddenly a cloud overspread his face he knit his brows and added the devil i am expecting blanche this evening she was to leave courtomieu after dinner heaven grant that she may meet with no misfortune on the way End of chapter 20. Recording by Tony Oliva, Albuquerque. Chapter 21 of Monsieur Le Coq, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Oliva monsieur le coq by emile gaboriau part two chapter twenty one the duc de sairmeuse and the marquis de courtomieu had more time before them than they supposed the rebels were advancing but not so rapidly as chupin has said two circumstances which it was impossible to foresee disarranged lacheneur's plans standing beside his burning house lacheneur counted the signal fires that blazed out in answer to his own their number corresponded to his expectations he uttered a cry of joy all our friends keep their word he exclaimed they are ready they are even now on their way to the rendezvous let us start at once for we must be there first they brought him his horse and his foot was already in the stirrup when two men sprang from the neighboring grove and darted toward him him. one of them seized the horse by the bridle abbe midon exclaimed lacheneur in profound astonishment monsieur d'escorval and foreseeing perhaps what was to come he added in a tone of concentrated fury what do you two men want with me we wish to prevent the accomplishment of an act of madness exclaimed m d'escorval hatred has crazed you lacheneur you know nothing of my projects do you think that i do not suspect them you hope to capture montaignac what does that matter to you interrupted lacheneur violently but m d'escorval would not be silenced he seized the arm of his former friend and in a voice loud enough to be heard distinctly by every one present he continued foolish man you have forgotten that montaignac is a fortified city protected by deep moats and high walls you have forgotten that behind these fortifications is a garrison commanded by a man whose energy and valor are beyond all question the duc de sairmeuse lacheneur struggled to free himself from his friend's grasp everything has been arranged he replied and they are expecting us at montaignac you would be as sure of this as i am myself if you had seen the light gleaming on the windows of the citadel and look you can see it yet this light tells me that two or three hundred retired officers will come to open the gates of the city for us as soon as we make our appearance and after that if you take montaignac 
what will you do then do you suppose that the english will give you back your emperor is not napoleon second the prisoner of the austrians have you forgotten that the allied sovereigns have left one hundred and fifty thousand soldiers within a day's march of paris sullen murmurs were heard among lacheneur's followers but all this is nothing continued the baron the chief danger lies in the fact that there are as many traitors as dupes in an undertaking of this sort whom do you call dupes monsieur all those who take their illusions for realities as you have done all those who because they desire anything very much really believe that it will come to pass do you really suppose that neither the duc de sairmeuse nor the marquis de courtomieu has been warned of it lacheneur shrugged his shoulders who could have warned them but his tranquillity was feigned the look which he cast upon jean proved it and it was in the coldest possible tone that he added it is probable that at this very hour the duc and the marquis are in the power of our friends the cure now attempted to join his efforts to those of the baron you will not go lacheneur he said you will not remain deaf to the voice of reason you are an honest man think of the frightful responsibility you assume what upon these frail hopes you dare to peril the lives of hundreds of brave men i tell you that you will not succeed you will be betrayed i am sure you will be betrayed an expression of horror contracted lacheneur's features it was evident to all that he was deeply moved it is impossible to say what might have happened had it not been for the intervention of chanlouineau this sturdy peasant came forward brandishing his gun we are wasting too much time in foolish prattling he exclaimed with a fierce oath lacheneur started as if he had been struck by a whip he rudely freed himself and leaped into the saddle forward he ordered but the baron and the priest did not yet despair they sprang to the horse's head lacheneur cried the priest beware the blood you are about to spill will fall upon your head and upon the heads of your children appalled by these prophetic words the little band paused then someone issued from the ranks clad in the costume of a peasant marianne exclaimed the abbe and the baron in the same breath yes i responded the young girl removing the large hat which had partially concealed her face i wish to share the dangers of those who are dear to me share in their victory or their defeat your counsel comes too late gentlemen do you see those lights on the horizon they tell us that the people of these communes are repairing to the crossroads at the croix d'arcy the general rendezvous before two o'clock fifteen hundred men will be gathered there awaiting my father's commands would you have him leave these men whom he has called from their peaceful firesides without a leader impossible she evidently shared the madness of her lover and father even if she did not share all their hopes no there must be no more hesitation no more parleying she continued prudence now would be the height of folly there is no more danger in a retreat than in an advance do not try to detain my father gentlemen each moment of delay may perhaps cost a man's life and now my friends forward a loud cheer answered her and the little band descended the hill but m d'escorval could not allow his own son whom he saw in the ranks to depart thus maurice he cried the young man hesitated but at last approached you will not follow these madmen maurice said the baron i must follow them father i forbid it alas father i cannot obey you i have promised i have sworn i am second in command his voice was sad but it was determined my son exclaimed m d'escorval unfortunate child it is to certain death that you are marching to certain death all the more reason that i should not break my word father and your mother maurice the mother whom you forget a tear glistened in the young man's eye my mother he replied would rather weep for her dead son than keep him near her dishonored and branded with the names of coward and traitor farewell my father m d'escorval appreciated the nobility of soul that maurice displayed in his conduct he extended his arms and pressed his beloved son convulsively to his heart feeling that it might be for the last time farewell he faltered 
farewell maurice soon rejoined his comrades whose acclamations were growing fainter and fainter in the distance but the baron stood motionless overwhelmed with sorrow suddenly he started from his reverie a single hope remains abbe he cried alas murmured the priest oh i am not mistaken marianne just told us the place of rendezvous by running to escorval and harnessing the cabriolet we might be able to reach the croix d'arcy before this party arrives there your voice which touched lacheneur will touch the heart of his accomplices we will persuade these poor misguided men to return to their homes come abbe come quickly and they departed on the run End of chapter twenty one Recording by Tony Oliva, Albuquerque. Chapter Twenty Two of Monsieur Le Coq, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Oliva, Monsieur Le Coq by Emile Gaboriau, Part Two chapter twenty two the clock in the tower of sairmeuse was striking the hour of eight when lacheneur and his little band of followers left the reche an hour later at the chateau de courtomieu mademoiselle blanche after finishing her dinner ordered the carriage to convey her to montaignac since her father had taken up his abode in town they met only on sunday on that day either blanche went to montaignac or the marquis paid a visit to the chateau hence this proposed journey was a deviation from the regular order of things it was explained however by grave circumstances it was six days since martial had presented himself at courtomieu and blanche was half crazed with grief and rage what aunt medea was forced to endure during this interval only poor dependence in rich families can understand for the first three days mademoiselle blanche succeeded in preserving a semblance of self-control on the fourth she could endure it no longer and in spite of the breach of les convenances which it involved she sent a messenger to sermeuse to inquire for martial was he ill had he gone away the messenger was informed that the marquis was perfectly well but as he spent the entire day from early morn to dewy eve in hunting he went to bed every evening as soon as supper was over what a horrible insult still she was certain that martial on hearing what she had done would hasten to her to make his excuses vain hope he did not come he did not even condescend to give one sign of life ah doubtless he is with her she said to aunt medea he is on his knees before that miserable marianne his mistress for she had finished by believing as is not unfrequently the case the very calumnies which she herself had invented in this extremity she decided to make her father her confidant she wrote him a note announcing her coming she wished her father to compel lacheneur to leave the country this would be an easy matter for him since he was armed with discretionary authority at an epoch when lukewarm devotion afforded an abundant excuse for sending a man into exile fully decided upon this plan blanche became calmer on leaving the chateau and her hopes overflowed in incoherent phrases to which poor aunt medea listened with her accustomed resignation at last i shall be rid of this shameless creature she exclaimed we will see if he has the audacity to follow her will he follow her oh no he dare not when the carriage passed through the village of sermeuse mademoiselle blanche noticed an unwanted animation there were lights in every house the saloon seemed full of drinkers and groups of people were standing upon the public square and upon the doorsteps but what did this matter to mademoiselle de courtomieu it was not until they were a mile or so from sermeuse that she was startled from her reverie listen aunt medea she said suddenly do you hear anything the poor dependent listened both occupants of the carriage heard shouts that became more and more distinct with each revolution of the wheels let us find out the meaning of this said mademoiselle blanche and lowering one of the carriage windows she asked the coachman the cause of the disturbance i see a great crowd of peasants on the hill they have torches and blessed jesus 
interrupted aunt medea in alarm it must be a wedding added the coachman whipping up his horses it was not a wedding but lacheneur's little band which had been augmented to the number of about five hundred lacheneur should have been at the croix d'arcy two hours before but he had shared the fate of most popular chiefs when an impetus had been given to the movement he was no longer master of it baron d'escorval had made him lose twenty minutes he was delayed four times as long in sairmeuse when he reached that village a little behind time he found the peasants scattered through the wine shops drinking to the success of the enterprise to tear them from their merry-making was a long and difficult task and to crown all when they were finally induced to resume their line of march it was impossible to persuade them to extinguish the pine knots which they had lighted to serve as torches prayers and threats were alike unavailing they wished to see their way they said poor deluded creatures they had not the slightest conception of the difficulties and the perils of the enterprise they had undertaken they were going to capture a fortified city defended by a numerous garrison as if they were bound on a pleasure jaunt gay thoughtless and animated by the imperturbable confidence of a child they were marching along arm in arm singing patriotic songs on horseback in the centre of the band m lacheneur felt his hair turning white with anguish would not this delay ruin everything what would the others who were waiting at the croix d'arcy think what were they doing at this very moment onward onward he repeated maurice chanlouineau jean marianne and about twenty of the old soldiers of the empire understood and shared lacheneur's despair they knew the terrible danger they were incurring and they too repeated faster let us march faster vain exhortation it pleased these people to go slowly suddenly the entire band stopped some of the peasants chancing to look back had seen the lamps of mademoiselle de courtomieu's carriage gleaming in the darkness it came rapidly onward and soon overtook them the peasants recognized the coachman's livery and greeted the vehicle with shouts of derision m de courtomieu by his avariciousness had made even more enemies than the duc de sairmeuse and all the peasants who thought they had more or less reason to complain of his extortions were delighted at this opportunity to frighten him for that they were not thinking of vengeance is conclusively proved by the sequel hence great was their disappointment when on opening the carriage door they saw within the vehicle only mademoiselle blanche and aunt medea who uttered the most piercing shrieks but mademoiselle de courtomieu was a brave woman who are you she demanded haughtily and what do you desire you will know to-morrow replied chanlouineau until then you are our prisoner i see that you do not know who i am boy excuse me i do know who you are and for this very reason i request you to descend from your carriage she must leave the carriage must she not monsieur d'escorval very well i declare that i will not leave my carriage tear me from it if you dare they would certainly have dared had it not been for marianne who checked some peasants as they were springing toward the carriage let mademoiselle de courtomieu pass without hindrance said she but this permission might produce such serious consequences that chanlouineau found courage to resist that cannot be marianne said he she will warn her father we must keep her as a hostage her life may save the life of our friends mademoiselle blanche had not recognized her former friend any more than she had suspected the intentions of this crowd of men but marianne's name uttered with that of d'escorval enlightened her at once she understood it all and trembled with rage at the thought that she was at the mercy of her rival she resolved to place herself under no obligation to marianne lacheneur very well said she we will descend her former friend checked her no said she no this is not the place for a young girl for an honest young girl you should say replied blanche with a sneer chanlouineau was standing only a few feet from the speaker with his gun in his hand if a man had uttered those words he would have been instantly killed marianne did not deign to notice them mademoiselle will turn back she said calmly and as she can reach montaignac by the other road two men will accompany her as far as courtomieu she was obeyed the carriage turned and rolled away but not so quickly that marianne failed 
to hear blanche cry beware of marie i will make you pay dearly for your insulting patronage the hours were flying by this incident had occupied ten minutes more ten centuries and the last trace of order had disappeared m lacheneur could have wept with rage he called maurice and chanlouineau i place you in command said he do all that you can to hurry these idiots onward i will ride as fast as i can to the croix d'arcy he started but he was only a short distance in advance of his followers when he saw two men running toward him at full speed one was clad in the attire of a well-to-do bourgeois the other wore the old uniform of captain in the emperor's guard what has happened lacheneur cried in alarm all is discovered great god major carini has been arrested by whom how ah oh, there was a fatality about it just as we were perfecting our arrangements to capture the duke de Semeuse, the duke surprised us we fled but the cursed noble pursued us overtook carini seized him by the collar and dragged him to the citadel lacheneur was overwhelmed the abbe's gloomy prophecy again resounded in his ears so i warn my friends and hasten to warn you continued the officer the affair is an utter failure he was was only too correct and lacheneur knew it even better than he did but blinded by hatred and anger he would not acknowledge that the disaster was irreparable let mademoiselle de coutomieux pass without hindrance he affected a calmness which he did not in the least feel you are easily discouraged gentlemen he said bitterly there is at least one more chance the devil then you have resources of which we are ignorant perhaps that depends you have just passed the croix d'arcy did you tell any of those people what you have just told me not a word how many men are there at the rendezvous at least two thousand and uh, what is their mood they are burning to begin the struggle they are cursing our slowness and told me to entreat you to make haste in that case our cause is not lost said lacheneur with a threatening gesture wait here until the peasants come up and say to them that you were sent to tell them to make haste bring them on as quickly as possible and have confidence in me i will be responsible for the success of the enterprise he said this then putting spurs to his horse galloped away he had deceived the men he had no other resources he did not have the slightest hope of success it was an abominable falsehood but if this edifice which he had erected with such care and labor was to totter and fall he desired to be buried beneath its ruins they would be defeated he was sure of it but what did that matter in the conflict he would seek death and find it bitter discontent pervaded the crowd at the croix d'arcy and after the passing of the officers who had hastened to warn lacheneur of the disaster at montaignac the murmurs of dissatisfaction were changed to curses these peasants nearly two thousand in number were indignant at not finding their leader awaiting them at the rendezvous where is he they asked who knows but he is afraid at the last moment perhaps he is concealing himself while we are risking our lives and the bread of our children here and already the epithet of mischief-maker and traitor were flying from lip to lip and increasing the anger in every breast some were of the opinion that the crowd should disperse others wished to march against montaignac without lacheneur and that immediately but these deliberations were interrupted by the furious gallop of a horse a carriage appeared and stopped in the centre of the open space two men alighted baron d'escorval and abbe midon they were in advance of lacheneur they thought they had arrived in time alas here as on the reche all their efforts all their entreaties and all their threats were futile they had come in the hope of arresting the movement they only precipitated it we have gone too far to draw back exclaimed one of the neighboring farmers who was the recognized leader in lacheneur's absence if death is before us it is also behind us to attack and conquer that is our only hope of salvation forward then at once this is the only way of disconcerting our enemies he who hesitates is a coward forward a shout of approval from two thousand throats replied forward they unfurled the tricolor that much regretted flag that reminded them of so much glory and so many great misfortunes the drums began to beat and with shouts of vive napoleon ii the whole column took up its line of march 
pale with clothing in disorder and voices husky with fatigue and emotion m d'escorval and the abbe followed the rebels imploring them to listen to reason they saw the precipice toward which these misguided creatures were rushing and they prayed god for an inspiration to check them in fifty minutes the distance separating the croix d'arcy from montaignac is traversed soon they see the gate of the citadel which was to have been opened for them by their friends within the walls it is eleven o'clock and yet this gate stands open does not this circumstance prove that their friends are masters of the town and that they are awaiting them in force they advance so certain of success that those who have guns do not even take the trouble to load them m d'escorval and the abbe alone foresee the catastrophe the leader of the expedition is near them they entreat him not to neglect the commonest precautions they implore him to send some two men on in advance to reconnoitre they themselves offer to go on condition that the peasants will await their return before proceeding further but their prayers are unheeded the peasants pass the outer line of fortifications in safety the head of the advancing column reaches the drawbridge the enthusiasm amounts to delirium who will be the first to enter is the only thought alas at that very moment a pistol is fired it is a signal for instantly on every side resounds a terrible fusillade three or four peasants fall mortally wounded the rest pause frozen with terror thinking only of escape the indecision is terrible but the leader encourages his men there are a few of napoleon's old soldiers in the ranks a struggle begins all the more frightful by reason of the darkness but it is not the cry of forward that suddenly rends the air the voice of a coward sends up the cry of panic we are betrayed let him save himself who can this is the end of all order a wild fear seizes the throng and these men flee madly despairingly scattered as withered leaves are scattered by the power of the tempest end of chapter twenty two recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter twenty three of monsieur lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur lecoq by emile gaborio part two chapter twenty three chupin's stupefying revelations and the thought that martial the heir of his name and dukedom should degrade himself so low as to enter into a conspiracy with vulgar peasants drove the duc de sairmeuse nearly wild but the marquis de courtornieu's coolness restored the duc's sang froid he ran to the barracks and in less than half an hour five hundred foot soldiers and three hundred of the montaignac chasseurs were under arms with these forces at his disposal it would have been easy enough to suppress this movement without the least bloodshed it was only necessary to close the gates of the city it was not with fowling pieces and clubs that these poor peasants could force an entrance into a fortified town but such moderation did not suit a man of the duke's violent temperament a man who was ever longing for struggle and excitement a man whose ambition prompted him to display his zeal he had ordered the gate of the citadel to be left open and had concealed some of his soldiers behind the parapets of the outer fortifications he then stationed himself where he could command a view of the approach to the citadel and deliberately chose his moment for giving the signal to fire still a strange thing happened of four hundred shots fired into a dense crowd of fifteen hundred men only three had hit the mark more humane than their chief nearly all the soldiers had fired in the air but the duke had not time to investigate this strange occurrence now he leaped into the saddle and placing himself at the head of about five hundred men cavalry and infantry he started in pursuit of the fugitives the peasants had the advantage of their pursuers by about twenty minutes 
poor simple creatures they might easily have made their escape they had only to disperse to scatter but unfortunately the thought never once occurred to the majority of them a few ran across the fields and gained their homes in safety the others frantic and despairing overcome by the strange vertigo that seizes the bravest in moments of panic fled like a flock of frightened sheep fear lent them wings for did they not hear each moment shots fired at the laggards but there was one man who at each of these detonations received as it were his death wound this man was lacheneur he had reached the croix d'arcy just as the firing at montaignac began he listened and waited no discharge of musketry replied to the first fusillade there might have been butchery but combat no lacheneur understood it all and he wished that every ball had pierced his own heart he put spurs to his horse and galloped to the crossroads the place was deserted at the entrance of one of the roads stood the cabriolet which had brought m d'escorval and the abbe at last m lacheneur saw the fugitives approaching in the distance he dashed forward to meet them trying by mingled curses and insults to stay their flight cowards he vociferated traitors you flee and you are ten against one where are you going to your own homes fools you will find the gendarme there only waiting your coming to conduct you to the scaffold is it not better to die with your weapons in your hands come right about follow me we may still conquer reinforcements are at hand two thousand men are following me he promised them two thousand men had he promised them ten thousand twenty thousand an army and cannon it would have made no difference not until they reached the wide open space of the crossroads where they had talked so confidently scarcely an hour before did the most intelligent of the throng regain their senses while the others fled in every direction about a hundred of the bravest and most determined of the conspirators gathered around m lacheneur in the little crowd was the abbe gloomy and despondent he had been separated from the baron what had been his fate had he been killed or taken prisoner was it possible that he had made his escape the worthy priest dared not go away he waited hoping that his companion might rejoin him and deemed himself fortunate in finding the carriage still there he was still waiting when the remnant of the column confided to maurice and chanlouineau came up of the five hundred men that composed it on its departure from sermeuse only fifteen remained including the two retired officers marianne was in the centre of this little party m lacheneur and his friends were trying to decide what course it was best for them to pursue should each man go his way or should they unite and by an obstinate resistance give all their comrades time to reach their homes the voice of chanlouineau put an end to all hesitation i have come to fight he exclaimed and i shall sell my life dearly we will make a stand then cried the others but chanlouineau did not follow them to the spot which they had considered best adapted to the prolonged defence he called maurice and drew him a little aside you monsieur d'escorval he said almost roughly are going to leave here at once i i came here chanlouineau as you did to do my duty your duty monsieur is to serve marianne go at once and take her with you i shall remain said maurice firmly he was going to join his comrades when chanlouineau stopped him you have no right to sacrifice your life here he said quietly your life belongs to the woman who has given herself to you wretch how dare you chanlouineau sadly shook his head what is the use of denying it said he it was so great a temptation that only an angel could have resisted it it was not your fault nor was it hers lacheneur was a bad father there was a day when i wished either to kill myself or to kill you i knew not which ah only once again will you be as near death as you were that day you were scarcely five paces from the muzzle of my gun it was god who stayed my hand by reminding me of her despair now that i am to die as well as lacheneur someone must care for marianne swear that you will marry her you may be involved in some difficulty on account of this affair but i have here the means of saving you 
a sound of firing interrupted him the soldiers of the duc de sairmeuse were approaching good god exclaimed chanlouineau and marianne they rushed in pursuit of her and maurice was the first to discover her standing in the centre of the open space clinging to the neck of her father's horse he took her in his arms trying to drag her away come said he come but she refused leave me leave me she entreated but all is lost yes i know that all is lost even honour leave me here i must remain i must die and thus hide my shame i must it shall be so just then chanlouineau appeared had he divined the secret of her resistance perhaps but without uttering a word he lifted her in his strong arms as if she had been a child and bore her to the carriage guarded by abbe midon get in he said addressing the priest and quick take mademoiselle lacheneur now maurice in your turn but already the duke's soldiers were masters of the field seeing a group in the shadow at a little distance they rushed to the spot the heroic chanlouineau seized his gun and brandishing it like a club held the enemy at bay giving maurice time to spring into the carriage catch the reins and start the horse off at a gallop all the cowardice and all the heroism displayed on that terrible night will never be really known two minutes after the departure of marianne and of maurice chanlouineau was still battling with the foe a dozen or more soldiers were in front of him twenty shots had been fired but not a ball had struck him his enemies always believed him invulnerable surrender cried the soldiers amazed at such valor surrender never never he was truly formidable he brought to the support of his marvellous courage a superhuman strength and agility no one dared come within reach of those brawny arms that revolved with the power and velocity of the sails of a windmill then it was that a soldier confiding his musket to the care of a companion threw himself flat upon his belly and crawling unobserved around behind this obscure hero seized him by the legs he tottered like an oak beneath the blow of the axe struggling furiously but taken at such a disadvantage was thrown to the ground crying as he fell help friends help but no one responded to this appeal at the other end of the open space those upon whom he called had after a desperate struggle yielded the main body of the duke's infantry was near at hand the rebels heard the drums beating the charge they could see the bayonets gleaming in the sunlight Lacheneur, who had remained in the same spot utterly ignoring the shot that whistled around him felt that his few remaining comrades were about to be exterminated in that supreme moment the whole past was revealed to him as by a flash of lightning he read and judged his own heart hatred had led him to crime he loathed himself for the humiliation which he had imposed upon his daughter he cursed himself for the falsehoods by which he had deceived these brave men for whose death he would be accountable enough blood had flowed he must save those who remained cease firing my friends he commanded retreat they obeyed he could see them scatter in every direction he too could flee was he not mounted upon a gallant steed which would bear him beyond the reach of the enemy but he had sworn that he would not survive defeat maddened with remorse despair sorrow and impotent rage he saw no refuge save in death he had only to wait for it it was fast approaching he preferred to rush to meet it gathering up the reins he dashed the rowels in his steed and alone charged upon the enemy the shock was rude the ranks opened there was a moment of confusion but lacheneur's horse its chest cut open by the bayonets reared beat the air with his hoofs then fell backward burying his rider beneath him and the soldiers marched on not suspecting that beneath the body of the horse the brave rider was struggling to free himself it was half past one in the morning the place was deserted nothing disturbed the silence save the moans of a few wounded men who called upon their comrades for succor but before thinking of the wounded m de sairmeuse must decide upon the course which would be most likely to redound to his advantage and to his political glory 
now that the insurrection had been suppressed it was necessary to exaggerate its magnitude as much as possible in order that his reward should be in proportion to the service supposed to have been rendered some fifteen or twenty rebels had been captured but that was not a sufficient number to give the victory the eclat which he desired he must find more culprits to drag before the provost marshal or before a military commission he therefore divided his troops into several detachments and sent them in every direction with orders to explore the villages search all isolated houses and arrest all suspected persons his task here having been completed he again recommended the most implacable severity and started on a brisk trot for montaignac he was delighted certainly he blessed as had m de courtornieu these honest and artless conspirators but one fear which he vainly tried to dismiss impaired his satisfaction his son the marquis de sairmeuse was he or was he not implicated in this conspiracy he could not he would not believe it and yet the recollection of chupin's assurance troubled him on the other hand what could have become of martial the servant who had been sent to warn him had he met him was the marquis returning and by which road could it be possible that he had fallen into the hands of the peasants the duke's relief was intense when on returning home after a conference with m de courtornieu he learned that martial had arrived about a quarter of an hour before the marquis went at once to his own room on dismounting from his horse added the servant very well replied the duke i will seek him there before the servants he said very well but secretly he exclaimed abominable impertinence what i am on horseback at the head of my troops my life imperilled and my son goes quietly to bed without even assuring himself of my safety he reached his son's room but found the door closed and locked on the inside he rapped who is there demanded martial it is i open the door martial drew the bolt m de sairmeuse entered but the sight that met his gaze made him tremble upon the table was a basin of blood and martial with chest bared was bathing a large wound in his right breast you have been fighting exclaimed the duke in a husky voice yes oh then you were indeed i was where what at the convocation of these miserable peasants who in their parricidal folly have dared to dream of the overthrow of the best of princes martial's face betrayed successively profound surprise and a more violent desire to laugh i think you must be jesting monsieur he replied the young man's words and manner reassured the duke a little without entirely dissipating his suspicions then these vile rascals attacked you he exclaimed not at all i have been simply obliged to fight a duel with whom name the scoundrel who has dared to insult you a faint flush tinged martial's cheek but it was in his usual careless tone that he replied upon my word no i shall not give his name you would trouble him perhaps and i really owe the fellow a debt of gratitude it happened upon the highway he might have assassinated me without ceremony but he offered me open combat besides he was wounded far more severely than i all m de sairmeuse's doubts had returned and why instead of summoning a physician are you attempting to dress this wound yourself because it is a mere trifle and because i wish to keep it a secret the duke shook his head all this is scarcely plausible he remarked especially after the assurance of your complicity which i have received ah said he and from whom from your spy-in-chief no doubt that rascal chupin it surprises me to see that you can hesitate for a moment between the word of your son and the stories of such a wretch do not speak ill of chupin marquis he is a very useful man had it not been for him we should have been taken unawares it was through him that i learned of this vast conspiracy organized by lacheneur what is it lacheneur who is at the head of the movement yes marquis ah your usual discernment has failed you in this instance what you have been a constant visitor at this house and you have suspected nothing 
and you contemplate a diplomatic career but this is not all you know now for what purpose the money which you so lavishly bestowed upon them has been employed they have used it to purchase guns powder and ammunition the duke had become satisfied of the injustice of his suspicions but he was now endeavouring to irritate his son it was a fruitless effort martial knew very well that he had been duped but he did not think of resenting it if lacheneur has been captured he thought if he should be condemned to death and if i should save him marianne would refuse me nothing end of chapter twenty three recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter twenty four of monsieur lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur lecoq by emile gaboriau part two chapter twenty four having penetrated the mystery that enveloped his son's frequent absence the baron d'escorval had concealed his fears and his chagrin from his wife it was the first time that he had ever had a secret from the faithful and courageous companion of his existence without warning her he went to beg abbe midon to follow him to the reche to the house of m lacheneur the silence on his part explains madame d'escorval's astonishment when on the arrival of the dinner hour neither her son nor her husband appeared maurice was sometimes late but the baron like all great workers was punctuality itself what extraordinary thing could have happened her surprise became uneasiness when she learned that her husband had departed in company with abbe midon they had harnessed the horse themselves and instead of driving through the courtyard as usual they had driven through the stable-yard into a lane leading to the public road what did all this mean why these strange precautions madame d'escorval waited oppressed by vague forebodings the servants shared her anxiety the baron was so equable in temper so kind and just to his inferiors that his servants adored him and would have gone through a fiery furnace for him so about ten o'clock they hastened to lead to their mistress a peasant who was returning from sairmeuse this man who was slightly intoxicated told the strangest and most incredible stories he said that all the peasantry for ten leagues around were under arms and that the baron d'escorval was the leader of the revolt he did not doubt the final success of the movement declaring that napoleon the second marie louise and all the marshals of the empire were concealed in montaignac alas it must be confessed that lacheneur had not hesitated to utter the grossest falsehoods in his anxiety to gain followers madame d'escorval could not be deceived by these ridiculous stories but she could believe and she did believe that the baron was the prime mover in this insurrection and this belief which would have carried consternation to the hearts of so many women reassured her she had entire absolute and unlimited faith in her husband she believed him superior to all other men infallible in short the moment he said this is so she believed it implicitly hence if her husband had organized a movement that movement was right if he had attempted it it was because he expected to succeed therefore it was sure to succeed impatient however to know the result she sent the gardener to sermeuse with orders to obtain information without awakening suspicion if possible and to hasten back as soon as he could learn anything of a positive nature he returned in about two hours pale frightened and in tears the disaster had already become known and had been related to him with the most terrible exaggerations he had been told that hundreds of men had been killed and that a whole army was scouring the country massacring defenceless peasants and their families while he was telling his story madame d'escorval felt that she was going mad she saw yes positively she saw her son and her husband dead or still worse mortally wounded upon the public highway they were lying with their arms crossed upon their breasts 
livid bloody their eyes staring wildly they were begging for water a drop of water i will find them she exclaimed in frenzied accents i will go to the field of battle i will seek for them among the dead until i find them light some torches my friends and come with me for you will aid me will you not you loved them they were so good you would not leave their dead bodies unburied oh the wretches the wretches who have killed them the servants were hastening to obey when the furious gallop of a horse and the sound of carriage wheels were heard upon the drive here they are exclaimed the gardener here they are madame d'escorval followed by the servants rushed to the door just in time to see a cabriolet enter the courtyard and the horse panting exhausted and flecked with foam miss his footing and fall abbe midon and maurice had already leaped to the ground and were lifting out an apparently lifeless body even marianne's great energy had not been able to resist so many successive shocks the last trial had overwhelmed her once in the carriage all immediate danger having disappeared the excitement which had sustained her fled she became unconscious and all the efforts of maurice and of the priest had failed to restore her but madame d'escorval did not recognize mademoiselle lacheneur in the masculine habiliments in which she was clothed she only saw that it was not her husband whom they had brought with them and a convulsive shudder shook her from head to foot your father maurice she exclaimed in a stifled voice and your father the effect was terrible until that moment maurice and the cure had comforted themselves with the hope that m d'escorval would reach home before them maurice tottered and almost dropped his precious burden the abbe perceived it and at a sign from him two servants gently lifted marianne and bore her to the house then the cure approached madame d'escorval monsieur will soon be here madame said he at hazard he fled first baron d'escorval could not have fled she interrupted a general does not desert when face to face with the enemy if a panic seizes his soldiers he rushes to the front and either leads them back to combat or takes his own life mother faltered maurice mother oh do not try to deceive me my husband was the organizer of this conspiracy his confederates beaten and dispersed must have proved themselves cowards god have mercy upon me my husband is dead in spite of the abbe's quickness of perception he could not understand such assertions on the part of the baroness he thought that sorrow and terror must have destroyed her reason ah madame he exclaimed the baron had nothing to do with this movement far from it he paused all this was passing in the courtyard in the glare of the torches which had been lighted up by the servants any one in the public road could hear and see all he realized the imprudence of which they were guilty come madame said he leading the baroness toward the house and you also maurice come it was with the silent and passive submission of great misery that madame d'escorval obeyed the cure her body alone moved in mechanical obedience her mind and heart were flying through space to the man who was her all and whose mind and heart were even then doubtless calling to her from the dread abyss into which he had fallen but when she had passed the threshold of the drawing-room she trembled and dropped the priest's arm rudely recalled to the present reality she recognized marianne in the lifeless form extended upon the sofa mademoiselle lacheneur she faltered here in this costume dead one might indeed believe the poor girl dead to see her lying there rigid cold and as white as if the last drop of blood had been drained from her veins her beautiful face had the immobility of marble her half-opened colorless lips disclosed teeth convulsively clenched and a large dark blue circle surrounded her closed eyelids her long black hair which she had rolled up closely to slip under her peasant's hat had become unbound and flowed down in rich masses over her shoulders and trailed upon the floor she is only in a state of syncope there is no danger declared the abbe after he examined marianne it will not be long before she regains consciousness and then rapidly but clearly he gave the necessary directions to the servants who were astonished at their mistress 
madame d'escorval looked on with eyes dilated with terror she seemed to doubt her own sanity and incessantly passed her hand across her forehead thickly beaded with cold sweat what a night she murmured what a night i must remind you madame said the priest sympathizingly but firmly that reason and duty alike forbid you thus to yield to despair wife where is your energy christian what has become of your confidence in a just and beneficial god oh i have courage monsieur faltered the wretched woman i am brave the abbe led her to a large armchair where he forced her to seat herself and in a gentler tone he resumed besides why should you despair madame your son certainly is with you in safety your husband has not compromised himself he has done nothing which i myself have not done and briefly but with rare precision he explained the part which he and the baron had played during this unfortunate evening but this recital instead of reassuring the baroness seemed to increase her anxiety i understand you she interrupted and i believe you but i also know that all the people in the country round about are convinced that my husband commanded the insurrectionists they believe it and they will say it and what of that if he has been arrested as you give me to understand he will be summoned before a court-martial was he not the friend of the emperor that is a crime as you very well know he will be convicted and sentenced to death no madame no am i not here i will appear before the tribunal and i shall say here i am i have seen and i know all but they will arrest you alas monsieur because you are not a priest according to the hearts of these cruel men they will throw you in prison and you will meet him upon the scaffold maurice had been listening pale and trembling but on hearing these last words he sank upon his knees hiding his face in his hands ah i have killed my father he exclaimed unhappy child what do you say the priest motioned him to be silent but he did not see him and he pursued my father was ignorant even of the existence of this conspiracy of which m lacheneur was the guiding spirit but i knew it i wished him to succeed because on his success depended the happiness of my life and then wretch that i was when i wished to attract to our rank some timid or wavering accomplice i used the loved and respected name of d'escorval ah oh, i was mad i was mad then with a despairing gesture he added and yet even now i have not the courage to curse my folly oh mother mother if you knew his sobs interrupted him just then a faint moan was heard marianne was regaining consciousness already she had partially risen from the sofa and sat regarding this terrible scene with an air of profound wonder as if she did not understand it in the least slowly and gently she put back her hair from her face and opened and closed her eyes which seemed dazzled by the light of the candles she endeavored to speak to ask some question but abbe midon commanded silence by a gesture enlightened by the words of madame d'escorval and by the confession of maurice the abbe understood at once the extent of the frightful danger that menaced the baron and his son how was this danger to be averted what must be done he had no time for explanation or reflection with each moment a chance of salvation fled he must decide and act without delay the abbe was a brave man he darted to the door and called the servants who were standing in the hall and on the staircase when they were gathered around him listen to me intently said he in that quick and imperious voice that impresses one with the certainty of approaching peril and remember that your master's life depends perhaps upon your discretion we can rely upon you can we not every hand was raised as if to call upon god to witness their fidelity in less than an hour continued the priest the soldiers sent in pursuit of the fugitives will be here not a word must be uttered in regard to what has passed this evening 
every one must be led to suppose that i went away with the baron and returned alone not one of you must have seen mademoiselle lacheneur we are going to find a place of concealment for her remember my friends if there is the slightest suspicion of her presence here all is lost if the soldiers question you endeavor to convince them that monsieur maurice has not left the house this evening he paused trying to think if he had forgotten any precaution that human prudence could suggest then added one word more to see you standing about at this hour of the night will awaken suspicion at once but this is what i desire we will plead in justification the alarm that you feel at the absence of the baron and also the indisposition of madame for madame is going to retire she will thus escape interrogation and you maurice run and change your clothes and above all wash your hands and sprinkle some perfume upon them all present were so impressed with the imminence of the danger that they were more than willing to obey the priest's orders marianne as soon as she could be moved was carried to a tiny room under the roof madame d'escorval retired to her own apartment and the servants went back to the office maurice and the abbe remained alone in the drawing-room silent and appalled by horrible forebodings the unusually calm face of the priest betrayed his terrible anxiety he now felt convinced that baron d'escorval was a prisoner and all his efforts were now directed toward removing any suspicion of complicity from maurice this was he reflected the only way to save the father a violent peal of the bell attached to the gate interrupted his meditations he heard the footsteps of the gardener as he hastened to open it heard the gate turn upon its hinges then the measured tramp of soldiers in the courtyard a loud voice commanded halt the priest looked at maurice and saw that he was as pale as death be calm he entreated do not be alarmed do not lose your self-possession and do not forget my instructions let them come replied maurice i am prepared the drawing-room door was flung violently open and a young man wearing the uniform of a captain of grenadiers entered he was scarcely twenty-five years of age tall fair-haired with blue eyes and a little waxed moustache his whole person betokened an excessive elegance exaggerated to the verge of the ridiculous his face ordinarily must have indicated extreme self-complacency but at the present moment it wore a really ferocious expression behind him in the passage were a number of armed soldiers he cast a suspicious glance around the room then in a harsh voice who is the master of this house he demanded the baron d'escorval my father who is absent replied maurice where is he the abbe who until now had remained seated rose on hearing of the unfortunate outbreak of this evening he replied the baron and myself went to these peasants in hope of inducing them to relinquish their foolish undertaking they would not listen to us in the confusion that ensued i became separated from the baron i returned here very anxious and am now awaiting his return the captain twisted his moustache with a sneering air not a bad invention said he only i do not believe a word of this fiction a light gleamed in the eyes of the priest his lips trembled but he held his peace who are you rudely demanded the officer i am the cure of sermeuse honest men ought to be in bed at this hour and you are racing about the country after rebellious peasants really i do not know what prevents me from ordering your arrest that which did prevent him was the priestly robe all powerful under the restoration with maurice he was more at ease how many are there in this family three my father my mother ill at this moment and myself and how many servants seven four men and three women you have neither received nor concealed any one this evening no one it will be necessary to prove this said the captain and turning toward the door corporal bavois he called this man was one of those old soldiers who had followed the emperor over all europe two small ferocious gray eyes lighted his tanned weather-beaten face and an immense hooked nose surmounted a heavy bristling mustache bavois commanded the officer you will take half a dozen men and search this house from top to bottom 
you are an old fox that knows a thing or two if there is any hiding place here you will be sure to discover it if any one is concealed here you will bring the person to me go and make haste the corporal departed on his mission the captain resumed his questions and now said he turning to maurice what have you been doing this evening the young man hesitated for an instant then with well-feigned indifference replied i have not put my head outside the door this evening hm, that must be proved let me see your hands the soldier's tone was so offensive that maurice felt the angry blood mount to his forehead fortunately a warning glance from the abbe made him restrain his wrath he offered his hands to the inspection of the captain who examined them carefully outside and in and finally smelled them ah these hands are too white and smell too sweet to have been dabbling in powder he was evidently surprised that this young man should have had so little courage as to remain in the shelter of the fireside while his father was leading the peasants on to battle another thing said he you must have weapons here yes hunting rifles where are they in a small room in the ground floor take me there they conducted him to the room and on finding that none of the double-barrelled guns had been used for some days he seemed considerably annoyed he appeared furious when the corporal came and told him that he had searched everywhere but had found nothing of a suspicious character sin for the servants was his next order but all the servants faithfully repeated the lesson which the abbe had given them the captain saw that he was not likely to discover the mystery although he was well satisfied that one existed swearing that they should pay dearly for it if they were deceiving him he again called bavois i must continue my search said he you with two men will remain here and render a strict account of all that you see and hear if m d'escorval returns bring him to me at once do not allow him to escape keep your eyes open and good luck to you he added a few words in a low voice then left the room as abruptly as he had entered it the departing footsteps of the soldiers were soon lost in the stillness of the night and then the corporal gave vent to his disgust in a frightful oath eh said he to his men you have heard that cadet listen watch arrest report so he takes us for spies ah if our old leader knew to what base uses his old soldiers were degraded the two men responded by a sullen growl as for you pursued the old trooper addressing maurice and the abbe i bavois corporal of grenadiers declare in my name and in that of my two men that you are as free as birds and that we shall arrest no one more than that if we can aid you in any way we are at your service the little fool that commanded us this evening thought we were fighting look at my gun i have not fired a shot from it and my comrades fired only blank cartridges the man might possibly be sincere but it was scarcely probable we have nothing to conceal replied the cautious priest the old corporal gave a knowing wink ah you distrust me you are wrong and i am going to prove it because you see though it is easy to gull that fool who just left here it is not so easy to deceive corporal bavois very well it was scarcely prudent to leave in the courtyard a gun that certainly had not been charged for firing at swallows the cure and maurice exchanged a glance of consternation maurice now recollected for the first time that when he sprang from the carriage to lift out marianne he propped his loaded gun against the wall it had escaped the notice of the servants secondly pursued bavois there is someone concealed in the attic i have excellent ears thirdly i arranged it so that no one should enter the sick lady's room maurice needed no further proof he extended his hand to the corporal and in a voice trembling with emotion he said you are a brave man a few moments later maurice the abbe and madame d'escorval were again assembled in the drawing-room deliberating upon the measures which must be taken when marianne appeared she was still frightfully pale but her step was firm her manner quiet and composed i must leave this house she said to the baroness had i been conscious i would never have accepted hospitality which is likely to bring dire misfortune on your family alas your acquaintance with me has caused you too many tears and too much sorrow already do you understand now why i wished you to regard us as strangers a presentiment told me that my family would be fatal to yours 
poor child exclaimed madame d'escorval where will you go marianne lifted her beautiful eyes to the heaven in which she placed her trust i do not know madame she replied but duty commands me to go i must learn what has become of my father and my brother and share their fate what exclaimed maurice still this thought of death you who no longer he paused a secret which was not his own had almost escaped his lips but visited by a sudden inspiration he threw himself at his mother's feet oh my mother my dearest mother do not allow her to depart i may perish in my attempt to save my father she will be your daughter then she whom i have loved so much you will encircle her with your tender and protecting love marianne remained end of chapter twenty four recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter twenty five of monsieur lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur lecoq by emile gaboriau part two chapter twenty five the secret which approaching death had wrestled from marianne in the fortification at the croix d'arcy madame d'escorval was ignorant of when she joined her entreaties to those of her son to induce the unfortunate girl to remain but the fact occasioned maurice scarcely an uneasiness his faith in his mother was complete absolute he was sure that she would forgive when she learned the truth loving and chaste wives and mothers are always most indulgent to those who have been led astray by the voice of passion such noble women can with impunity despise and brave the prejudices of hypocrites these reflections made maurice feel more tranquil in regard to marianne's future and he now thought only of his father day was breaking he declared that he would assume some disguise and go to montaignac at once on hearing these words madame d'escorval turned and hid her face in the sofa cushions to stifle her sobs she was trembling for her husband's life and now her son must precipitate himself into danger perhaps before the sun sank to rest she would have neither husband nor son and yet she did not say no she felt that maurice was only fulfilling a sacred duty she would have loved him less had she supposed him capable of cowardly hesitation she would have dried her tears if necessary to bid him go moreover what was not preferable to the agony of suspense which they had been enduring for hours maurice had reached the door when the abbe stopped him you must go to montaignac said he but it would be folly to disguise yourself you would certainly be recognized and the saying he who conceals himself as guilty will assuredly be applied to you you must go openly with head erect and you must even exaggerate the assurance of innocence go straight to the duc de sairmeuse and the marquis de coutomieux i will accompany you we will go in the carriage maurice seemed undecided obey these counsels my son said madame d'escorval the abbe knows much better than we do what is best i will obey mother the cure had not waited for this assent to go and give an order for harnessing the horses madame d'escorval left the room to write a few lines to a lady friend whose husband exerted considerable influence in montaignac maurice and marianne were left alone it was the first moment of freedom and solitude which they had found since marianne's confession they stood for a moment silent and motionless then maurice advanced and clasping her in his arms he whispered marianne my darling my beloved i did not know that one could love more fondly than i loved you yesterday but now and you you wish for death when another precious life depends upon yours she shook her head sadly i was terrified she faltered the future of shame that i saw that i still alas see before me appalled me now i am resigned i will uncomplainingly endure the punishment for my horrible fault i will submit to the insults and disgrace that await me insults to you ah woe to who dares but will you not be my wife in the sight of men as you are in the sight of god the failure of your father's scheme set you free 
no no maurice i am not free ah it is you who are pitiless i see only too well that you curse me that you curse the day we met for the first time confess it say it marianne lifted her streaming eyes to his i should lie if i said that my cowardly heart has not that much courage i suffer i am disgraced and humiliated but he could not finish he drew her to him and their lips and their tears met in one long kiss you love me exclaimed maurice you love me in spite of all we shall succeed i will save your father and mine i will save your brother the horses were neighing and stamping in the courtyard the abbe cried come let us start madame d'escorval entered with a letter which she handed to maurice she clasped in a long and convulsive embrace the son whom she feared she should never see again then summoning all her courage she pushed him away uttering only a single word go he departed and when the sound of the carriage wheels had died away in the distance madame d'escorval and marianne fell upon their knees imploring the mercy and aid of a just god they could only pray the cure and maurice could act abbe midon's plan which he explained to young d'escorval as the horses dashed along was as simple as the situation was terrible if by confessing your own guilt you could save your father i should tell you to deliver yourself up and to confess the whole truth such would be your duty but this sacrifice would be not only useless but dangerous your confession of guilt would only implicate your father still more you would be arrested but they would not release him and you would both be tried and convicted let us then allow i will not say justice for that would be blasphemy but these bloodthirsty men who call themselves judges to pursue their course and attribute all that you have done to your father when the trial comes you will prove his innocence and produce alibis so incontestable that they will be forced to acquit him and i understand the people of our country so well that i am sure not one of them will reveal our stratagem and if we should not succeed asked maurice gloomily what could i do then the question was so terrible that the priest dared not respond to it he and maurice were silent during the remainder of the drive they reached the city at last and maurice saw how wise the abbe had been in preventing him from assuming a disguise armed with the most absolute power the duc de sairmeuse and the marquis de courtornieu had closed all the gates of montaignac save one through this gate all who desired to leave or enter the city were obliged to pass and two officers were stationed there to examine all comers and goers to question them and to take their name and residence at the name d'escorval the two officers evinced such surprise that maurice noticed it at once ah you know what has become of my father he exclaimed the baron d'escorval is a prisoner monsieur replied one of the officers although maurice had expected this response he turned pale is he wounded he asked eagerly he has not a scratch but enter sir and pass on from the anxious looks of these officers one might have supposed that they feared they should compromise themselves by conversing with the son of so great a criminal the carriage rolled beneath the gateway but it had not traversed two hundred yards of the grand rue before the abbe and maurice had remarked several posters and notices affixed to the walls we must see what this is they said in a breath they stopped near one of these notices before which a reader had already stationed himself they descended from the carriage and read the following order article one the inmates of the house in which the elder lacheneur shall be found will be handed over to a military commission for trial article two whoever shall deliver the body of the elder lacheneur dead or alive will receive a reward of twenty thousand francs this was signed duc de sermeuse god be praised exclaimed maurice marianne's father has escaped he had a good horse and in two hours a glance and a nudge of the elbow from the abbe checked him the abbe drew his attention to the man standing near them this man was none other than chupin the old scoundrel had also recognized them for he took off his hat to the cure and with an expression of intense covetousness in his eyes he said 
twenty thousand francs what a sum a man could live comfortably all his life on the interest of it the abbe and maurice shuddered as they re-entered their carriage lacheneur is lost if this man discovers his retreat murmured the priest fortunately he must have crossed the frontier before this replied maurice a hundred to one he is beyond reach and if you should be mistaken what if wounded and faint from loss of blood lacheneur has had only strength to drag himself to the nearest house and ask the hospitality of its inmates oh even in that case he is safe i know our peasants there is not one who is capable of selling the life of a proscribed man the noble enthusiasm of youth drew a sad smile from the priest you forget the dangers to be incurred by those who shelter him many a man who would not soil his hands with the price of blood might deliver up a fugitive from fear they were passing through the principal street and they were struck with the mournful aspect of the place the little city which was ordinarily so bustling and gay fear and consternation evidently reigned there the shops were closed the shutters of the houses had not been opened a lugubrious silence pervaded the town one might have supposed that there was general mourning and that each family had lost one of its members the manner of the few persons seen upon the thoroughfare was anxious and singular they hurried on casting suspicious glances on every side two or three who were acquaintances of the baron d'escorval averted their heads on seeing his carriage to avoid the necessity of bowing the abbe and maurice found an explanation of this evident terror on reaching the hotel to which they had ordered the coachman to take them they had designated the hotel de france where the baron always stopped when he visited montaignac and whose proprietor was none other than logeron that friend of lacheneur who had been the first to warn him of the arrival of the duc de sairmeuse this worthy man on hearing what guests had arrived went to the courtyard to meet them with his white cap in his hand on such a day politeness was heroism was he connected with the conspiracy it has always been supposed so he invited maurice and the abbe to take some refreshments in a way that made them understand he was anxious to speak with them and he conducted them to a retired room where he knew they would be secure from observation thanks to one of the duc de sairmeuse's valet de chambre who frequented the house the host knew as much as the authorities he knew even more since he had also received in information from the rebels who had escaped capture from him the abbe and maurice received their first positive information in the first place nothing had been heard of lacheneur or of his son jean thus far they had escaped the most rigorous pursuit in the second place there were at this moment two hundred prisoners in the citadel and among them the baron d'escorval and chanlouineau and lastly since morning there had been at least sixty arrests in montaignac it was generally supposed that these arrests were the work of some traitor and all the inhabitants were trembling with fear but m logeron knew the real cause it had been confided to him under pledge of secrecy by his guest the duke's valet de chambre it is certainly an incredible story gentlemen he said nevertheless it is true two officers belonging to the montaignac militia on returning from their expedition this morning at daybreak on passing the croix d'arcy found a man clad in the uniform of the emperor's bodyguard lying dead in the fosse maurice shuddered the unfortunate man he could not doubt was the brave old soldier who had spoken to lacheneur naturally pursued m logeron the two officers examined the body of the dead man between his lips they found a paper which they opened and read it was a list of all the conspirators in the village the brave man knowing he was mortally wounded endeavored to destroy this fatal list but the agonies of death prevented him from swallowing it but the abbe and maurice had not time to listen to the commentaries with which the hotel proprietor accompanied his recital they dispatched a messenger to madame d'escorval and to marianne in order to reassure them and without losing a moment and fully determined to brave all 
they went to the house occupied by the duc de sermeuse a crowd had gathered about the door at least a hundred persons were standing there men with anxious faces women in tears soliciting imploring an audience they were the friends and relatives of the unfortunate men who had been arrested two footmen in gorgeous livery and pompous in bearing had all they could do to keep back the struggling throng the abbe hoping that his priestly dress would win him a hearing approached and gave his name but he was repulsed like the others monsieur le duc is busy and can receive no one said the servant monsieur le duc is preparing his report for his majesty and in support of this assertion he pointed to the horses standing saddled in the courtyard and the couriers who were to bear the dispatches the priest sadly rejoined his companions we must wait said he intentionally or not the servants were deceiving these poor people the duke just then was not troubling himself about dispatches a violent altercation was going on between the marquis de courtomieu and himself each of these noble personages aspired to the leading role the one which would be most generously rewarded undoubtedly it was a conflict of ambitions and of wills it had begun by the exchange of a few recriminations and it quickly reached stinging words bitter allusions and at last even threats the marquis declared it necessary to inflict the most frightful he said the most salutary punishment upon the offender the duke on the contrary was inclined to be indulgent the marquis declared that since lacheneur the prime mover and his son had both eluded pursuit it was an urgent necessity to arrest marianne the other declared that the arrest and imprisonment of this young girl would be impolitic that such a course would render the authorities odious and the rebels more zealous as each was firmly wedded to his own opinion the discussion was heated but they failed to convince each other these rebels must be put down with a strong hand urged m de courtomieu i do not wish to exasperate the populace replied the duke bah what does public sentiment matter it matters a great deal when you cannot depend upon your soldiers do you know what happened last night there was powder enough burned to win a battle there were only fifteen peasants wounded our men fired in the air you forget that the montaignac militia is composed for the most part at least of men who formerly fought under bonaparte and who are burning to turn their weapons against us but neither the one nor the other dared to tell the real cause of his obstinacy mademoiselle blanche had been at montaignac that morning she had confided her anxiety and her sufferings to her father and she made him swear that he would profit by this opportunity to rid her of marianne on his side the duke persuaded that marianne was his son's mistress wished at any cost to prevent her appearance before the tribunal at last the marquis yielded the duke had said to him very well let us end this dispute at the same time glancing so meaningly at a pair of pistols that the worthy marquis felt a disagreeable chilliness creep up his spine they then went together to examine the prisoners preceded by a detachment of soldiery who drove back the crowd which gathered again to await the duke's return so all day maurice watched the aerial telegraph established upon the citadel and whose black arms were moving incessantly what orders are travelling through space he said to the abbe is it life or is it death end of chapter twenty five recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter twenty six of m lecoq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Oliva. Monsieur Lecoq by Émile Gaboriau, Part Two, Chapter 26. Above all, make haste, Maurice had said to the messenger charged with bearing a letter to the baroness. Nevertheless, the man did not reach Escorval until nightfall. Beset by a thousand fears, he had taken the unfrequented roads and had made long circuits to avoid 
all the people he saw approaching in the distance madame d'escorval tore the letter rather than took it from his hands she opened it read it aloud to marianne and merely said let us go at once but this was easier said than done they kept but three horses at escorval one was nearly dead from its terrible journey of the previous night the other two were in montaignac what were the ladies to do to trust to the kindness of their neighbors was the only resource open to them but these neighbors having heard of the baron's arrest firmly refused to lend their horses they believed they would gravely compromise themselves by rendering any service to the wife of a man upon whom the burden of the most terrible of accusations was resting madame d'escorval and marianne were talking of pursuing their journey on foot when corporal bavois enraged at such cowardice swore by the sacred name of thunder that this should not be one moment said he i will arrange the matter he went away but reappeared about a quarter of an hour afterward leading an old plough-horse by the mane this clumsy and heavy steed he harnessed into the cabriolet as best he could but even this did not satisfy the old trooper's complaisance his duties at the chateau were over as m d'escorval had been arrested and nothing remained for corporal bavois but to rejoin his regiment he declared that he would not allow these ladies to travel at night and unattended on the road where they might be exposed to many disagreeable encounters and that he in company with two grenadiers would escort them to their journey's end and it will go hard with soldier or civilian who ventures to molest them will it not comrades he exclaimed as usual the two men assented with an oath so as they pursued their journey madame d'escorval and marianne saw the three men preceding or following the carriage or oftener walking beside it not until they reached the gates of montaignac did the old soldier forsake his protégés and then not without bidding them a respectful farewell in the name of his companions as well as himself not without telling them if they had need of him to call upon bavois corporal of grenadiers company first stationed at the citadel the clocks were striking ten when madame d'escorval and marianne alighted at the hotel de france they found maurice in despair and even the abbe disheartened since maurice had written to them events had progressed with fearful rapidity they knew now the orders which had been forwarded by signals from the citadel these orders had been printed and affixed to the walls the signals had said montaignac must be regarded as in a state of siege the military authorities have been granted discretionary power a military commission will exercise jurisdiction instead of and in place of the courts let peaceable citizens take courage let the evil disposed tremble as for the rabble the sword of the law is about to strike only six lines in all but each word was a menace that which filled the abbe's heart with dismay was the substitution of a military commission for a court-martial this upset all his plans made all his precautions useless and destroyed his hopes of saving his friend a court-martial was of course hasty and often unjust in its decisions but still it observes some of the forms of procedure practised in judicial tribunals it still preserves something of the solemnity of legal justice which desires to be enlightened before it condemns a military commission would infallibly neglect all legal forms and summarily condemn and punish the accused parties as in time of war a spy is tried and punished what exclaimed maurice they dare to condemn without investigating without listening to testimony without allowing the accused time to prepare any defence the abbe was silent this exceeded his most sinister apprehensions now he believed anything possible maurice spoke of an investigation it had commenced that day and it was still going on by the light of the jailer's lantern 
that is to say the duc de sairmeuse and the marquis de courtornieu were passing the prisoners in review they numbered three hundred and the duke and his companion had decided to summon before the commission thirty of the most dangerous conspirators how were they to select them by what method could they discover the extent of each prisoner's guilt it would have been difficult for them to explain they went from one to another asking any question that entered their minds and after the terrified man replied according as they thought his countenance good or bad they said to the jailer who accompanied them keep this one until another time or this one for to-morrow by daylight they had thirty names upon their list and the names of the baron d'escorval and chanlino led all the rest although the unhappy party at the hotel de france could not suspect this fact they suffered an agony of fear and dread through the long night which seemed to them eternal as soon as day broke they heard the beating of the reveille at the citadel the hour when they might commence their efforts anew had come the abbe announced that he was going alone to the duke's house and that he would find a way to force an entrance he had bathed his red and swollen eyes in fresh water and was prepared to start on his expedition when some one rapped cautiously at the door of the chamber maurice cried come in and m logeron instantly entered the room his face announced some dreadful misfortune and the worthy man was really terrified he had just learned that the military commission had been organized in contempt of all human laws and the commonest rules of justice the presidency of this tribunal of vengeance and of hatred had been bestowed upon the duc de sairmeuse and he had accepted it he who was at the same time to play the part of participant witness and judge the other members of the commission were military men and when does the commission enter upon its functions inquired the abbe to-day replied the host hesitatingly this morning in an hour perhaps sooner the abbe understood what m logeron meant but dared not say the commission is assembling make haste come he said to maurice i wish to be present when your father is examined ah what would not the baroness have given to follow the priest and her son but she could not she understood this and submitted they set out and as they stepped into the street they saw a soldier a little way from them who made a friendly gesture they recognized corporal bavois and paused but he passing them with an air of the utmost indifference and apparently without observing them hastily dropped these words i have seen chanlouineau be of good cheer he promises to save m d'escorval end of chapter twenty six recording by tony oliva albuquerque chapter twenty seven of monsieur le coq part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva monsieur le coq by emile gaborio part two chapter twenty seven in the citadel of montaignac within the second line of fortifications stands an old building known as the chapel originally consecrated to worship the structure had at the time of which we write fallen into disuse it was so damp that it would not even serve as an arsenal for an artillery regiment for the guns rusted there more quickly than in the open air a black mould covered the walls to a height of six or seven feet this was the place selected by the duc de sairmeuse and the marquis de courtornieu for the assembling of the military commission on first entering it maurice and the abbe felt a cold chill strike to their very hearts and an indefinable anxiety paralyzed all their faculties but the commission had not yet commenced its seance and they had time to look about them the arrangements which had been made in transforming this gloomy hall into a tribunal attested the precipitancy of the judges and their determination to finish their work promptly and mercilessly the arrangements denoted an absence of all form and one could divine at once the frightful certainty of the result 
three large tables taken from the mess-room and covered with horse blankets instead of tapestry stood upon the platform some unpainted wooden chairs awaited the judges but in the centre glittered the president's chair a superbly carved and gilded fauteuil sent by the duc de sairmeuse several wooden benches had been provided for the prisoners ropes stretched from one wall to the other divided the chapel into two parts it was a precaution against the public a superfluous precaution alas the abbe and maurice had expected to find the crowd too great for the hall large as it was and they found the chapel almost unoccupied there were not twenty persons in the building standing back in the shadow of the wall were perhaps a dozen men pale and gloomy a sullen fire smouldering in their eyes their teeth tightly clenched they were army officers retired on half pay three men attired in black were conversing in low tones near the door in a corner stood several country women with their aprons over their faces they were weeping bitterly and their sobs alone broke the silence they were the mothers wives or daughters of the accused men nine o'clock sounded the rolling of the drum made the panes of the only window tremble a loud voice outside shouted present arms the military commission entered followed by the marquis de coutomieu and several civil functionaries the duke was in full uniform his face a little more crimson and his air a trifle more haughty than usual the session is open pronounced the duc de sairmeuse the president then in a rough voice he added bring in the culprits he had not even the grace to say the accused they came in one by one to the number of twenty and took their places on the benches at the foot of the platform chanlouineau held his head proudly erect and looked composedly about him baron d'escorval was calm and grave but not more so than when in days gone by he had been called upon to express his opinion in the councils of the empire both saw maurice who was so overcome that he had to lean upon the abbe for support but while the baron greeted his son with a simple bend of the head chanlouineau made a gesture that clearly signified have confidence in me fear nothing the attitude of the other prisoners betrayed surprise rather than fear perhaps they were unconscious of the peril they had braved and the extent of the danger that now threatened them when the prisoners had taken their places the chief counsel for the prosecution rose his presentation of the case was characterized by intense violence but lasted only five minutes he briefly narrated the facts exalted the merits of the government of the restoration and concluded by a demand that sentence of death should be pronounced upon the culprits when he ceased speaking the duke addressing the first prisoner upon the bench said rudely stand up the prisoner rose your name and age jean michel chanlineau age twenty nine farmer by occupation an owner of national lands probably the owner of lands which having been paid for with good money made fertile by labor are rightfully mine the duke did not wish to waste time on discussion you have taken part in this rebellion he pursued yes you are right in avowing it for witnesses will be introduced who will prove this fact conclusively five grenadiers entered they were the men whom chanlouineau had held at bay while maurice the abbe and marianne were entering the carriage these soldiers declared upon oath that they recognized the accused and one of them even went so far as to pronounce a glowing elogium upon him declaring him to be a solid fellow of remarkable courage chanlouineau's eyes during this deposition betrayed an agony of anxiety would the soldiers allude to this circumstance of the carriage no they did not allude to it that is sufficient interrupted the president then turning to chanlouineau what were your motives he inquired we hope to free ourselves from a government imposed upon us by foreigners to free ourselves from the insolence of the nobility and to retain the lands that were justly ours enough you were one of the leaders of the revolt one of the leaders yes who were the others a faint smile flitted over the lips of the young farmer as he replied 
the others were monsieur lacheneur his son jean and the marquis de sermeuse the duke bounded from his gilded armchair wretch he exclaimed rascal vile scoundrel he caught up a heavy inkstand that stood upon the table before him and one would have supposed that he was about to hurl it at the prisoner's head chanlouineau stood perfectly unmoved in the midst of the assembly which was excited to the highest pitch by his startling declaration you question me he resumed and i replied you may gag me if my responses do not please you if there were witnesses for me as there are against me i could prove the truth of my words as it is all the prisoners here will tell you that i am speaking the truth is it not so you others with the exception of baron d'escorval there was not one prisoner who was capable of understanding the real bearing of these audacious allegations but all nevertheless nodded their assent the marquis de sermeuse was so truly our leader exclaimed the daring peasant that he was wounded by a sabre thrust while fighting by my side the face of the duke was more purple than that of a man struck with apoplexy and his fury almost deprived him of the power of speech you lie scoundrel you lie he gasped send for the marquis said chanlouineau tranquilly and see whether or not he is wounded a refusal on the part of the duke could not fail to arouse suspicion but what could he do martial had concealed his wound the day before it was now impossible to confess that he had been wounded fortunately for the duke one of the judges relieved him of his embarrassment i hope monsieur that you will not give this arrogant rebel the satisfaction he desires the commission opposes his demand chanlouineau laughed loudly <laughs> very naturally he exclaimed to-morrow my head will be off and you think nothing will then remain to prove what i say i have another proof fortunately material and indestructible proof which it is beyond your power to destroy and which will speak when my body is six feet underground what is the proof demanded another judge upon whom the duke looked askance the prisoner shook his head i will give it to you when you offer me my life in exchange for it he replied it is now in the hands of a trusty person who knows its value it will go to the king if necessary we would like to understand the part which the marquis de sermeuse has played in this affair whether he truly was with us or whether he was only an instigating agent a tribunal regardful of the immutable rules of justice or even of its own honor would by virtue of its discretionary powers have instantly demanded the presence of the marquis de sermeuse but the military commission considered such a course quite beneath its dignity these men arrayed in gorgeous uniforms were not judges charged with the vindication of a cruel law but still a law they were the instruments commissioned by the conquerors to strike the vanquished in the name of that savage code which may be summed up in two words vi victis the president the noble duc de sermeuse would not have consented to summon martial on any consideration nor did his associate judges wish him to do so had chanlouineau foreseen this probably yet why had he ventured so hazardous a blow the tribunal after a short deliberation decided that it would not admit this testimony which had so excited the audience and stupefied maurice and abbe midon the examination was continued therefore with increased bitterness instead of designating imaginary leaders resumed the duke you would do well to name the real instigator of this revolt not lacheneur but an individual seated upon the other end of the bench the elder d'escorval monsieur le baron d'escorval was entirely ignorant of the conspiracy i swear it by all that i hold most sacred hold your tongue interrupted the counsel for the prosecution instead of wearing the patience of the commission by such ridiculous stories try to merit its indulgence chanlouineau's glance and gesture expressed such disdain that the man who interrupted him was abashed i wish no indulgence he said i have played i have lost here is my head but if you were not more cruel than wild beasts you would take pity on the poor wretches who surround me i see at least ten among them who were not our accomplices 
and who certainly did not take up arms even the others did not know what they were doing no they did not having spoken he resumed his seat proud indifferent and apparently oblivious to the murmur which ran through the audience the soldiers of the guard and even to the platform at the sound of his vibrant voice the despair of the poor peasant women had been reawakened and their sobs and moans filled the immense hall the retired officers had grown even more pale and gloomy and tears streamed down the wrinkled cheeks of several that one is a man they were thinking the abbe leaned over and whispered in the ear of maurice evidently chanlouineau has some plan he intends to save your father how i cannot understand the judges were conversing in low tones with considerable animation a difficulty had presented itself the prisoners ignorant of the charges which would be brought against them and not expecting instant trial had not thought of procuring a defender and this circumstance bitter mockery frightened this iniquitous tribunal which did not fear to trample beneath its feet the most sacred rules of justice the judges had decided their verdict was as it were rendered in advance and yet they wished to hear a voice raised in defence of those who were already doomed it chanced that three lawyers retained by the friends of several of the prisoners were in the hall they were the three men that maurice on his entrance had noticed conversing near the door of the chapel the duke was informed of this fact he turned to them and motioned them to approach then pointing to chanlouineau will you undertake this culprit's defence he demanded for a moment the lawyers made no response this monstrous seance had aroused a storm of indignation and disgust within their breasts and they looked questioningly at each other we are all disposed to undertake the prisoner's defence at last replied the eldest of the three but we see him for the first time we are ignorant of his grounds of defence we must ask a delay it is indispensable in order to confer with him the court can grant you no delay interrupted m de sairmeuse will you accept the defence yes or no the advocate hesitated not that he was afraid for he was a brave man but he was endeavouring to find some argument strong enough to trouble the conscience of these judges i will speak on his behalf said the advocate at last but not without first protesting with all my strength against these unheard-of modes of procedure oh spare us your homilies and be brief after chanlouineau's examination it was difficult to improvise there on the spur of the moment a plea in his behalf still his courageous advocate in his indignation presented a score of arguments which would have made any other tribunal reflect but all the while he was speaking the duc de sairmeuse fidgeted in his gilded armchair with every sign of angry impatience the plea was very long he remarked when the lawyer had concluded terribly long we shall never get through with this business if each prisoner takes up as much time he turned to his colleagues as if to consult them but suddenly changing his mind he proposed to the prosecuting counsel that he should unite all the cases try all the culprits in a body with the exception of the elder d'escorval this will shorten our task for in case we adopt this course there will be but two judgments to be pronounced he said this will not of course prevent each individual from defending himself the lawyers protested against this a judgment in a lump like that suggested by the dew would destroy all hope of saving a single one of these unfortunate men from the guillotine how can we defend them the lawyers pleaded when we know nothing of the situation of each of the prisoners we do not even know their names we shall be obliged to designate them by the cut of their coats and by the color of their hair they implored the tribunal to grant them a week for preparation four days even twenty-four hours futile efforts the president's proposition was adopted consequently each prisoner was called to the desk according to the place which he occupied upon the benches each man gave his name his age his abode and his profession and received an order to return to his place 
six or seven prisoners were actually granted time to say that they were absolutely ignorant of the conspiracy and that they had been arrested while conversing quietly upon the public highway they begged to be allowed to furnish proof of the truth of their assertions they invoked the testimony of the soldiers who had arrested them m d'escorval whose case had been separated from the others was not summoned to the desk he would be interrogated last now the counsel for the defence will be heard said the duke but make haste lose no time it is already twelve o'clock then began a shameful revolting and unheard-of scene the duke interrupted the lawyers every other moment bidding them be silent questioning them or jeering at them it seems incredible said he that any one can think of defending such wretches or again silence you should blush with shame for having constituted yourself the defender of such rascals but the lawyers persevered even while they realized the utter uselessness of their efforts but what could they do under such circumstances the defense of these twenty-nine prisoners lasted only one hour and a half before the last word was uttered the duc de sairmeuse gave a sigh of relief and in a tone which betrayed his delight said prisoner d'escorval stand up thus called upon the baron rose calm and dignified terrible as his sufferings must have been there was no trace of it upon his noble face he had even repressed the smile of disdain which the duke's paltry affection in not giving him the title which belonged to him brought to his lips but chanlouineau sprang up at the same time trembling with indignation his face all aglow with anger remain seated ordered the duke or you shall be removed from the court-room chanlouineau nevertheless declared that he would speak that he had some remarks to add to the plea made by the defending counsel upon a sign from the duke two gendarmes approached and placed their hands upon his shoulders he allowed them to force him back into his seat though he could easily have crushed them with one pressure of his brawny arm an observer would have supposed that he was furious secretly he was delighted the aim he had had in view was now attained in the glance he cast upon the abbe the latter could read whatever happens watch over maurice restrain him do not allow him to defeat my plans by any outbreak this caution was not unnecessary maurice was terribly agitated he could not see he felt felt that he was suffocating that he was losing his reason where is the self-control you promised me murmured the priest but no one observed the young man's condition the attention was rapt breathless so profound was the silence that the measured tread of the sentinels without could be distinctly heard each person present felt that the decisive moment for which the tribunal had reserved all its attention and efforts had come to convict and condemn the poor peasants of whom no one would think twice was a mere trifle but to bring low an illustrious man who had been the counsellor and faithful friend of the emperor what glory and what an opportunity for the ambitious the instinct of the audience spoke the truth if the tribunal had acted informally in the case of the obscure conspirators it had carefully prepared its suit against the baron thanks to the activity of the marquis de courtomieu the prosecution had found seven charges against the baron the least grave of which was punishable by death which of you demanded m de sairmeuse will consent to defend this great culprit i exclaimed three advocates in a breath take care said the duke with a malicious smile the task is not light not light it would have been better to say dangerous it would have been better to say that the defender risked his career his peace and his liberty very probably his life our profession has its exigencies nobly replied the oldest of the advocates and the three courageously took their places beside the baron thus avenging the honor of their robe which had just been miserably sullied in a city where among more than a hundred thousand souls two pure and innocent victims of a furious reaction had not oh shame been able to find a defender 
prisoner resumed m de sairmeuse state your name and profession louis guillaume baron d'escorval commander of the order of the legion of honor formerly councillor of state under the empire so you avow these shameful services you confess pardon monsieur i am proud of having had the honor of serving my country and of being useful to her in proportion to my ability with a furious gesture the duke interrupted him that is excellent he exclaimed these gentlemen the commissioners will appreciate that it was undoubtedly in the hope of regaining your former position that you entered into a conspiracy against a magnanimous prince with these vile wretches these peasants are not vile wretches but misguided men monsieur moreover you know yes you know as well as i do myself that i have had no hand in this conspiracy you were arrested in the ranks of the conspirators with weapons in your hands i was unarmed monsieur as you are well aware and if i was among the peasantry it was only because i hoped to induce them to relinquish their senseless enterprise you lie the baron paled beneath the insult but he made no reply there was however one man in the assemblage who could no longer endure this horrible and abominable injustice and this man was abbe midon who only a moment before had advised maurice to be calm he brusquely quitted his place and advanced to the foot of the platform the baron d'escorval speaks the truth he cried in a ringing voice the three hundred prisoners in the citadel will swear to it these prisoners here would say the same if they stood upon the guillotine and i who accompanied him who walked beside him i a priest swear before the god who will judge all men monsieur de sairmeuse i swear that all which it was in human power to do to arrest this movement we have done the duke listened with an ironical smile they did not deceive me then when they told me that this army of rebels had a chaplain ah monsieur you should sink to the earth with shame you a priest mingle with such scoundrels as these with these enemies of our good king and of our holy religion do not deny this your haggard features your swollen eyes your disordered attire soiled with dust and mud betray your guilt must i a soldier remind you of what is due your sacred calling hold your peace monsieur and depart the counsel for the prisoners sprang up we demand they cried that this witness be heard he must be heard military commissions are not above the laws that regulate ordinary tribunals if i do not speak the truth resumed the abbe i am a perjured witness worse yet an accomplice it is your duty in that case to have me arrested the duke's face expressed a hypocritical compassion no monsieur le curé said he i shall not arrest you i would avert the scandal which you are trying to cause we will show your priestly garb the respect the wearer does not deserve again and for the last time retire or i shall be obliged to employ force what would further resistance avail nothing the abbe with a face wider than the plastered walls and eyes filled with tears came back to his place beside maurice the lawyers meanwhile were uttering their protests with increasing energy but the duke by a prolonged hammering upon the table with his fists at last succeeded in reducing them to silence ah you wish testimony he exclaimed very well you shall have it soldiers bring in the first witness a movement among the guards and almost immediately chupin appeared he advanced deliberately but his countenance betrayed him a close observer could have read his anxiety and his terror in his eyes which wandered restlessly about the room and there was a very appreciable terror in his voice when with hand uplifted he swore to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth what do you know regarding the prisoner d'escorval demanded the duke i know that he took part in the rebellion on the night of the fourth are you sure of this i can 
furnish proofs submit them to the consideration of the commission the old scoundrel began to gain more confidence first he replied it was to the house of monsieur d'escorval that lacheneur hastened after he had much against his will restored to monsieur le duc the chateau of monsieur le duc's ancestors monsieur lacheneur met chanlouineau there and from that day dates the plot of this insurrection i was lacheneur's friend said the baron it was perfectly natural that he should come to me for consolation after a great misfortune monsieur de sairmeuse turned to his colleague you hear that said he this d'escorval calls the restitution of a deposit a great misfortune go on witness in the second place resumed chupin the accused was always prowling about lacheneur's house that is false interrupted the baron i never visited the house but once and on that occasion i implored him to renounce he paused comprehending only when it was too late the terrible significance of his words but having begun he would not retract and he added i implored him to renounce this project of an insurrection ah then you knew his wicked intentions i suspected them not to reveal a conspiracy makes one an accomplice and means the guillotine baron d'escorval had just signed his death warrant strange caprice of destiny he was innocent and yet he was the only one among the accused whom a regular tribunal could have legally condemned maurice and the abbe were prostrated with grief but chanlouineau who turned toward them had still upon his lips a smile of confidence how could he hope when all hope seemed absolutely lost but the commissioners made no attempt to conceal their satisfaction m de sairmeuse especially evinced an indecent joy ah well monsieur he said to the lawyers in a sneering tone the counsel for the defence poorly dissimulated their discouragement but they nevertheless endeavoured to question the validity of such a declaration on the part of their client he had said that he suspected the conspiracy not that he knew it it was quite a different thing say at once that you wish still more overwhelming evidence interrupted the duke very well you shall have it continue your deposition witness the accused continued chupin was present at all the conferences held at lacheneur's house the proof of this is as clear as daylight being obliged to cross the oiselle to reach the reche and fearing the ferryman would notice his frequent nocturnal voyages the baron had an old boat repaired which he had not used for years ah that is a remarkable circumstance prisoner do you recollect having your boat repaired yes but not for the purpose which this man mentions for what purpose then the baron made no response was it not in compliance with the request of maurice that the boat had been put in order and finally continued chupin when lacheneur set fire to his house to give the signal for the insurrection the prisoner was with him that exclaimed the duke is conclusive evidence i was indeed at the reche interrupted the baron but it was as i have already told you with the firm determination of preventing this outbreak m de sairmeuse gave utterance to a little disdainful laugh ah gentlemen he said addressing the commissioners can you not see that the prisoner's courage does not equal his depravity but i will confound him what did you do prisoner when the insurgents left the reche i returned to my home with all possible haste took a horse and repaired to the croix d'arcy then you knew that this was the spot appointed for the general rendezvous lacheneur had just informed me if i believed your story i should tell you that it was your duty to have hastened to montaignac and informed the authorities but what you say is untrue you did not leave lacheneur you accompanied him no monsieur 
no and what if i could prove this fact beyond all question impossible monsieur since such was not the case by the malicious satisfaction that lighted m de sairmeuse's face the abbe knew that this wicked judge had some terrible weapon in his hands and that baron d'escorval was about to be overwhelmed by one of those fatal coincidences which explain although they do not justify judicial errors at a sign from the counsel for the prosecution the marquis de courtomieu left his seat and came forward to the platform i must request you monsieur le marquis said the duke to have the goodness to read to the commission the deposition written and signed by your daughter this scene must have been prepared in advance for the audience m de courtomieu cleaned his glasses drew from his pocket a paper which he unfolded and amid a death-like silence he read i blanche de courtomieu do declare upon oath that on the evening of the fourth of february between ten and eleven o'clock on the public road leading from selmers to montaignac i was assailed by a crowd of armed brigands while they were deliberating as to whether they should take possession of my person and pillage my carriage i overheard one of these men say to another speaking of me she must get out must she not monsieur d'escorval i believe that the brigand who uttered these words was a peasant named chanlouineau but i dare not assert it on oath a terrible cry followed by inarticulate moans interrupted the marquis the suffering which maurice endured was too great for his strength and his reason he was about to spring forward and cry it was i who addressed those words to chanlouineau i alone am guilty my father is innocent but fortunately the abbe had the presence of mind to hold him back and place his hand over the poor youth's lips but the priest would not have been able to restrain maurice without the aid of the retired army officers who were standing beside him divining all perhaps they surrounded maurice took him up and carried him from the room by main force in spite of his violent resistance all this occupied scarcely ten seconds what is the cause of this disturbance inquired the duke looking angrily over the audience no one uttered a word at the least noise the hall shall be cleared added m de sairmeuse and you prisoner what have you to say in self-justification after this crushing accusation by mademoiselle de courtomieu nothing murmured the baron so you confess your guilt once outside the abbe confided maurice to the care of the three officers who promised to go with him to carry him by main force if need be to the hotel and keep him there relieved on this score the priest re-entered the hall just in time to see the baron seat himself without making any response thus indicating that he had relinquished all intention of defending his life really what could he say how could he defend himself without betraying his son until now there had not been one person who did not believe in the baron's entire innocence could it be that he was guilty his silence must be accepted as a confession of guilt at least some present believed so baron d'escorval appeared to be guilty was that not a sufficiently great victory for the duc de sairmeuse he turned to the lawyers and with an air of weariness and disdain he said now speak since it is absolutely necessary but no long phrases we should have finished here an hour ago the oldest lawyer rose trembling with indignation ready to dare anything for the sake of giving free utterance to his thought but the baron checked him do not try to defend me he said calmly it would be labor wasted i have only a word to say to my judges let them remember what the noble and generous marshal moncey wrote to the king the scaffold does not make friends this recollection was not of a nature to soften the hearts of the judges the marshal for that saying had been deprived of his office and condemned to three months imprisonment as the advocates made no further attempt to argue the case the commission retired to deliberate this gave m d'escorval an opportunity to speak with his defenders he shook them warmly by the hand and thanked them for their devotion and for their courage the good man wept then the baron 
turning to the oldest among them quickly and in a low voice said i have a last favor to ask of you when the sentence of death shall have been pronounced upon me go at once to my son you will say to him that his dying father commands him to live he will understand you tell him it is my last wish that he live live for his mother he said no more the judges were returning of the thirty prisoners nine were declared not guilty and released the remaining twenty-one and m d'escorval and chanlouineau were among the number were condemned to death but the smile had not once forsaken chanlouineau's lips End of chapter twenty seven recording by tony oliva albuquerque